Section number 23 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Part 2. Chapter 1. Part 1a. The Conquerors of Central America. The letters and narratives of Columbus and his companions, especially those dwelling upon the large quantity of gold and pearls found in the recently discovered countries, had inflamed the imagination of eager traders and of numbers of gentlemen who loved adventure. On the 10th of April, 1495, the Spanish government had issued an order allowing anyone who might wish to do so to go and discover new countries. But this privilege was so much abused, and Columbus complained so bitterly of its trenching upon established rights, that the permission was withdrawn on the 2nd of June, 1497, and four years later it became necessary to repeat the prohibition with more severe penalties attached to its infringement. The effect of the royal decree was at once to produce a kind of general rush to the Indies, and this was favored by Bishop Fonseca of Badajoz, through whose hands passed all business connected with the Indies, and of whom Columbus had had so much reason to complain. The admiral had but just left San Lucar on his third voyage, when four expeditions of discovery were fitted out almost at the same moment, at the cost of some rich shipowners, foremost among whom we find Pinzons and America's Vespucius. The first of these expeditions, which left the port of Santa Maria on the 20th of May, 1499, consisted of four vessels and was commanded by Alonso Ojeda. Juan de la Cosa sailed with him as pilot. Americus Vespucius was also on board, but without any very clearly defined duties, but he would seem to have been astronomer to the fleet. Before entering on a brief account of this voyage, we will glance for a few moments at the three men whom we have just named. The last of the three especially plays a most important part in the discovery of the new world, which received its name from him. Ojeda, born at Cuenca about 1465, and brought up in the household of the Duke Medina Sely, had gained his first experience in arms in the wars against the Moors. Columbus enrolled him amongst the adventurers whom he recruited for his second voyage, when Ojeda distinguished himself alike by his cool courage and his readiness in surmounting all difficulties. What caused his complete rupture with Columbus remains a mystery. It appears still more inexplicable when we think of the distinguished services that Ojeda had rendered, especially in 1495, at the Battle of La Vega, when the Caribbean Confederation was annihilated. All we know is that on Ojeda's return to Spain, he found shelter and protection with Bishop Fonseca. It is said even that the Indian minister supplied him with the journal of the admiral's last voyage and the map of the countries which columbus had discovered the first pilot employed by ojeda was juan de la cosa born probably in santona in the biscayan country he had often sailed along the coast of africa before accompanying columbus on his first voyage while in the second expedition he filled the post of hydrographer maestro de hacer cartas as specimens of La Cosa's talent in drawing maps may be mentioned two very curious ones still extant, one showing all the territory that had been acquired in Africa in 1500, the other on vellum and enriched with color like the first, giving the discoveries made by Columbus and his successors. The second pilot was Bartholomew Roldan, who had likewise sailed with Columbus on his voyage to Paria. As to Americus Vespucius, his duties were not, as we have said, very clearly defined. He was there to aid in making discoveries, 
per agitare a descopire says the italian text of his letter to soldarini born at florence on the ninth of march fourteen fifty one amerigo vespucci belonged to a family of distinction and wealth he had made mathematics natural philosophy and astrology as it was then called his special duties his knowledge of history and literature judging from his letters appears to have been somewhat vague and ill-digested he left florence in fourteen ninety two without any special aim in view and went to spain where he occupied himself at first in commercial pursuits we hear of him in seville acting as factor in the powerful trading-house of his fellow countryman juanoto berardi as this house had advanced money to columbus for his second voyage it is not unlikely that vespucius had become acquainted with the admiral at this period of his career on juanoto's death in fourteen ninety five vespucius was placed by his heirs at the end of the financial department of the house whether he may have been tired of a situation that he thought below his powers or been seized in his turn with the fever for making new discoveries or whether he hoped to make his fortune rapidly in the new countries reputed to be so rich whatever in short may have been the motive that actuated him at least this we know that he joined ojeda's expedition in fourteen ninety nine this fact being so stated in ojeda's deposition in the lawsuit instituted by the treasury with the heirs of columbus the flotilla consisting of four vessels set sail on the twentieth of may from santa maria taking a southwesterly course and in twenty-seven days the american continent was sighted at the place which was named venezuela because the houses being built upon piles reminded the beholders of venice ojeda after some ineffectual attempts to hold intercourse with the natives with whom he had several skirmishes next saw the island of margarita after sailing about two hundred fifty miles to the east of the river orinoco he reached the gulf of paria and entered a bay called the bay of las perlas for the natives of that part being employed in the pearl fisheries guided by the maps of columbus ojeda passed by the dragon's mouth which separates trinidad from the continent and returned westward to cape la vela then after touching at the caribbee islands where he made a number of prisoners whom he hoped to sell for slaves in spain he was obliged to cast anchor at Wakimo in hispaniola on the fifth of september fourteen ninety nine columbus knowing ojeda's courage and his restless spirit only too well feared that he would introduce a new element of discord into the colony he therefore dispatched francesco roldan with two caravels to inquire into his motives in coming to the island and if necessary to prevent his landing the admiral's fears were but too well grounded ojeda had scarcely landed before he had an interview with some of the malcontents inciting them to a rising as aragua and to a determination to expel columbus after some skirmishes which had not ended to ojeda's advantage a meeting was arranged for him with roldan diego de escobar and juan de la cosa when they prevailed upon him to leave the island he took with him says la casas a prodigious cargo of slaves whom he sold in the market at cadiz for enormous sums of money he returned to spain in february fifteen hundred where he had been preceded by americus vespucius and b roldan on the eighteenth of october fourteen ninety nine the most southerly point that ojeda had reached in his voyage was four degrees north latitude and he had only spent fourteen weeks on the voyage of discovery properly so called if we appear to have dwelt at some length upon this voyage it is because it was the first one made by vespucius some authors varnhagen for instance and quite recently mr h major in his history of prince henry the navigator assert that vespucius first voyage was in fourteen ninety seven and consequently that he must have seen the american continent before columbus but we prefer to follow humboldt who spent so many years in studying the history of the discovery of america in his opinion that fourteen ninety nine was the right date 
also M. Ed. Charton and M. Jules Codine, the latter of whom discussed this question in the report of the Geographical Society for 1873, apropos of Mr. Major's book. If it were true, says Voltaire, that Vespucius had discovered the American continent, yet the glory would not be his. It belongs undoubtedly to the man who had the genius and courage to undertake the first voyage to Columbus. As Newton says in his argument with Leibniz, the glory is due only to the inventor. But we agree with M. Codine when he says, how can we allow that there was an expedition in 1497 which resulted in the discovery of above 2,500 miles of the coastline of the mainland when there is no trace of it left either among the great historians of that time or in the legal dispositions in connection with the claims made by the heir of Columbus against the Spanish government in which the priority of the discoveries of each leader of an expedition is so carefully mentioned with the part of the coast explored by each. Finally, the authentic documents extracted from the archives of the Casa de Contratación make it evident that Vespucius was entrusted with the preparation of the vessels destined for the third voyage of Columbus at Seville and at San Lucar from the middle of August 1497 till the departure of Columbus on the 30th of May 1498. The narratives of the voyages of Vespucius are very diffuse and wanting in precision and order. The information they give upon the places he visited is so vague that it might apply to one part of the coast as well as to another. As to the localities treated of, as well as of the companions of Vespucius, there are no indications given of a nature to aid the historian. Not a single name is given of any well-known person, and the dates are contradictory in those famous letters which have given endless work to commentators. Humboldt says of them, There is an element of discord in the most authentic documents relating to the Florentine navigator. We have given an account of Ojeda's first voyage, which coincides with that of Vespucius, according to Humboldt, and who has compared the principal incidents of the two narratives. Varn Hagen asserts that Vespucius, having started on the 10th of May, 1497, entered the Gulf of Honduras on the 10th of June, coasted by Yucatan and Mexico, sailed up the Mississippi, and at the end of February, 1498, doubled the Cape of Florida. After anchoring for 37 days at the mouth of the St. Lawrence, he returned to Cadiz, in October 1498. If Vespucius had really made this marvelous voyage, he would have far outstripped all the navigators of his time, and would have fully deserved that his name should be given to the newly discovered continent, whose coastline he had explored for so great a distance. But nothing is less certain, and Humboldt's opinion has hitherto appeared to the best writers to offer the largest amount of probability. Americus Vespucius made three other voyages. Humboldt identifies the first with that of Vincent Yanez Pinzon, and M. Davazac with that of Diego de Lepe, 1499-1500. At the close of this latter year, Giuliano Bartolomeo de Giocondo induced Vespucius to enter the service of Emmanuel, King of Portugal, and he accomplished two more voyages at the expense of his new master. On the first of these two voyages, he was no higher in command than he had been in his earlier ones, and only accompanied the expedition as one whose intimate acquaintance with all nautical matters might prove of service under certain circumstances. During this voyage, the ships coasted along the American shores from Cape St. Augustine to 52 degrees of south latitude. The fourth voyage of Vespucius was marked by the wreck of the flagship, off the island of Fernando de Norona, which prevented the other vessels from continuing their voyage towards Malacca by way of the Cape of Good Hope, and obliged the crews to land at All Saints Bay in Brazil. This fourth voyage was unquestionably made with Gonzalo Coelho, but we are quite ignorant as to who was in command on the third voyage. These various expeditions had not tended to enrich Vespucius 
while his position at the portuguese court was so far from satisfactory that he determined to re-enter the service of the king of spain by him he was made piloto mayor on the twenty second of march fifteen o eight there were some valuable emoluments attached for his advantage to this appointment which enabled him to end his days if not as a rich man at least as one far removed from want he died at seville on the twenty second of february fifteen twelve with the same conviction as columbus that he had reached the shores of asia americus vespucius is especially famous from the new world having been named after him instead of being called columbia as in all justice it should have been but with this vespucius had nothing to do he was for a long time charged though most unjustly with impudence falsehood and deceit it being alleged that he wished to veil the glory of columbus and to arrogate himself to the honor of discovery which did not belong to him this was an utterly unfounded accusation for vespucius was both loved and esteemed by columbus and his contemporaries and there is nothing in his writings to justify this calumnious assertion seven printed documents exist which are attributed to vespucius they are the abridged accounts of his four voyages two narratives of his third and fourth voyages in the form of letters addressed to lorenzo de pier francesco de medici and a letter addressed to the same nobleman relatives to the portuguese discoveries of the indies these documents printed and bound up as small thin volumes were soon translated into various languages and distributed throughout Europe. It was in the year 1507 that a certain Hyla Colimus, whose real name was Martin Waldseemuller, first proposed to give the name of America to the new part of the world. He did so in a book printed in St. Die, called Cosmographia Introductio. In 1509, a small geographical treatise appeared at Strasbourg, adopting the proposal of Hyla Colimus and in 1520 an edition of Pomponius Mela was printed at Basle, giving a map of the New World with the name of America. From this time the number of works employing the denomination proposed by Waldseemuller increased perpetually. Some years later, when Waldseemuller was better informed as to the real discoverer of America, and of the value to be placed upon the voyages of Vespucius, he eliminated from his book all that related to the latter, and substituted everywhere the name of Columbus for that of Vespucius. But it was too late. The same error has prevailed ever since. As to Vespucius himself, it seems very unlikely that he was at all aware of the excitement which prevailed in Europe, nor what was passing at St. Die. The testimony that has unanimously borne to his honorable and upright conduct should surely clear him from the unmerited accusations which have for too long a time clouded his memory. Three other expeditions left Spain almost at the same time as that of Ojeda. The first of these, consisting of but one vessel, sailed from Barra Saltes in June 1499. Pierre Alonso Nino, who had served under Columbus in his two last voyages, was its commander, and he was accompanied by Cristobal Guerra, a merchant of Seville, who probably defrayed the expenses of the expedition. The voyage to the coast of Paria seems to have been dictated more by the hope of lucrative commerce than by the interests of science. No new discoveries were made, but the two voyages returned to Spain in April 1500, bringing with them so large a quantity of valuable pearls as to excite the cupidity of their countrymen, who became anxious to try their own fortunes in the same direction. The second expedition was commanded by Vincent Yanez Pinzon, the younger brother of Alonso Pinzon, who had been captain of the Pinta, and had shown so much jealousy of Columbus, even adopting the following mendacious device. A Castilla y a Leon, Nuevo Mundo de Pinzon. Yanez Pinzon, whose devotion to the admiral equaled his brother's jealousy, had advanced an eighth part of the funds required for the expedition of 1492, and had on that occasion been in command of the Nina. 
he set out in december fourteen ninety nine with four vessels of which only two returned to palos at the end of september fifteen hundred he touched the coast of the newly discovered continent at a point near the shore visited by ojeda some months before and explored the coast for some two thousand four hundred miles discovering cape st augustine at eight degrees twenty minutes south latitude following the coastline in a northwesterly direction to rio grande which he named santa maria de la mar dulce and continuing in the same direction as far as cape st vincent diego de lepe explored the same coast with two caravels from january to june fifteen hundred there is nothing particular to record of this voyage beyond the very important observation that was made on the direction of the coastline to the continent starting from cape st augustine lepe had but just returned to spain when two vessels left cadiz equipped by rodrigo de bastidas a wealthy and highly respectable man with the view of making some fresh discoveries but above all with the object of collecting as large a quantity of gold and pearls as possible for which were to be bartered glass beads and other worthless trifles juan de la cosa whose talents as a navigator were proverbial and who knew these coasts well from having explored them was really at the head of the expedition the sailors went on shore and saw the rio sinu the gulf of arabia and reached the puerto de retrete or de los escribanos in the isthmus of panama this harbor was not visited by columbus till the twenty sixth of november fifteen o two it is situated about seventeen miles from the once celebrated but now destroyed town of nombre de dios in fact this expedition which had been organized by a merchant became thanks to juan de la cosa one of the voyages of the most fertile in discoveries but alas it came to a sad termination the vessels were lost in the gulf of zaragua and bastides and la cosas were obliged to make their way to land by santo domingo when they arrived there bovedilla the upright man and model governor whose infamous conduct to columbus were already mentioned had them arrested on the plea that they had brought some gold from the indians of zaragua he sent them off to spain which was only reached after a fearfully stormy voyage some of the vessels being lost on the way after this expedition so fruitful in results voyages of discovery became less frequent for some years the spaniards being occupied in asserting their supremacy in the countries in which they had already founded colonies end of part two chapter one part one a Section number 24 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World, by Jules Verne part two chapter one part one b the colonization of hispaniola had commenced in fourteen ninety three when the town of isabella was built two years afterwards christopher columbus had travelled over the island and had subjugated the poor savages by means of those terrible dogs which had been trained to hunt indians and accustomed as the natives were to any hard work he had forced on them to toil in the mines. Both Bovadilla and Ovando, treating the Indians as a herd of cattle, had divided them among the colonists as slaves. The cruelty with which this unfortunate people was treated became more and more unbearable. By means of a despicable ambush, Ovando seized the queen of Zaragua and three hundred of her principal subjects, and at a given signal they were all put to the sword without their being any crime adduced against them for some years says robertson the gold brought into the royal treasury of spain amounted to about four hundred sixty thousand pesos 
two million four hundred thousand livres of the currency of tours an enormous sum if we take into consideration the great increase in the value of money since the beginning of the sixteenth century in fifteen eleven diego velasquez conquered cuba with three hundred men and here again were enacted the terrible scenes of bloodshed and pillage which have rendered the spanish name so sadly notorious they cut off the thumbs of the natives put out their eyes and poured boiling oil or melted lead into their wounds even when they did not torture them by burning them over a slow fire to extract from them the secret of the treasures of which they were believed to be the possessors it was only natural under these circumstances that the population rapidly decreased and the day was not far off when it would be wholly exterminated to understand fully the sufferings of this race thus odiously persecuted the touching and horrible narrative of las casas must be read himself the indefatigable defender of the indians in cuba the cacique hatue was made prisoner and condemned to be burnt when he was tied to the stake a franciscan monk tried to convert him promising him that if he would only embrace the christian faith he would be at once admitted to all the joys of paradise are there any spaniards in that land of happiness and joy of which you speak asked hathaway yes replied the monk but only those who have been just and good in their lives the very best among them can have neither justice nor mercy said the poor cacique i do not wish to go to any place where i should meet a single man of that accursed race does not this fact suffice to paint the degree of exasperation to which these unfortunate people had been driven and these horrors were repeated wherever the spaniards set foot we will throw a veil over these atrocities practised by men who thought themselves civilized and who pretended that they wished to convert to christianity the religion pre-eminently of love and mercy a race who were in reality less savage than themselves in 1504 and 1505 four vessels explored the gulf of arabia this was the first voyage in which juan de la cosa had the supreme command this seems too to have been about the date of ojeda's third voyage when he went to the territory of coquibacoa a voyage that certainly was made as humboldt says but of which we have no clear account in 1509 juan diaz de solis in concert with vincent yanez pinzon discovered a vast province since known by the name of yucatan though this expedition was not a very remarkable one in itself says robertson it deserves to be noticed as it led to discoveries of the utmost importance for the same reason we must mention the voyage of diego de ocampo who being charged to sail round cuba was the first to ascertain that it was a large island columbus having always regarded it as part of the continent two years later juan diaz de solis and vincent pinzon sailing southwards towards the equinoctial line advanced as far as the forty degree of south latitude and found to their surprise that the continent extended on their right hand even to this immense distance they landed several times and took formal possession of the country but could not found any colonies there on account of the small resources they had at their command the principal result of this voyage was the more exact knowledge which it gave the extent of this part of the globe alonso de ojeda whose adventures we have narrated above was the first to think of founding a colony on the mainland although he had no means of his own his courage and enterprising spirit soon gained him associates who furnished him with the funds needed for carrying out his plans with the same object diego de nicuesa a rich colonist of hispaniola organized an expedition in fifteen o nine king ferdinand who was always lavish of encouragements which cost little gave both ojeda and nicuesa honorable titles and patents of nobility but not a single maravedas a spanish coin he also divided the newly discovered continent into two governments of which one was to extend from cape la vela to the gulf of darien 
and the other from the Gulf of Darien to Cape Gracias a Dios. The first was given to Ojeda, the second to Nuquesa. These two conquistadores had to deal with a population far less easy to manage than that of the Antilles. Determined to resist to the utmost the invasion of their country, they adopted means of resistance hitherto unknown to the Spaniards. Thus the strife became deadly. In a single engagement, seventy of Ojeda's companions fell under the arrows of the savages. Fearful weapons steeped in curare, so fatal a poison that the slightest wound was followed by death. Nicuesa, on his side, had much difficulty in defending himself, and in spite of two considerable reinforcements from Cuba, the greater number of his followers perished during the year from wounds, fatigue, privations, or sickness. The survivors founded the small colony of Santa Maria el Antigua upon the Gulf of Darien and placed it under the command of Balboa. Before we speak of Balboa's wonderful expedition, we must notice the discovery of a country that forms the most northerly side of that arc, cut so deeply into the continent and which bears the name of the Gulf of Mexico. In 1502, Juan Ponce de Leon, a member of one of the oldest families in Spain, had arrived in Hispaniola with Ovando. He had assisted in its subjugation, and in 1508 had conquered the island of San Juan de Puerto Rico. Having learnt from the Indians that there existed a fountain in the island of Bimini which possessed the miraculous powers of restoring youth to all who drank of its waters, Ponce de Leon resolved to go in search of it. Infirmities must have been already creeping on him at fifty years of age, or he would scarcely have felt the need of trying this fountain. Ponce de Leon equipped three vessels at his own expense and set out from St. Germain in Puerto Rico on the 1st of March, 1512. He went first to the Lucayan Islands, which he searched in vain, and then to the Bahamas. If he did not succeed in finding the Fountain of Youth, which he sought so credulously, at least he had the satisfaction of discovering an apparently fertile tract of country, which he named Florida either from his landing there on Palm Sunday, Baclures, or perhaps from its delightful aspect. Such a discovery would have contented many a traveler, but Ponce de Leon went from one island to another, tasting the water of every stream that he met with, without the satisfaction of seeing his white hair again becoming black, or his wrinkles disappearing. After spending six months in this fruitless search, he was tired of playing the dupe, so, giving up the business, he returned to Puerto Rico on the 5th of October, leaving Perez de Ortubia and the pilot Antonio de Alaminos to continue the search. Père Charlevoix says he was the object of great ridicule when he returned in much suffering and looking older than when he set out. This voyage, so absurd in its motive, but so fertile in its results, might well be considered to be simple imaginary, were it not vouched for by historians of such high repute as Peter Martyr, Oviedo, Herrera, and Garcilaso de la Vega. Vasco Nunez de Balboa, who was fifteen years younger than Ponce de Leon, had come to America with Bastidas and had settled in Hispaniola. He was only anxious for a safe refuge from his numerous creditors, being, as were so many of his fellow countrymen, deeply in debt, in spite of the repartimiento of Indians which had been allotted to him. Unfortunately for Balboa, a law had been passed forbidding any vessels bound for the mainland taking insolvent debtors on board. But his ingenuity was equal to this emergency, for he had himself rolled in an empty barrel to the vessel which was to carry Encisco to Darien. The chief of the expedition had no choice but to receive the brave adventurer who had joined them in this singular manner, and who never fled except from Duns, as he soon proved on landing. The Spaniards, accustomed to find but little resistance from the natives of the Antilles, could not subjugate the fierce inhabitants of the mainland. On account of the dissensions that had arisen among themselves, they were obliged to take refuge at Santa Maria el Antigua, 
a settlement which Balboa, now elected commandant in place of Encisco, founded in Darien. If the personal bravery of Balboa, or the ferocity of Leoncillo, his bloodhound, who was more dreaded than twenty armed men, and received the same pay as a soldier, could have awed the Indians, Balboa would have also won their respect by his justice and comparative moderation, for he allowed no unnecessary cruelty. In the course of some years he collected a great mass of the most useful information with regard to that El Dorado, that land of gold which he was destined never to reach himself, but the acquisition of which he did much to facilitate for his successors. It was in this way that he learnt the existence of six suns away, six days' journey, of another sea, the Pacific Ocean, which washed the shores of Peru, a country where gold was found in large quantities. Balboa's character, which was as grand as those of Cortes and Pizarro, but who had not, as they, the time or opportunity to show the extraordinary qualities which he possessed, felt convinced that this information was most valuable, and that if he could carry out such a discovery, it would shed great luster on his name. He assembled a body of 190 volunteers, all valiant soldiers, and like himself accustomed to all the chances of war, as well as acclimatized to the unhealthy effluvia or a marshy country where fever, dysentery, and complaints of the liver were constantly present. Though the Isthmus of Darien is only sixty miles in width, it is divided into two parts by a chain of high mountains. At the foot of these the alluvial soil is marvelously fertile, and the vegetation far more luxuriant than any European can imagine. It consists of an inextricable mass of tropical plants, creepers, and ferns among trees of gigantic size which completely hide the sun, a truly virgin forest interspersed here and there with patches of stagnant water where live multitudes of birds insects and animals never disturbed by the foot of man a warm moist atmosphere exists here which exhausts the strength and speedily saps the energy of any man even the most robust with all these obstacles which nature seemed to have rejoiced in placing in balboa's path there was yet another no less formidable and this was the resistance which the savage inhabitants of this inhospitable shore would offer to his progress. Balboa set out without caring for the risk he ran in the event of the guides and native auxiliaries proving faithless. He was escorted by a thousand Indians as porters and accompanied by a troop of those terrible bloodhounds which had acquired the taste for human flesh in Hispaniola. Of the tribes that he met with on his route, some fled into the mountains carrying their provisions with them, and others, taking advantage of the difficulties the land presented, tried to fight. Balboa, marching in the midst of his men, never sparing himself, sharing in the privations and rousing their courage, which would have failed more than once, was able to inspire them with so much enthusiasm for the object that was before them, that after twenty-five days of marching and fighting, they could see from the top of a mountain the vast Pacific Ocean, of which four days later Balboa, his drawn sword in one hand and the banner of Castile in the other, took possession in the name of the King of Spain. The part of the Pacific Ocean which he had reached is situated to the east of Panama and still bears the name of the Gulf of San Miguel, given to it by Balboa. The information he obtained from the neighboring caciques whom he subjugated by force of arms, and from whom he obtained a considerable booty, agreed in every particular with what he had heard before he set out. A vast empire lay to the south, they said, so rich in gold that even the commonest instruments were made of it, where the domestic animals were yamas that had been tamed and trained to carry heavy burdens, and whose appearance in the native drawings resembled that of the camel. These interesting details and the great quantity of pearls offered to Balboa confirmed him in his idea that he must have reached the Asiatic countries described by Marco Polo, and that he could not be far from the empire of Sipango or Japan, 
of which the venetian traveller had described the marvellous riches which were perpetually dazzling the eyes of those avaricious adventurers balboa several times crossed the isthmus of darien and always in some fresh direction humboldt might well say that this country was better known in the beginning of the sixteenth century than in his own day beyond this balboa had launched some vessels built under his orders on the newly discovered ocean and he was preparing a formidable armament with which he hoped to conquer peru when he was odiously and judicially murdered by the orders of pedarias davila the governor of darien who was jealous of the reputation balboa had already gained and of the glory which would doubtless recompense his bravery if he carried out the expedition which he had arranged thus the conquest of peru was retarded by at least twenty-five years owing to the culpable jealousy of a man whose name has acquired by balboa's assassination almost as wretched a celebrity as that of erostratus if we owe to balboa the first authentic documents regarding peru another explorer was destined to furnish some not less important touching that vast mexican empire which had extended its way over almost the whole of central america in fifteen eighteen juan de grijalva had been placed in command of a flotilla consisting of four vessels armed by diego velasquez the conqueror of cuba which were destined to collect information upon yucatan cited the year before by hernandez de cordova grijalva accompanied by the pilot alaminos who had made the voyage to florida with ponce de leon had two hundred men under his command amongst the volunteers was bernal diaz del casillo the clever author of a very interesting history of the conquest of mexico from which we shall borrow freely after thirteen days sailing grijalva reached the island of cozumel on the coast of yucatan doubled the cape of cotoche and entered the bay of campiche he disembarked on the tenth of may at potonchan of which the inhabitants defended the town and citadel vigorously in spite of their astonishment at the vessels which they took for some kind of marine monsters and their fear of the pale-faced men who hurled thunderbolts fifty-seven spaniards were killed in the engagement and many were wounded this warm reception did not encourage grijalva to make any long stay amongst this warlike people he set sail again after anchoring for four days took a westerly course along the coast of mexico and on the nineteenth of may entered a river named by the natives the tabasco where he soon found himself surrounded by a fleet of fifty native boats filled with warriors ready for the conflict but thanks to grijalva's prudence and the amicable demonstrations which he made peace was not disturbed we made them understand writes bernal diaz that we were the subjects of a powerful emperor called don carlos and that it would be greatly to their advantage if they also would acknowledge him as their master they replied that they had a sovereign already and were at loss to understand why we who had only just arrived and who knew so little of them should offer them another king this reply was scarcely that of a savage in exchange for some worthless european trinkets the spaniards obtained some yucca bread copal gum pieces of gold worked into the shape of fishes and birds and garments made of cotton which had been woven in the country as the natives who had been taken on board at cape Catoche did not perfectly understand the language spoken by the inhabitants of tabasco the stay here was but of short duration and the ships again put to sea they passed the mouth of the rio guatzacoalco the snowy peaks of the san martin mountains being seen in the distance and they anchored at the mouth of a river which was called rio de las banderas from the number of white banners displayed by the natives to show their friendly feeling toward the newcomers when grijalva landed he was received with the same honor as the indians paid to their gods they burnt copal incense before them and laid at his feet more than fifteen hundred piastres worth of small gold jewels as well as green pearls and copper hatchets after taking formal possession of the country 
the spaniards landed on an island called los sacrificios island from a sort of altar which they found there placed at the top of several steps upon which lay the bodies of five indians sacrificed since the preceding evening their bodies were cut open their hearts torn out and both legs and arms cut off leaving this revolting spectacle they went to another small island which received the name of san juan being discovered on st john's day to this they added the word kulua which they heard used by the natives of these shores but kulua was the ancient name for mexico and this island of san juan de kulua is now known as st john de uloa grijalva put all the gold which he had collected on board one of the ships and dispatched it to cuba while he continued his exploration of the coast discovered the sierras of tusta and tuspa and collected a large amount of useful information regarding this populous country on arriving at rio panuco he was attacked by a flotilla of native vessels and had much difficulty in defending himself against their attacks this expedition was nearly over for provisions were running short and the vessels were in a very bad state the volunteers were many of them sick and wounded and even had they been in good health their numbers were too small to make it safe to leave them among these warlike people even under the shelter of fortifications besides the leaders of the expedition no longer acted in concert so after repairing the largest of the vessels in rio tonala where bernal diaz boasts of having sown the first orange pips which were ever brought to mexico the spaniards set out for santiago in cuba where they arrived on the fifteenth of november after a cruise of seven months not forty-five days as m ferdinand dennis asserts in the biography Dido, and as m ed charnton repeats in his voyageurs anciens et modernes the results obtained from this voyage were considerable for the first time the long line of coast which forms the peninsula of yucatan the bay of campeche and the base of the gulf of mexico had been explored continuously from cape to cape not only had it been proved beyond doubt that yucatan was not an island as they had believed but much and reliable information had been collected with regard to the existence of the rich and powerful empire of mexico the explorers had been much struck with the marks of a more advanced civilization than that existing in the antilles with the superiority of the architecture the skilful cultivation of the land the fine texture of the cotton garments and the delicacy of finish of the golden ornaments worn by the indians all this combined to increase the thirst for riches among the spaniards of cuba and to urge them on like modern argonauts to the conquest of this golden fleece grijalva was not destined to reap the fruits of his perilous and at the same time intelligent voyage which threw so new a light on indian civilization the sic vos non vobis of the poet was once again to find an exemplification in this circumstance end of part two chapter one part one b Section 25 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Drury. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 2a. Velasquez had not waited for Grijalva's return before sending off to Spain the rich products of the countries discovered by the latter, and at the same time soliciting from the Council of the Indies, as well as from the Bishop of Burgos, in addition to his authority, that he might attempt the conquest of these countries. At the same time, he fitted out a new armament proportioned to the dangers and importance of the undertaking that he proposed. But though it was comparatively easy for Velasquez to collect the necessary material and men, it was far more difficult for him whom an old writer describes as niggardly, credulous, and suspicious in disposition, to choose a fit leader. He wished, indeed, to find one who should combine qualities nearly always incompatible, high courage and great talent, without which there was no chance of success, with at the same time sufficient docility and submissiveness 
to do nothing without orders and to leave to him who incurred no risk any glory and success which might attend the enterprise some who were brave and enterprising would not be treated as mere machines others who were more docile or more cunning lacked the qualities required to ensure the success of so vast an enterprise among the former were some of grijalva's companions who wished that he should be made commander while the latter preferred augustin bermudez or bernardino velasquez while this was pending the governor's secretary andres de duero and amador de lares the controller of cuba both favorites of velasquez made an arrangement with a spanish nobleman named ferdinand cortez that if they could obtain the appointment for him they should be allowed a share in his gains bernal diaz says they praised cortez so highly and pointed him out in such flattering terms as the very man fitted to fill the vacant post adding that he was brave and certainly very faithful to velasquez to whom he was a son-in-law that he allowed himself to be persuaded and cortez was nominated captain-general as andres de duero was the governor's secretary he hastened to formulate the powers in a deed making them very ample as cortez desired and brought it to him duly signed had velasquez been gifted with the power of looking into the future cortez was certainly not the man he would have chosen cortez was born at medellin in estramadura in fourteen eighty five of an ancient but slenderly endowed family after studying at salamanca for some time he returned to his native town but the quiet monotonous life there was little suited to his restless and capricious temper and he soon started for america reckoning upon the protection of his relation ovando the governor of hispaniola his expectations were fully realized and he held several honorable and lucrative posts without counting that between times he joined in several expeditions against the natives if he became in this manner initiated into the indian system of tactics so also unfortunately did he grow familiar with those acts of cruelty which have too often stained the castilian name he accompanied diego de velasquez in his cuban expedition in fifteen eleven and here he distinguished himself so highly that notwithstanding certain disagreements with his chief a large grant of land as well as of indians was made to him as a recognition of his services cortez amassed the sum of three thousand castellanos in the course of a few years by his industry and frugality a large sum for one in his position but his chief recommendations in the eyes of andres de duero and amador de sarez his two patrons were his activity his well-known prudence his decision of character and the power of gaining the confidence of all with whom he was brought into contact in addition to all this he was of imposing stature and appearance very athletic and possessed powers of endurance remarkable even among the hardy adventurers who were accustomed to brave all kinds of hardships as soon as cortez had received his commission which he did with every mark of respectful gratitude he set up a banner at the door of his house made of black velvet embroidered with gold bearing the device of a red cross in the midst of blue and white flames and below this motto in latin friends let us follow the cross and if we have faith we shall overcome by this sign he concentrated the whole force of his powerful mind upon the means to make the enterprise a success even his most intimate friends were astonished at his enthusiasm in preparing for it he not only gave the whole of the money which he possessed toward arming the fleet but he charged part on his estate and borrowed considerable sums from his friends to purchase vessels provisions munitions of war and horses in a few days three hundred volunteers had enrolled themselves attracted by the fame of the general the daring nature of the enterprise and the profit that would probably accrue from it velasquez always suspicious and doubtless instigated by some who were jealous of cortez tried to put a stop to the expedition at its outset cortez being warned by his two patrons that velasquez would probably try to take the command from him acted with his customary decision he collected his men and in spite of the vessels not being completed and of an insufficient armament he weighed anchor and sailed during the night when velasquez discovered that his plans had been checkmated he concealed his indignation but at the same time he made every arrangement to stop the man who could thus throw off all dependence upon him with such consummate coolness cortez anchored at macaca to complete his stores and found many of those who had accompanied grijalva now hastened to serve under his banner pedro de alvarado and his brothers cristobal de olid alonso de avila hernandez de puerto carrero gonzalo de sandoval and bernal diaz del castillo who was to write a valuable account of these events quorum pars magna fuit trinity harbor on the south coast of cuba was the next resting place and here a further supply of provisions was taken on board but while cortez lay at anchor for this purpose verdugo the governor received letters from velasquez desiring him to arrest the captain-general the command of the fleet having just been taken from him this bold step would have endangered the safety of the town so verdugo refrained from executing the order 
Cortes sailed away to Havana in order to enlist some new adherents, while his lieutenant Alvarado went overland to the port where the last preparations were made. Although Velasquez was unsuccessful in his first attempt, he again sent an order to arrest Cortes, but Pedro Barba, the governor, felt the impossibility of executing the order in the midst of soldiers who, as Bernal Diaz said, would have willingly given their lives to save Cortes. At length, having recalled the volunteers by beat of drum, and taken on board all that appeared necessary, Cortes set sail on the 18th February, 1519, with eleven ships, the largest being of one hundred tons, one hundred and ten sailors, five hundred and fifty-three soldiers, thirteen of whom were arquebusiers, two hundred Indians from the island, and some women for domestic work. The real strength of the armament lay in the ten pieces of artillery, the four falconets provided with an ample supply of ammunition, and the sixteen horses which had been obtained at great expense. It was with these almost miserable means, which, however, had given Cortes much trouble to collect, that he prepared to wage war with a sovereign whose dominions were of greater extent than those appertaining to the king of Spain, an enterprise from which he would have turned back if he had foreseen half its difficulties. But long ago a poet said, Fortune smiles on those who dare. After encountering a very severe storm, the fleet touched at the island of Cozumel, where they found that the inhabitants had embraced Christianity either from fear of the Spaniards, or from finding the inability of their gods to help them. Just as the fleet was about to leave the island, Cortes had the good fortune to meet with a Spaniard named Geronimo de Aguilar, who had been kept a prisoner by the Indians for eight years. During that time he had learnt the Indian language perfectly. He was as prudent as he was clever, and when he joined the expedition he was of the greatest use as an interpreter. After doubling Cape Catoche, Cortes sailed down the Bay of Campeche, past Potonchan, and entered the Rio Tabasco, hoping to meet with as friendly a reception there as Grijalva had done, and also to collect an equally large quantity of gold. But he found a great change had taken place in the feelings of the natives, and he was obliged to employ force. In spite of the bravery and numerical superiority of the Indians, the Spaniards overcame them in several engagements, thanks to the terror caused by the reports of their firearms and the sight of the cavalry, whom the Indians took for supernatural beings. The Indians lost a large number of men in these engagements, while among the Spaniards two were killed and fourteen men and several horses wounded. The wounds of the latter were dressed with fat taken from the dead bodies of the Indians. At last peace was made, and the natives gave Cortes provisions, some cotton clothing, a small quantity of gold, and twenty female slaves, among whom was the celebrated Marina, who rendered such signal services to the Spaniards as an interpreter, and who was mentioned by all the historians of the conquest of the New World. Cortes continued on a westerly course, seeking a suitable place for landing, but he could find none until he reached St. John de Alua. The fleet had scarcely cast anchor before a canoe made its way fearlessly to the admiral's vessel, and here a marina, who was of Aztec origin, was of greatest use, in telling Cortes that the Indians of this part of the country were the subjects of a great empire, and that their province was one recently added to it by conquest. Their monarch, named Moctezuma, better known under the name of Montezuma, lived in Tenochtitlan, or Mexico, nearly 210 miles away in the interior. Cortes offered the Indians some presents, assuring them of his specific intentions, and then disembarked upon the torrid and unhealthy shore of Veracruz. Provisions flowed in immediately, but the day after the landing, Teutile, governor of the province and ambassador of Montezuma to the Spaniards, had much difficulty in answering Cortes when he asked him to conduct him to his master without delay, knowing as he did all the anxiety and fears which had haunted the mind of the emperor since the arrival of the Spaniards. However, he caused some cotton stuffs, feather cloaks, and some articles made of gold to be laid at the feet of the general, a sight which simply excited the cupidity of the Europeans. To give these poor Indians an adequate idea of his power, Cortes called out his soldiers and put them through their drill. He also ordered the discharge of some pieces of artillery, the noise of which froze the hearts of the savages with terror. During the whole time of the interview, some painters had been employed in sketching upon pieces of white cotton, the ships, the troops, and everything which had struck their fancy. These drawings, very cleverly executed, were to be sent to Montezuma. But before beginning the history of the heroic struggles which shortly commenced, it will be useful to give some details as to that Mexican empire which, powerful as it appeared, nevertheless contained within itself numerous elements of decay and dissolution, which fact explains the cause of its conquest by a mere handful of adventurers. That part of America which was under the dominion of Montezuma was called Anahuac and lay between 14 degrees and 20 degrees north latitude. This region presents great varieties of climate on account of its difference of altitude. Toward the center, and rather nearer to the Pacific than to the Atlantic, there is a huge basin at an elevation of 7,500 feet above the sea, and about 200 miles in circumference. 
in the hollow of which there were at the time several lakes this depression is called the valley of mexico taking its name from the capital of the empire as may be easily supposed we possess very few authentic details about a people whose written annals were burnt by the ignorant conquistadores and by fanatical monks who jealously suppressed everything which might remind the conquered race of their ancient religious and political traditions arriving from the north in the seventh century the toltecs had overspread the plateau of anahuac they were an intelligent race of people addicted to agriculture and the mechanical arts understanding the working in metals and to whom is due the construction of the greater part of the sumptuous and gigantic edifices of which the ruins are found in every direction in new spain after four centuries of power the toltecs disappeared from the country as mysteriously as they had come a century later they were replaced by a savage tribe from the northwest who were soon followed by more civilized races speaking apparently the toltec language the most celebrated of these tribes were the aztecs and the alcorques or tezcucans who assimilated themselves easily with the tincture of civilization which remained in the country with the last of the toltecs the aztecs after a series of migrations and wars settled themselves in thirteen twenty six in the valley of mexico where they built their capital tenochtitlan a treaty of alliance both offensive and defensive was entered into between the states of mexico tezcuco and tlacopan and was rigorously observed for a whole century in consequence of this aztec civilization which had been at first bounded by the extent of the valley spread on all sides and soon was limited only by the pacific and atlantic oceans in a short time these people had reached a higher degree of civilization than any other tribe in the new world the rights of property were recognized in mexico commerce flourished there and three kinds of coin and circulation provided the ordinary mechanism of exchange there was a well-organized police and a system of relays which worked with perfect regularity and enabled the sovereign to transmit his orders with rapidity from one end of the empire to the other the number and beauty of the towns the great size of the palaces temples and fortresses indicated an advanced civilization which presented a singular contrast to the ferocious manners of the aztecs their polytheistic religion was in the highest degree barbarous and sanguinary the priests formed a very numerous body and exercised great influence even over political affairs side by side with rites similar to those of christians such as baptism and confession the religion presented a tissue of the most absurd and bloody superstitions the offering up of human sacrifices adopted at the beginning of the fourteenth century and used at first very sparingly had soon become so frequent that the number of victims immolated each year and drawn chiefly from the conquered nations amounted to twenty thousand while under certain circumstances the number was much larger thus in fourteen eighty six at the inauguration of the temple of huitzilopochtli seventy thousand captives perished in a single day the government of mexico was monarchical at first the imperial power had been carefully limited but it had increased with the various conquests and had become despotic the sovereign was always chosen out of the same family and his accession was marked by the offering up of numerous human sacrifices the emperor montezuma belonged to the sacerdotal caste and in consequence his power received some unwonted development the result of his numerous wars had been the extension of his frontiers and the subjugation of various nations these latter welcomed the spaniards with eagerness thinking that their dominion must surely be less oppressive and less cruel than that of the aztecs it is certain that if montezuma with the large force which he had at his disposal had fallen upon the spaniards when they were occupying the hot and unhealthy shore of vera cruz they would have been unable in spite of the superiority of their arms and discipline to resist such a shock they must all have perished or been obliged to re-embark and the fate of the new world would have been completely changed but the decision which formed the most salient point in the character of cortez was completely wanting in that of montezuma a prince who never could at any time adopt a resolute policy fresh ambassadors from the emperor had arrived at the spanish camp bringing to cortez an order to quit the country and upon his refusal all intercourse between the natives and the invaders had immediately ceased the situation was becoming critical and this cortez felt after having overcome some hesitation which had been shown by the troops he laid the foundations of vera cruz a fortress designed to serve as a basis of operations and a shelter in case of a possible re-embarkation he next organized a kind of civil government a junta as it would be called in the present day to which he resigned the commission which had been revoked by velasquez and then he made the junta give him one with new provisions and more extended powers after this he received the envoys from the town of zempoalla who were coming to solicit his alliance and his protection against montezuma whose dominion they bore with impatience cortez was indeed fortunate in meeting with such allies so soon after landing and not wishing to allow so golden an opportunity to slip he welcomed the totonacs kindly 
went with them to their capital and after having caused a fortress to be constructed at kiabislan on the seashore he persuaded his new friends to refuse the payment of tribute to montezuma he took advantage of his stay at zempoia to exhort these people to embrace christianity and he threw down their idols as he had already done at Cozumel, to prove to them the powerlessness of their gods meanwhile a plot had been forming in his own camp and cortez feeling convinced that as long as there remained any way of returning to cuba there would be constant lukewarmness and discontent among his soldiers caused all his ships to be run aground under the pretext of their being in too shattered a condition to be of any further use this was an unheard-of act of audacity and one which forced his companions either to conquer or to die having no longer anything to fear from the want of discipline of his troops cortez set out for zempoia on the sixteenth of august with five hundred soldiers fifteen horses and six field cannon and also two hundred indian porters who were intended to perform all menial offices the little army soon reached the frontiers of the small republic of Tlaxcala, of which the fierce inhabitants impatient of servitude had long been engaged in strife with montezuma cortez flattered himself that his oft-proclaimed intention of delivering the indians from the mexican yoke would induce the tlascalans to become his allies and at once to make common cause with him he therefore asked for leave to cross their territory on his way to mexico but his ambassadors were detained and as he advanced into the interior of the country he was harassed for fourteen consecutive days and nights by continual attacks from several bodies of tlascalans amounting in all to thirty thousand men who displayed a bravery and determination such as the spaniards had never yet seen equalled in the new world but the arms possessed by these brave men were very primitive what could they effect with only arrows and lances tipped with obsidian or fish bones stakes hardened in the fire wooden swords and above all with an inferior system of tactics when they found that each encounter cost them the lives of many of their bravest warriors while not a single spaniard had been killed they imagined that these strangers must be of a superior order of beings while they could not tell what opinion to form of men who sent back to them the spies taken in their camp with their hands cut off and who yet after each victory not only did not devour their prisoners as the aztecs would have done but released them loading them with presents and proposing peace upon this the tlascalans declared themselves vassals of the spanish crown and swore to assist cortez in all his expeditions while he on his side promised to protect them against their enemies it was time that peace should be made for many of the spaniards were wounded or ill and all were worn out with fatigue but the entry and triumph into tlascala where they were welcomed as supernatural beings quickly made them forget their sufferings after twenty days of repose in this town cortez resumed his march towards mexico having with him an auxiliary army of six thousand tlascalans he went first to cholula a town regarded as sacred by the indians and as the sanctuary and favored residence of their deities montezuma felt much satisfaction in the advance of the spaniards to this town either from the hope that the gods would themselves avenge the desecration of their temples or that he thought a rising and massacre of the spaniards might be more easily organized in this populous and fanatical town cortez had been warned by the tlascalans that he must place no trust in the protestations of friendship and devotion made by the cholulans however he took up his quarters in the town considering that he would lose his prestige if he showed any signs of fear but upon being informed by the tlascalans that the women and children were being sent away and by marina that a considerable body of troops was massed at the gates of the city that pitfalls and trenches were dug in the streets whilst the roofs of the houses were loaded with stones and missiles cortez anticipated the designs of his enemies gave orders to make prisoners of all the principal men of the town and then organized a general massacre of the population thus taken by surprise and deprived of their leaders for two whole days the unhappy cholulans were subject to all the horrors which could be invented by the rage of the spaniards and the vengeance of their allies the tlascalans a terrible example was made six thousand people being put to the sword temples burned to the ground and the town half destroyed a work of destruction well calculated to strike terror into the hearts of montezuma and his subjects end of second part chapter one Part 2A. Recording by Jonathan Drury, Los Angeles, California. Section 26 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Drury. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 2b. Sixty miles now separated Cortez from the capital, 
and everywhere as he passed along he was received as a liberator. There was not a cacique who had not some cause of complaint against the imperial despotism, and Cortes felt confirmed in the hope that so divided an empire would prove an easy prey. As the Spaniards descended from the mountains of Chalco, they beheld with astonishment the valley of Mexico, with its enormous lake, deeply sunk and surrounded by large towns, the capital city built upon piles, and the well-cultivated fields of this fertile region. Cortes did not trouble himself about the continued tergiversations of Montezuma, who could not make up his mind to the last moment whether he would receive the Spaniards as friends or enemies. The Spanish general advanced along the causeway which leads to Mexico across the lake, and was already within a mile of the town, when some Indians, who from their magnificent costume were evidently of high rank, came to greet him and to announce to him the approach of the emperor. Montezuma soon appeared, borne upon the soldiers of his favorites in a kind of litter adorned with gold and feathers, while a magnificent canopy protected him from the rays of the sun. As he advanced, the Indians prostrated themselves before him, with their heads downward, as though unworthy even to look at their monarch. This first interview was cordial, and Montezuma himself conducted his guests to the abode which he had prepared for them. It was a vast palace, surrounded by a stone wall, and defended by high towers. Cortes immediately took measures of defense, and ordered the cannon to be pointed upon the roads leading to the palace. At the second interview, magnificent presents were offered both to the general and soldiers. Montezuma related that, according to an old tradition, the ancestors of the Aztecs had arrived in the country under the leadership of a man of white complexion, and bearded like the Spaniards. After laying the foundations of their power, he had embarked upon the ocean, promising them that one day his descendants would come to visit them and to reform their laws, and if, as Montezuma said, he now received the Spaniards rather as fathers than as foreigners, it was because he felt convinced that in them he beheld the descendants of his people's ancient chief, and he begged them to regard themselves as the masters of his country. The following days were employed in visiting the town, which appeared to the Spaniards as larger, more populous, and more beautiful than any city which they had hitherto seen in America. Its distinguishing peculiarity consisted in the causeways which formed a means of communication with the land, and which were cut through in various places to allow a free passage to vessels sailing on the waters of the lake. Across these openings were thrown bridges which could be easily destroyed. On the eastern side of the town there was no causeway and no means of communication with the land except by canoes. This arrangement of the town of Mexico caused some anxiety to Cortes, who saw that he might be at any moment blockaded in the town without being able to find means of egress. He determined, therefore, to prevent any seditious attempt by securing the person of the emperor and using him as a hostage. The following news which he had just received furnished him with an excellent pretext. Qualpopoca, a Mexican general, had attacked the provinces which had submitted to the Spaniards, and Escalante and seven of his soldiers had been mortally wounded. Besides this, a prisoner had been beheaded and the head carried from town to town, thus proving that the invaders could be conquered and were nothing more than ordinary mortals. Cortes profited by these events to accuse the emperor of perfidy. He declared that although Montezuma appeared friendly to him and to his soldiers, it was only that he might wait for some favorable opportunity to treat them in the same manner as Escalante, a proceeding quite unworthy of a monarch, and very different from the confidence which Cortes had shown in coming, as he had done, to visit him. He went on to say that if the suspicions of the Spaniards were not justified, the emperor could easily exonerate himself by having Qualpopoca punished, and finally, to prevent the recurrence of aggression which could but destroy the existing harmony, and to prove to the Mexicans that he harbored no ill design against the Spaniards, Montezuma could not do otherwise than come to reside amongst them. It may be easily imagined that the emperor was not very ready to decide upon this course, but was at last obliged to give in to the violence and threats of the Spaniards. Upon announcing his resolution to his subjects, he was made to assure them several times over that he put himself into the hands of the Spaniards of his own free will. These words were needed to calm the Mexicans, who threatened to make an attack upon the foreigners. The success of Cortes in this bold scheme was quite beyond his expectations. Qualpopoca, with his son and five of the chief ringleaders in the revolt, were seized by the Mexicans and brought before a Spanish tribunal, which was at the same time judge and prosecutor. The Indians were condemned and burnt alive. Not content with having punished men who had committed no crime but that of executing the orders of their emperor, and of opposing an armed resistance to the invasion of their country, Cortes imposed a new humiliation upon Montezuma, in placing fetters upon his feet, under the pretext that the culprits in their last moments had made accusations against him. For six months the conquistador exercised the supreme government in the name of the emperor, now reduced to a puppet show of authority. Cortes changed the governors who displeased him, collected the taxes, 
presided over all the details of the administration, and sent Spaniards into the various provinces of the empire with orders to examine their productions, and to take particular notice of the mining districts and the processes in use for collecting gold. Cortes also turned to account the curiosity evinced by Montezuma to see European ships, to have rigging and other appurtenances brought from Veracruz, and to order the construction of two brigantines destined to ensure his communications with terra firma by the waters of the lake. Emboldened by receiving so many proofs of submission and humility, Cortes took another step in advance, and required that Montezuma should declare himself the vassal and tributary of Spain. The act of fidelity and homage was accompanied, as may be easily imagined, with presents both rich and numerous, as well as by a heavy tax which was levied without much difficulty. The opportunity was now taken to gather together everything in gold and silver which had been extorted from the Indians, and to melt them down, except certain pieces which were kept as they were on account of the beauty of the workmanship. The whole did not amount to more than 600,000 pesos, or 100,000 L. Thus, although the Spaniards had made use of all their power, and Montezuma had exhausted his treasures to satisfy them, the whole product amounted to an absurdly small sum, very little in accordance with the idea which the conquerors had formed of the riches of the country. After reserving one-fifth of the treasure for the king, and one-fifth for Cortes, and subtracting enough to reimburse the sums which had been advanced for the expenses of the expedition, the share of each soldier did not amount to one hundred pesos, and they considered that it would have been more worth their while to have remained in Hispaniola than to have experienced such fatigues, encountered such great dangers, and suffered so many privations, all for the reward of one hundred pesos. If the promises of Cortes ended in this beggarly result, and if the partition had been made with fairness, of which they did not feel certain, they argued that it was absurd to remain longer in so poor a country, while under a chief less prodigal in promises, but more generous, they might go to countries rich in gold and precious stones, where brave warriors would find an adequate compensation for their toils. So murmured these greedy adventurers, some accepting what fell to their share while fuming over its small amount, others disdainfully refusing it. Cortes had succeeded in persuading Montezuma to conform to his will in everything which concerned politics, but it was otherwise in regard to religion. He could not persuade him to change his creed, and when Cortes wished to throw down the idols, as he had done at Sempoaya, a tumult arose which would have become very serious had he not immediately abandoned his project. From that time the Mexicans, who had offered scarcely any resistance to the subjugation and imprisonment of their monarch, resolved to avenge their outraged deities, and they prepared a simultaneous rising against the invaders. It was at this juncture, when the affairs in the interior seemed to be taking a less favorable turn, that Cortes received news from Veracruz, that several ships were cruising off the harbor. At first he thought this must be a fleet sent to his aid by Charles V, in answer to a letter which he had sent to him on the 16th of July, 1519, by Puerto Carrero and Montejo. But he was soon undeceived, and learnt that this expedition was organized by Diego Velasquez, who knew by experience how lightly his lieutenant could shake off all dependence upon him. He had sent this armament with the object of deposing Cortes from his command, and of making him a prisoner, and of carrying him off to Cuba, where he would be speedily placed upon his trial. The fleet thus sent was under the command of Pamphilo de Narvaez. It consisted of eighteen vessels, and carried eighty horse soldiers, and one hundred infantry, of whom eighty were musketeers. 120 crossbowmen, and 12 cannons. Narvaez disembarked without opposition, near the fort of San Juan de Olua, but upon summoning of the governor of Veracruz, Sandoval, to give up the town to him, Sandoval seized the men who were charged with the insolent message, and sent them off to Mexico, where Cortes at once released them, and then gained from them circumstantial information as to the forces and the projects of Narvaez. The personal danger of Cortes at this moment was great. The troops sent by Velasquez were more numerous and better furnished with arms and ammunition than were his own, but his deepest cause of anxiety was not the possibility of his own condemnation and death. It was the fear lest all fruit of his efforts might be lost, and the knowledge of the hurtfulness of these dissensions to his country's cause. The situation was a critical one, but after mature reflection and careful weighing of arguments for and against the course he meditated, Cortes determined to fight, even at a disadvantage, rather than to sacrifice his conquests and the interests of Spain. Before proceeding to this last extremity, he sent his chaplain Olmedo to Narvaez, but he was very ill-received, and saw all his proposals for an accommodation disdainfully rejected. Olmedo met with more success amongst the soldiers, who most of them knew him, and to whom he distributed a number of chains, gold rings, and other jewels, which were well calculated to give them a high idea of the riches of the conqueror. But, when Narvaez heard of what was going on, he determined not to leave his troops any longer exposed to temptation. 
he set a price upon the heads of cortez and his principal officers and advanced to the encounter cortez however was too skilful to be enticed into giving battle under unfavorable circumstances he temporized and succeeded in tiring out narvaez and his troops who retired to zempoalla then cortez having taken his measures with consummate prudence and the surprise and terror of a nocturnal attack which he organized compensating for the inferiority of his troops he made prisoners of his enemy and all his soldiers his own loss amounting to but two men the conqueror treated the vanquished well and gave them the choice between returning to cuba or remaining to share his fortune this latter proposal backed up as it was by gifts and promises appeared so seductive to the new arrivals that cortez found himself at the head of one thousand soldiers the day after he had been in danger of falling into the hands of narvaez this rapid change of fortune was turned to the greatest advantage by the skilful diplomacy of cortez who hastened to return to mexico the troops whom he had left there under the command of alvarado to guard the emperor and the treasure were reduced to the last extremity by the natives who had killed or wounded a great number of soldiers and who kept the rest in a state of close blockade while threatening them constantly with a general assault it must be confessed that the imprudent and criminal conduct of the spaniards and notably the massacre of the most distinguished citizens of the emperor during a fete had brought about the rising which they dreaded and which they had hoped to prevent after having been joined by two thousand tlascalans cortez pressed forward by forced marches towards the capital where he arrived in safety and found that the indians had not destroyed the bridges belonging to the causeways and dikes which joined mexico to the land in spite of the arrival of this reinforcement the situation did not improve each day it was necessary to engage in new combats and to make sorties to clear the avenues leading to the palace occupied by the spaniards cortez now saw but too plainly the mistake which he had made in shutting himself up in a town where his position might be stormed at any moment and from which it was so difficult to extricate himself in this difficulty he had recourse to montezuma who by virtue of his authority and of the prestige which still clung to him could appease the tumult give the spaniards some respite and enable them to prepare for their retreat but when the unfortunate emperor now become a mere toy in the hands of the spaniards appeared upon the walls decked out with regal ornaments and implored his subjects to cease from hostilities murmurs of discontent arose and threats were freely uttered hostilities began afresh and before the soldiers had time to protect him with their shields montezuma was pierced with arrows and hit upon the head by a stone which knocked him down at this sight the indians horrified at the crime which they had just committed at once ceased fighting and fled in all directions while the emperor understanding but too late all the baseness of the part which cortez had forced him to play tore off the bandages which had been applied to his wounds and refusing all nourishment he died cursing the spaniards after so fatal an event there was no more room to hope for peace with the mexicans and it became necessary to retire in haste and at whatever cost from a town in which the spaniards were threatened with blockade and starvation for this retreat cortez was preparing in secret he saw his troops each day more and more closely hemmed in while several times he was forced himself to take his sword in his hand and to fight like a common soldier solis even relates but upon what authority is not known that during an assault which was made upon one of the edifices commanding the spanish quarter two young mexicans recognizing cortez who was cheering on his soldiers resolved to sacrifice themselves in the hope of killing the man who had been the author of their country's calamities they approached him in a suppliant attitude as though they would ask for quarter then seizing him round the waist they dragged him toward the battlements over which they threw themselves hoping to drag him over with them but thanks to his exceptional strength and agility cortez managed to escape from their embrace and these two brave mexicans perished in the generous but vain attempt to save their country the retreat being determined on it was necessary to decide upon whether it should be carried out by night or by day if in the daytime the enemy would be more easily resisted and ambuscades which might be prepared would be more easily avoided while they could better take precautions to repair any bridges broken by the mexicans on the other hand it was known that the indians will seldom attack an enemy after sunset but what really decided cortez in favor of a nocturnal retreat was that a soldier who dabbled in astrology had declared to his comrades that success was certain if they acted in the night they therefore began their march at midnight besides the spanish troop cortez had under his orders detachments from tlascala zempoalla and cholula which notwithstanding the serious losses which had been sustained still numbered seven thousand men sandoval commanded the vanguard and cortez the centre where were the cannon baggage and prisoners amongst whom were a son and two daughters of montezuma alvarado and velasquez de leon led the rearguard with the army was carried a flying bridge which had been constructed to throw over any gaps there might be in the causeway scarcely had the spaniards debouched upon the dike leading to tacuba which was the shortest of all when they were attacked in front flank and rear by solid masses of the enemy 
whilst from the fleet of numberless canoes a perfect hailstorm of stones and missiles fell upon them blinded and amazed the allies knew not against whom to defend themselves first the wooden bridge sank under the weight of the artillery and fighting men crowded together upon a narrow causeway where they could not use their firearms deprived of their cavalry who had not room to act mingled with the indians in a hand-to-hand -hand combat not having strength to kill and surrounded on all sides the spaniards and their allies gave way under the ever-renewed numbers of the assailants officers and soldiers infantry and cavalry spaniards and Tlaxcalans were confounded together each defending himself to the best of his ability without caring about discipline or the common safety all seemed lost when cortez with one hundred men succeeded in crossing the breach in the dike upon the mass of corpses which filled it up he drew up his soldiers in order as they arrived and putting himself at the head of those least severely wounded plunged wedge fashion into a melee and succeeded in disengaging from it a portion of his men before day dawned all those who had succeeded in escaping from the massacre of the noche triste as this terrible night was called found themselves reunited at tacuba it was with eyes full of tears that cortez passed in review his remaining soldiers all covered with wounds and took account of the losses which he had sustained four thousand indians tlascalans and chalulans and nearly all the horses were killed all the artillery and ammunition as well as the greatest part of the baggage were lost and amongst the dead were several officers of distinction velasquez de leon salcedo morla lares and many others one of those most dangerously hurt was alvarado but not one man whether officer or soldier was without a wound the fugitives did not delay at tacuba and by accident they took the road to tlascala where they did not know what reception might await them ever harassed by the mexicans the spaniards were again obliged to give battle upon the plains of otumba to a number of warriors whom some historians reckon at two hundred thousand thanks to the presence of some cavalry soldiers who still remained to him cortez was able to overthrow all who were in front of him and to reach a troop of persons whose high rank was easily discerned by their gilded plumes and luxurious costumes amongst whom was the general bearing the standard accompanied by some horsemen cortez threw himself upon this group and was fortunate enough or skilful enough to overturn by a lance thrust the mexican general who was then dispatched by the sword by a soldier named juan de salamanca from the moment when the standard disappeared the battle was gained and the mexicans panic-stricken fled hastily from the field of battle never had the spaniards incurred greater danger says prescott and had it not been for the lucky star of cortez not one would have survived to transmit to posterity the history of the sanguinary battle of otumba the booty was considerable and sufficed in part to indemnify the spaniards for the loss they had sustained in leaving mexico for this army which they had just defeated was composed of the principal warriors of the nation who having been quite confident of success had adorned themselves with their richest ornaments the day after the battle the spaniards entered the territory of tlascala bernal diaz says i shall now call the attention of curious readers to the fact that when we returned to mexico to the relief of alvarado we were in all thirteen hundred men including in that number ninety-seven horsemen eighty crossbowmen and the same number armed with carbines besides we had more than two thousand tlascalans and much artillery our second entry into mexico took place on st john's day fifteen twenty our flight from the city was on the tenth day of the month of july following and we fought the memorable battle of otumba on the fourteenth day of this same month of july and now i would draw attention to the number of men who were killed at mexico during the passage of the causeways and bridges in the battle of otumba and in the other encounters upon the route i declare that in the space of five days eight hundred and sixty of our men were massacred including ten of our soldiers and five castilian women who were killed in the village of rustepeque we lost besides twelve hundred tlascalans during the same time it is to be noticed also that if the number of dead in the troop of narvaez were greater than in the troop of cortez it was because the former soldiers set out on the march laden with a quantity of gold the weight of which hindered them from swimming and from getting out of the trenches the troops with cortez were reduced to four hundred and forty men with twenty horses twelve crossbowmen and seven carabiners they had not a single charge of gunpowder they were all wounded lame or maimed in the arms it was the same number of men that had followed cortez when he first entered mexico but how great a difference was there between that conquering troop and the vanquished soldiers who now quitted the capital as they entered the tlascalan territory cortez recommended his men and especially those of narvaez not to do anything which could vex the natives the common safety depending upon not irritating the only allies which remained to them happily the fears which had arisen as to the fidelity of the tlascalans proved groundless they gave the spaniards a most sympathizing welcome and their thoughts seemed to be wholly bent upon avenging the death of their brothers massacred by the mexicans while in their capital cortez heard of the loss of two more detachments but these reverses grave as they were 
did not discourage him he had under his orders troops inured to war and faithful allies veracruz was intact he might once more reckon upon his good fortune but before undertaking a new campaign or entering upon another siege help must be sought and preparations made and with these objects in view the general set to work he sent four ships to hispaniola to enroll volunteers and purchase powder and ammunition and meanwhile he caused trees to be cut down in the mountains of tlascala and with the wood thus obtained twelve brigantines were constructed which were to be carried in pieces to the lake of mexico to be launched there at the moment when needed end of second part chapter one part two b recording by jonathan drury mexico city section twenty seven of celebrated travels and travelers volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jonathan drury celebrated travels and travelers volume one exploration of the world by jules verne second part chapter one part two c after suppressing some attempts at mutiny amongst the soldiers in which those who had come with narvaez were the most to blame cortez again marched forwards and with the help of the tlascalans first attacked the people of tepeaca and of other neighboring provinces a measure which had the advantage of exercising anew his own troops in war and of training his allies while this was going on two brigantines bringing ammunition and reinforcements fell into the hands of cortez these ships had been sent to narvaez by velasquez in ignorance of his misadventures at this time also some spaniards sent by francis de garay governor of jamaica joined the army in consequence of these reinforcements the troops with cortez after he had rid himself of several partisans of narvaez with whom he was dissatisfied amounted to five hundred infantry of whom eighty carried muskets and forty horse soldiers with this army and with one thousand tlascalans cortez set out once more for mexico on the twenty eighth of december fifteen twenty six months after he had been forced to abandon the city this campaign had for its theatre countries already described and must therefore be passed over somewhat rapidly here notwithstanding the interest attaching to it to enter fully into the history of the conquest of mexico would not be in accordance with the primary object of this work after the death of montezuma his brother quetlavaca was raised to the throne and he adopted all the measures of precaution compatible with aztec strategic science but he died of the smallpox the sad gift of the spaniards to the new world at the very moment when his brilliant qualities of foresight and bravery were the most needed by his country his successor was guatimosin the nephew of montezuma a man distinguished by his talents and courage cortez had no sooner entered the mexican territory than fighting began he speedily captured the town of tezcuco which was situated at twenty miles distance upon the edge of the great central lake that lake upon whose waters the spaniards were to see an imposing flotilla floating three months later at this time a fresh conspiracy which had for its object the assassination of cortez and his principal officers was discovered and the chief culprit executed at this moment fate seemed in every way to smile upon cortez he had just received the news of the arrival of fresh reinforcements at vera cruz and the greater part of the towns under the dominion of guatimosin had submitted to the force of his arms the actual siege of mexico began in the month of may fifteen twenty one and continued with alternate success and reverse until the day when the brigantines were launched upon the water of the lake the mexicans did not hesitate to attack them from four to five thousand canoes each bearing two men covered the lake and advanced to the assault of the spanish vessels which carried in all nearly three hundred men these nine brigantines were provided with cannon and soon dispersed or sunk the enemy's fleet who thenceforth left them in undisputed possession of the water but this success and certain other advantages gained by cortez had no very marked consequences and the siege dragged slowly on until the general made up his mind to capture the town by force unfortunately the officer who was charged with protecting the line of retreat by the causeways while the spaniards were making their way into the town abandoned his post thinking it unworthy of his valor and went to join in the combat guatimozin was informed of the fault which had been committed and at once took advantage of it his troops attacked the spaniards on all sides with such fury that numbers of them were killed in a short time while sixty-two of the soldiers fell alive into the hands of the mexicans a fate which cortez who was severely wounded in the thigh narrowly escaped sharing during the night following the great temple of the war-god was illuminated in sign of triumph and the spaniards listened in profound sadness to the beating of the great drum from the position they occupied they could witness the end of the prisoners their unfortunate countrymen whose breasts were open and their hearts torn out and whose dead bodies were hurled down the steps they were then torn in pieces by the aztecs who quarrelled over the pieces with the object of using them for a horrible festival 
this terrible defeat caused the siege to go on slowly until the day came when three parts of the city having been taken or destroyed guatemuzin was obliged by his counsellors to quit mexico and to set out for the mainland where he reckoned upon organizing his resistance but the boat which carried him being seized he was made prisoner in his captivity he was destined to display much greater dignity and strength of character than his uncle montezuma had done from this time all resistance ceased and cortez might take possession of the half-destroyed capital after a heroic resistance in which one hundred and twenty thousand mexicans according to some accounts but two hundred and forty thousand according to others had perished after a siege which had lasted not less than seventy days mexico and with the city all the rest of the empire succumbed less indeed to the blows dealt against it by the spaniards than to the long-standing hatred and the revolts of the subjugated people and to the jealousy of the neighboring states fated soon to regret the yoke which they had so deliberately shaken off contempt and rage soon succeeded amongst the spaniards to the intoxication of success the immense riches upon which they had reckoned either had no existence or they had been thrown into the lake cortez found it impossible to calm the malcontents and was obliged to allow the emperor and his principal minister to be put to torture some historians and notably gomara report that whilst the spaniards were stirring the fire which burnt below the gridiron upon which the two victims were extended the minister turned his head towards his master and apparently begged him to speak in order to put an end to their tortures but that guatimozin reproved this single moment of weakness by these words and i am i assisting at some pleasure or am i in the bath an answer which has been poetically changed into and i do i lie upon roses the historians of the conquest of mexico have usually stopped short at the taking of mexico but it remains for us to speak of some other expeditions undertaken by cortez with different aims but which resulted in casting quite a new light upon some portions of central america besides we cannot leave this hero who played so large a part in the history of the new world and in the development of its civilization without giving some details of the end of his life with the fall of the capital was involved properly speaking that of the mexican empire if there was still some resistance as notably there was in the province of oaxaca it was of an isolated character and a few detachments of troops sufficed to reduce the submission to the last remaining opponents of the spaniards terrified as the mexicans were by the punishments which had been dealt out to the people of panuco who had revolted at the same time ambassadors were sent by the people of distant countries of the empire to convince themselves of the reality of that wonderful event the taking of mexico to behold the ruins of the abhorred town and to tender their submission to the conquerors cortez was at length confirmed in the position he held after incidents which would take too long to relate and which caused him to say it has been harder for me to fight against my countrymen than against the aztecs it now remained to him to organize the conquered country and he began by establishing the seat of government in mexico which he rebuilt he attracted spaniards to the city by granting them concessions of land and the indians by allowing them at first to remain under the authority of their native chiefs although he speedily reduced them all except the tlascalans to the condition of slaves by the vicious system of repartimientos in vogue in the spanish colonies but if it is justifiable to reproach cortez with having held cheaply to the political rights of the indians it must be conceded that he manifested the most laudable solicitude for their spiritual well-being to further this object he brought over some franciscans who by their zeal and charity in a short time gained the veneration of the natives and in a space of twenty years brought about the conversion of the whole population at the same time cortez sent some troops into the state of michoacan who penetrated as far as the pacific ocean and as they returned visited some of the rich provinces situated in the north cortez found settlements in all the parts of the country which appeared to him advantageous at Zacatula upon the shores of the Pacific, at Coliman in Michoacán, at Santa Sebastián near Tampico, at Medellín near Veracruz, etc. Immediately after the pacification of the country, Cortés entrusted Cristóbal de Olid with the command of a considerable force, in order to establish a colony in Honduras, and at the same time Olid was to explore the southern coast of that province, and to seek for a strait which should form a communication between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans but carried away by the pride of command olid had no sooner reached his destination than he declared himself independent whereupon cortez immediately dispatched one of his relations to arrest the culprit and set out himself accompanied by guatimosin at the head of one hundred horsemen and fifty foot soldiers on the twelfth of october fifteen twenty four after crossing the provinces of quatzcoalco tabasco and yucatan and enduring all kinds of privations in the course of a most trying march over marshy and shifting ground and across a perfect ocean of undulating forests the detachment was approaching the province of aculan when cortez was told of the existence of a plot formed as was said by guatimosin and the principal indian chiefs 
its aim was to seize the first opportunity to massacre both officers and soldiers after which the march to honduras was to be continued the settlements were to be destroyed and then there was to be a return to mexico where during a general rising there would doubtless be small difficulty experienced in getting rid of the invaders guatimusin in vain protested his innocence in which there is every reason to believe he was hung as well as several of the aztec nobles upon the branches of a ceiba tree which shaded the road bernal diaz del castillo says the execution of guatimosin was very unjust and we were all agreed in condemning it but prescott says if cortes had consulted his own interest and his renown he should have spared him for he was the living trophy of his victory as a man keeps gold in the lining of his coat at length the spaniards reached aculan a flourishing town where they refreshed themselves after their journey in excellent quarters when they set out again it was in the direction of the lake of peten a, sm a part of the country where the population was easily converted to christianity we shall not dwell upon the sufferings and misery which tried the expedition in these sparsely peopled countries until it arrived at san gil de buenavista upon the golfo dulce where cortes after receiving the news of the execution of olid and the re-establishment of the central authority embarked upon his return to mexico at this time he entrusted to alvarado the command of three hundred infantry one hundred and sixty cavalry and four cannon with a body of indian auxiliaries with which he set out for the south of mexico to conquer guatemala he reduced to submission the provinces of zacatulan tehuantepec soconusco utlatlan and laid the foundations of the town of guatemala la vieja when some time afterward he made a voyage to spain he was named by charles v governor of the countries which he had conquered three years had not expired after the conquest before a territory twelve hundred miles in length upon the seaboard of the atlantic and fifteen hundred miles upon that of the pacific had submitted to the castilian crown and with but few exceptions was in a state of perfect tranquillity the return of cortes to mexico from the useless expedition to honduras which had wasted so much time and caused almost as great sufferings to the spaniards as the conquest of mexico had taken place but a few days when he received the news that he was temporarily replaced by another commander and was invited to repair to spain to exculpate himself from certain charges he was not in any haste to comply with this order hoping that it might be revoked but his indefatigable calumniators and his implacable enemies both in spain and mexico preferred accusations against him after such a manner that he found himself obliged to go and make his defence to state his wrongs and boldly to claim the approval of his conduct cortes therefore started accompanied by his friend sandoval as well as by tapia and under several aztec chiefs amongst whom was a son of montezuma he disembarked at palos in may fifteen twenty eight at the same place where columbus had landed thirty-five years before and he was welcomed with the same enthusiasm and rejoicings as the discoverer of america had been here cortes met with pizarro then at the outset of his career who was come to solicit the support of the spanish government cortes afterwards set out for toledo where the court then was the mere announcement of his return had produced a complete change in public opinion his unexpected arrival at once contradicted the idea that he harbored any projects of revolt and independence charles v saw that public feeling would be outraged at the thought of punishing a man who had added its greatest gem to the crown of castile and so the journey of cortes became one continual triumph in the midst of crowds of people greater than had ever been known before the houses and streets of the large towns and of the villages says prescott were filled with spectators impatient to contemplate the hero whose single arm might be said in some sort to have conquered an entire empire for spain and who to borrow the language of an old historian marched in all the pomp and glory not of a great vassal but of an independent monarch charles v after having granted several audiences to cortes and bestowed upon him those particular marks of favour which are termed important by courtiers deigned to accept from him the empire which he had conquered for him and the magnificent presents which he brought but he considered that he had fully recompensed him when he had given cortes the title of marquis de valle de oaxaca and the post of captain-general of new spain without however restoring him to the civil government a power which had been formally delegated to him by the junta of veracruz cortes after his marriage with the niece of the duc de bejar who belonged to one of the first families in spain accompanied the emperor who was on his way to italy to the port of embarkation but the general soon becoming tired of the frivolities of the court so little in accordance with the active habits of his past life set out again for mexico in fifteen thirty and landed at villarica after his arrival he underwent some annoyance caused by the audienza which had exercised the power in his absence and which had instituted lawsuits against him and he also found himself in conflict with the new civil junta on the subject of military affairs the marquis de la valle withdrew himself to cuernavaca where he had immense estates and busied himself with agriculture he was the means of introducing the sugar-cane and the mulberry to mexico he also encouraged the cultivation of hemp and flax and the breeding on a large scale of merino sheep 
but this peaceable life without adventures could not long satisfy the enterprising spirit of cortez in fifteen thirty two and fifteen thirty three he equipped two squadrons destined to make voyages of discovery in the northwest of the pacific the latter expedition reached the southern extremity of the peninsula of california without attaining the object sought namely the discovery of a strait uniting pacific with the atlantic cortez himself met with no better success in fifteen thirty six in the vermilion sea gulf of california three years later a concluding expedition of which cortez gave the command to ulloa penetrated to the farthest extremity of the gulf and then sailing along the exterior side of peninsula reached the twenty ninth degree of north latitude from thence the chief of the expedition sent back one of his ships to cortez while the rest proceeded northwards but from that time nothing more is heard of them such was the unhappy result of the expedition of cortez which while they did not bring him a single ducat cost him not less than three hundred thousand gold castellanos but they at least had the result of making known the coast of the pacific ocean from the bay of panama as far as colorado the tour of the california peninsula was made and it was thus discovered that what had been imagined to be an island was in reality a part of the continent the whole of the vermilion sea or sea of cortez as the spaniards justly named it was carefully explored and it was ascertained that instead of having an outlet as was supposed to the north it was in reality only a gulf deeply hollowed into the continent cortez had not been able to fit out these expeditions without coming into antagonism with the viceroy don antonio de mendoza whom the emperor had sent to mexico an appointment which had wounded the feelings of the marquis de la valle wearied with these continual annoyances and indignant at finding his prerogative as captain-general if not absolutely ignored at least perpetually questioned cortez left mexico and once more set out for spain but this journey was not destined at all to resemble the first grown old disgusted with life and betrayed by fortune the conquistador had no longer anything to expect from government he had not to wait long before receiving proof of this one day he pressed through the crowd which surrounded the emperor's coach and mounted upon the step of the door charles v pretended not to recognize him and asked who this man was cortez answered proudly it is the man who has given you more states than your father left you towns by this time public interest was diverted from mexico which had not yielded as much as had been expected from it and was centred upon the marvellous riches of peru cortez was however received with honour by the supreme council of the indies and permitted to state his complaints before it but the debates upon the subject were endlessly drawn out and he could obtain no redress in fifteen forty one against the disastrous expedition of charles v against algiers cortez who was serving in it as a volunteer but whose counsels had not been listened to had the misfortune to lose three great carved emeralds jewels which would have sufficed for the ransom of an empire upon his return he renewed his solicitations but with the same want of success his grief over this injustice and these repeated disappointments was so deep that his health suffered severely he died far from the scene of his exploits on the tenth of november fifteen forty seven at castilleja de la cuesta at the very moment when he was making preparations to return to america he was a true knight-errant says prescott of all that glorious troop of adventurers which the spain of the sixteenth century sent forth to a career of discovery and conquest there was not one more deeply imbued with the spirit of romantic enterprise than fernando cortez strife was his delight and he loved to attempt an enterprise by its most difficult side this passion for the romantic might have reduced the conqueror of mexico to the part of a common adventurer but cortez was certainly a profound politician and a great captain if one is justified in giving this name to a man who accomplished great actions by his own unassisted genius there is no other example in history of so great an enterprise having been carried to a successful end with such inadequate means it may be said with truth that cortez conquered mexico with his own resources alone his influence over the minds of his soldiers was the natural result of their confidence in his ability but it must be attributed also to his popular manners which rendered him eminently fit to lead a band of adventurers when he had attained to a higher rank if cortez displayed more of pomp his veterans at least continued on the same terms of intimacy with him as before in finishing this portrait of the conquistador we shall quote the upright and voracious bernal diaz with whose sentiments we fully agree he preferred his name of cortez to all the titles by which he might be addressed and he had good reasons for it for the name of cortez is as famous in our days as that of caesar among the romans or hannibal amongst the carthaginians the old chronicler ends by a touch which vividly depicts the religious spirit of the sixteenth century perhaps he was destined to receive his reward only in a better world and i fully believe it to be so for he was an honest knight very sincere in his devotions to the virgin to the apostle saint peter and to all the saints end of second part chapter one part two c recording by jonathan drury los angeles california
Section 28 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part. Chapter 1, Part 3. THE CONQUERORS OF CENTRAL AMERICA The information which had been gained by Balboa as to the riches of the countries situated to the south of Panama had scarcely become known to the Spaniards before several expeditions were organized to attempt the conquest of them. But all had failed, either from the means used being insufficient, or from the commanders not being equal to the greatness of the undertaking. It must be confessed also that the localities explored by these first adventurers, these pioneers, as they would be called nowadays, did not at all come up to what Spanish greed had expected from them, and for this reason that all the attempts had been hitherto made upon what was then called terra firma, a country preeminently unhealthy, mountainous, marshy, and covered with forests. The inhabitants were few but of so warlike a disposition that they had added another obstacle to all those which nature had strewn with so prodigal a hand in the path of the invaders. Little by little, therefore, the enthusiasm had cooled, and the wonderful narratives of Balboa were mentioned only to be turned into ridicule. There lived, however, in Panama, a man well able to weigh the truth of the reports which had been circulated concerning the richness of the countries bathed by the Pacific, this man was Francisco Pizarro, who had accompanied Muñez de Balboa to the southern sea, and who now associated with himself two other adventurers, Diego de Almagro and Ferdinand de Luqui. A few words must be said about the chiefs of the enterprise. Francisco Pizarro, born near Truxillo between the years 1471 and 1478, was the natural son of a certain Captain Gonzalo Pizarro, who had taught the boy nothing but to take care of pigs. He was soon tired of this occupation, and took advantage of his having allowed one of the animals who were in his charge to stray, not to return to the paternal roof, where he was accustomed to be cruelly beaten for the smallest pecadillo. The young Pizarro enlisted, and after passing some years amidst the Italian wars, he followed Christopher Columbus to Hispaniola in 1510. He served there with distinction, and also in Cuba. Afterwards, he accompanied Jojeda de Darien, discovered, as has already mentioned, the Pacific with Balboa, and after the execution of the latter, he assisted Pedrarias da Vila, whose favorite he had become in the conquest of all the country known as Castile de Or. While Pizarro was an illegitimate child, Diego del Almagro was a fondling, picked up, according to some, in 1475 at Adila de Rey, but according to others at Almargo, from which circumstance, as they maintain, he derived his name. He was educated in the midst of soldiers, and while still young, went to America, where he had succeeded in amassing a small fortune. Ferdinand de Luque was a rich ecclesiastic of Tobago, who exercised the calling of a schoolmaster at Panama. The youngest of these adventurers was by this time more than fifty years of age, and Garciliaso de la Vega relates that upon their project being known, they became the objects of general derision. Ferdinand de Luque was the most laughed at, and was called by no other name than Hernando el Loco, Ferdinand the Fool. The terms of partnership were soon agreed upon between these three men, of whom two at least were without fear, if they were not all three without reproach. Luque furnished money needed for the armament of the vessels and the pay of the soldiers, and Almagro bore an equal part in the expense. But Pizarro, who possessed nothing but his sword, was to pay his contribution in another manner. It was he who took the command of the first attempt, upon which we shall dwell in some detail, because it was then that the perseverance and inflexible obstinacy of the conquistador 
first came fully into sight. One of the historians of the conquest of Peru, Agustin de Zarate, relates as follows. Having then asked and obtained the permission of Pedro Arias de Avila, Francisco Pizarro, after much trouble, equipped a vessel upon which he embarked with 140 men. At the distance of 150 miles from Panama, he discovered a small and poor province named Peru, which caused the same name to be henceforward improperly bestowed upon all that country which was discovered along that coast for the space of more than 3,600 miles in length. Passing onwards, he discovered another country, which the Spaniards called the Burnt People. The Indians slew so many of his men that he was constrained to retire in great disorder to the country of Chemchama, which is not far distant from the place whence he had started. Almagro, however, who had remained at Panama, fitted out a ship there, upon which he embarked with seventy Spaniards, and descended the coast as far as the river San Juan, three hundred miles from Panama. Not having met with Pizarro, he went back northwards, as far as the burnt people, where, having ascertained by certain indications that Pizarro had been there, he landed his men. But the Indians, puffed up by the victory which they had gained over Pizarro, resisted bravely, forced the entrenchments with which Almagro had covered his position, and obliged him to re-embark. He returned, therefore, still following the coastline, until he arrived at Chinchama, where he found Francisco Pizarro. They were much rejoiced at meeting again, and having added to their followers some fresh soldiers whom they had levied, they found their troops amounted to two hundred Spaniards, and once more they descended the coast. They suffered so much from scarcity of provisions and from the attacks of the Indians that Don Diego returned to Panama to collect more recruits and to obtain provisions. He took back with him eighty men, with whom and with those who remained to them they went as far as the country called Catamez, a country moderately peopled and where they found abundance of provisions. They noticed that the Indians of these parts who attacked them and made war against them had their faces studded with nails of gold inserted in holes which they had made expressly for receiving these ornaments. Diego del Amagro returned once again to Panama, whilst his companion waited for him, and for the reinforcements which he was to bring with him, in a small island called Cock Island where he suffered much from the scarcity of all the necessaries of life. Upon his arrival in Panama, Almargo could not obtain permission from Los Rios, the successor of Avila, to make new levies, for he had no right, Los Rios said, to allow a greater number of people to go and perish uselessly in the rash enterprise. He even sent a boat to Cock Island to bring away Pizarro and his companions. But such a decision could not be pleasing to Almagro and de Luque. It meant expense thrown away, and it meant the annihilation of the hopes which the sight of the ornaments of gold and silver of the inhabitants of Catamez had caused them to entertain. They sent, therefore, a trusty person to Pizarro to recommend him to persevere in his resolution and to refuse to obey the orders of the governor of Panama. But Pizarro, in vain, held out the most seductive promises. The remembrance of the fatigues which had been endured was too recent, and all his companions, except twelve, abandoned him. With these intrepid men, whose names have been preserved, and amongst whom was Garcia de Zares, one of the historians of the expedition, Pizarro retired to an uninhabited island, at a greater distance from the coast, to which he gave the name Gorgonia. There the Spaniards lived miserably on mangles, fish, and shellfish, and awaited for five months the succor that Almagro and Del Luque were to send them. At length, vanquished by the unanimous protestations of the whole colony, who were indignant that people whose only crime was that they had not despaired of success should be left to perish miserably, and as though they were malefactors, Los Rios 
sent to Bizarro a small vessel to bring him back, with the object of presenting no temptation to Pizarro to make use of this ship to renew his expedition, not a single soldier was placed on board of her. At the sight of the help which had arrived, and, oblivious to all their privations, the thirteen adventurers thought of nothing but persuading the sailors who came to seek them to participate in their own hopes, whereupon, instead of starting again on the route to Panama, they sailed all together, towards the southeast, in spite of contrary winds and currents, until, after having discovered the island of St. Clara, they arrived at the port of Tumbes, situated beyond the third degree of south latitude, where they saw a magnificent temple and a palace belonging to the Incas, the sovereigns of the country. The country was populous and fairly well cultivated, but what proved beyond all else seductive to the Spaniards, and made them think that they had reached the marvellous countries of which so much had been said, was the sight of so great an abundance of gold and silver, that these metals were employed not only as finery and ornament by the inhabitants, but also for making vases and common utensils. Pizarro caused the interior of the country to be explored by Pietro de Canida and Alonso de Molina, who brought back an enthusiastic description of it, and he caused some gold vases to be given to him, as well as some llamas, a quadruped domesticated by the Peruvians. He took two natives on board his vessel, to whom he proposed to teach the Spanish language, and to use them as interpreters when they should return to the country. He anchored successfully at Paita, Sagarata, and in the bay of Santa Cruz, of which the sovereign, Capillana, received the strangers with such friendly demonstrations that several of them were unwilling to re-embark. After having sailed down the coast as far as Porto Santo, Pizarro set out on his return to Panama, where he arrived after three whole years spent in dangerous explorations, which had completely ruined De Luque and Almagro. Pizarro resolved to apply to Charles V, before undertaking the conquest of the country which he had discovered, for he could not obtain leave from Los Rios to engage fresh adventures. So he borrowed the sum required for the voyage, and, in 1528, he went to Spain to inform the emperor of the work which he had undertaken. He painted the picture of the countries that were to be conquered in the most pleasing light, and as a reward for his labors, the titles of governor, captain-general, and alcazil major of Peru were bestowed upon him, and his heirs in perpetuity. At the same time he was ennobled, and a pension of one thousand crowns was bestowed upon him. His jurisdiction, independent of the governor of Panama, was to extend over a tract of six hundred miles along the coast of the south of the Santiago River, it was to be called New Castile, and he was to be the governor, concessions that cost nothing to Spain, for Pizarro had yet to conquer the country. On his side he undertook to raise a body of 250 men, and to provide himself with the necessary ships, arms, and ammunition. Pizarro then repaired to Truxillo, where he persuaded his three brothers, Ferdinand, Juan, and Gonzalo, to accompany him, as well as one of his half-brothers, Martin de Alcantara. He took advantage of his stay in his native town, and at Caraceras to try and raise recruits. Both there and throughout Estamadura, they did not, however, come forward in large numbers, in spite of the title Caballeros de la Espado Dorada, which he promised to bestow upon all who would serve under him. Then he returned to Panama, where affairs were not going so smoothly as he had hoped. He had succeeded in getting de Luque named Bishop Protector de los Indios, but for Almagro, whose talents he knew, and whose ambition he feared, he had only asked that he should be ennobled and a gratuity of five hundred ducats bestowed upon him, with the government of a fortress which was to be built at Tumbes. Almagro refused to take part in this new expedition, 
he was not pleased with the meagre portion given to him after spending all his money on earlier expeditions he wished now to organize one of his own account it required all pizarro's address aided by the promise to give up to almargo the office of andelantado to appease him and make him consent to renew the old partnership the resources of the three partners were so limited at this time that they could only get together three small ships and a hundred and twenty-four soldiers of whom thirty-six were horse soldiers the expedition set out in february fifteen thirty one under the command of pizarro and his four brothers while almagro remained at panama to organize an expedition of supplies at the end of thirteen days sailing and after having been carried by a storm three hundred miles more to the south than he had intended pizarro was forced to disembark both men and horses on the shores of the bay of san mateo and to follow the line of the coast on land this march was a difficult one in a very mountainous country thinly peopled and intersected by rivers which had to be crossed at their mouths at last a place called coauqui was reached where was found a great booty which decided pizarro to send back two of his ships they carried to panama and nicaragua spoils to the amount of thirty thousand castellanos as well as a great number of emeralds a rich booty which would according to pizarro determine many adventurers to come and join him then the conqueror continued his march southwards as far as porto viejo where he was joined by sebastian banalcazar and juan fernandez who brought him twelve horsemen and thirty foot soldiers the effect which had been produced in mexico by the sight of the horses and the reports of the firearms was repeated in peru and pizarro was able to reach the island of puna in the gulf of guayaquil without encountering any resistance but the islanders were more numerous and more warlike than their brothers of the mainland and for six months they valiantly resisted all the attacks of the spaniards although pizarro had received some aid from nicaragua brought by ferdinand de soto and although he had beheaded the cacique tonaya and sixteen of the principal chiefs he could not overcome their resistance he was therefore obliged to regain the continent where the maladies peculiar to the country tried his companion so cruelly that he was forced to stay three months as tumbez exposed to the perpetual attacks of the natives from tumbez he went next to rio puria discovered the harbor of paita the best on this coast and founded the colony of san miguel at the mouth of the chilo in order that vessels coming from panama might find safe shelter it was here that pizarro received some envoys from huascar and informed him of the revolt of atahualpa the brother of huascar and asked his aid at the period when the spaniards landed to conquer peru it extended along the shore of the pacific ocean for one thousand five hundred miles and stretched into the interior as far as the imposing chain of the andes originally the population was divided into savage and barbarous tribes having no idea of civilization and living in a perpetual state of warfare with one another for many centuries affairs had continued in the same state and there appeared no presage of the coming of a better era when on the shores of lake titicaca there appeared to the indians a man and woman who pretended that they were the children of the sun they called themselves Manco Capac and Mama Oyeyo, and were of majestic appearance, according to Garcilaso de la Vega. Towards the middle of the twelfth century, they united together a number of wandering tribes, and laid the foundations of the town of Cusco. Manco Capac had taught the men agriculture and mechanical arts, whilst Mama Oyeyo instructed the women in spinning and weaving. When Manco Capac had satisfied these first needs of all societies, he framed laws for his subjects and constituted a regular political state. It was thus that the dominion of the Incas, or lords of Peru, was established. At first their empire was limited to the neighborhood of Cusco, but under their successors it rapidly increased, 
and extended from the tropic of capricorn to the pearl islands a length of thirty degrees the power of the incas was as absolute as that of the ancient asiatic sovereigns also says sarate there was perhaps no other country in the world where the obedience and submission of the subjects was carried further the incas were to them quasi divinitives they had but to place a thread drawn from the royal head fillet in the hands of any one and the man so distinguished was certain to be everywhere respected and obeyed and to find such absolute deference paid to the king's order which he carried that he could alone exterminate a whole province without any assistance from soldiers and caused to be put to death all the inhabitants both male and female because at the mere sight of this thread taken from the royal crown the people voluntarily and without any assistance offered themselves up to die however the old chronicles all agreed in saying that this unlimited power was always used for the incas for the well-being of their subjects out of the series of twelve kings who in succession sat on the throne of peru there was not one who did not leave behind him the memory of a just prince adored by his subjects should we not search in vain through the annals of any other country in the world for facts analogous to these must it not be regretted that the spaniards should have brought war with all its attendant horrors and the maladies and vices of a different climate along with what they in their pride called civilization amongst a rich and happy people whose descendants impoverished and debased as they are have not even the recollection of their ancient prosperity to console them in their irremediable decay the peruvians says michelet in his admirable preces de historia moderne handed down the principal facts to prosperity by knots which they made in ropes they had obelisks and exact gromans to mark the equinoxes and solstices their year consisted of three hundred sixty five days they had erected progenies of agriculture and they st carved statues with amazing art they formed the most polished and industrious nation of the world the inca Hauna Capac, father of atahualpa under whom this vast empire was destroyed had done much to increase and embellish it this inca who conquered all the country of quito had made by the hands of his soldiers and of the vanquished people a great road fifteen hundred miles in length from cusco to quito across precipices which had to be filled up and mountains which had to be leveled relays of men stationed at intervals of a mile and a half from each other carried the emperor's orders throughout the empire such was their police and if we wish to judge a peruvian magnificence we need only instance the fact that the king when he travelled was carried on a throne of gold which weighed twenty-five thousand ducats and the gold litter upon which the throne rested was borne by the highest personages of the realm end of second part chapter one part two c recording by hear his dot com section twenty nine of celebrated travels and travelers volume one this is a liberal walk recording all liberal walk recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit liberal dot org recording by tech savvy celebrated travels and travelers volume one exploration of the world by jules verne second part chapter one part three b in fifteen twenty six when the spaniards appeared on the coast for the first time the twelfth inca had lately married in defiance of the ancient law of the kingdom the daughter of the vanquished king of quito and had had a son of this marriage named atahualpa to whom he left this kingdom on his death which had happened about fifteen twenty nine his eldest son huasca whose mother was descended from the incas had the remainder of his states but this partition so contrary to the customs established from time immemorial caused such great discontent at cusco 
that huasca encouraged by his subjects determined to march against his brother who would not acknowledge him for his lord and master atahualpa in his turn had too lately tasted power to be willing to abandon it he managed by bribes to attach to himself the greater part of the warriors who had accompanied his father during the conquest of quito and when the two armies met fortune favoured the usurper is it not curious to remark how both in peru and mexico the spaniards were aided by entirely exceptional circumstances in mexico some of the people who had recently submitted to the aztec race being mercilessly trampled upon by their conquerors welcomed the spaniards as deliverers in peru the strife between the two brothers furious against each other hinders the indians from turning all their forces against the invaders whom they might easily have crushed pizarro upon receiving the envoy sent by huasca to ask his aid against his brother atahualpa whom he represented as a rebel and a serper saw at once all the advantages that might accrue to him from these circumstances he saw that by espousing the cause of one of the brothers he could more easily crush them both therefore he advanced at once into the interior of the country at the head of a very inconsiderable force consisting of sixty-two cavalry and one hundred and twenty foot soldiers of whom only twenty were armed with arquebuses and muskets he was obliged to leave part of his troops to guard san miguel in which pizarro reckoned upon finding a refuge in case of being unsuccessful and where in any case all supplies which might arrive could be landed pizarro made first for caxamalca a small town situated at about twenty days march from the coast to reach it he had to cross a desert of burning sand without vegetation and without water which extended for sixty miles in length as far as the province of matupi and where the slightest attack of the enemy joined to the sufferings endured by the little army would have been sufficient to crush the whole expedition at one blow next the troops plunged into the mountains and became entangled in narrow defiles where a small force might have annihilated them during this march pizarro received an envoy from atahualpa bringing him some painted shoes and gold bracelets which he was requested to wear at his approaching interview with the inca naturally pizarro was lavish in his promises of friendship and devotion and assured that the indian ambassador that he should be only following the orders given him by the king his master in respecting the lives and the property of the inhabitants from the moment of this arrival at caxamalca pizarro prudently lodged his soldiers in a temple and palace belonging to the inca where they were sheltered from any surprise then he sent one of his brothers with de soto and twenty horse soldiers to the camp of atahualpa which was distant only three miles to announce to him his arrival the envoys of the governor were received with magnificence and were astonished at the multiplicity of the ornaments and vases made of gold and silver which they saw throughout the indian camp they returned bringing a promise from atahualpa that he would come on the next day to visit pizarro to bid him welcome to his kingdom at the same time the envoys gave an account of the wonderful riches they had seen which confirmed pizarro in the project which he had formed of seizing the unfortunate atahualpa and his treasures by treachery several spanish authors and notably zerate disguised these facts which no doubt appeared to them too odious and altogether deny the treachery towards atahualpa but at the present day there are extant many documents which force the historians to believe with robertson and prescott in the perfidy of pizarro it was very important for him to have the inca in his own hands and to employ him as a tool just as cordes had done with montezuma he therefore took advantage of the honesty and simplicity of atahualpa who placed entire confidence in pizarro's protestations of friendship and so was thrown off his guard to arrange an ambuscade into which atahualpa was certain to fall there was not a scruple in the disloyal soul of the conqueror he was as cool as though he were about to offer battle to enemies who had been the forewarned of his approach this infamous treason must be an eternal dishonour to his memory 
Pizarro divided his cavalry into three small squadrons, left all his infantry in one body and his arquebusiers on the road in which the Inca must pass, and kept twenty of his most determined companions near himself. Atahualpa, wishing to give the Spaniards a great idea of his power, advanced the whole of his army. He himself was borne upon a kind of bed, decorated with feathers, covered with plates of gold and silver, and ornamented with precious stones. He was accompanied by his principal nobles, carried like himself on the shoulders of their servants, and he was surrounded by dancers and jesters. Such a march was more that of a procession than of an army. As soon as the Inca had nearly reached the Spanish quarters, Father Vincent Valverde, the chaplain of the expedition, who was afterwards made a bishop as a reward for his conduct, advanced with the crucifix in one hand and his breviary in the other. In an indeterminable discourse he set forth to the monarch the doctrine of the creation, the fall of the first man, the incarnation, passion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the choice made by God of St. Peter to be his vicar upon earth, the power transmitted through him to the popes, and the gift made by Pope Alexander to the king of Castile, of all regions of the new world. When he had expounded all these doctrines, he called upon Atahualpa to embrace the Christian religion, to recognize the supreme authority of the Pope, and to submit to the King of Castile as his legitimate sovereign. If he submitted immediately, Valverde undertook to promise that the King his master would take Peru under his protection, and allow him to continue to reign there. But he declared war against him and threatened him with fearful vengeance if he refused to obey and persevered in his impiety. To say the least of it, this was a singular scene and a very strange harangue. Alluding to facts which were utterly unknown to the Peruvians and of the truth of which a more skilful orator than Valverde would not have succeeded in persuading them, if we add that the interpreter knew so little of the Spanish language that it was almost an impossibility for him to translate what he scarcely understood himself, and that the Peruvian language lacked words to express ideas so foreign to its genius, we shall not be much surprised to learn that Atahualpa understood almost nothing of the Spanish monk's discourse some sentences however which attacked his own power filled him with surprise and indignation but he was none the less moderate in his reply he said that a master of his own kingdom by right of succession he could not see how any one had the power to dispose of it without his consent he added that he was not at all willing to renounce the religion of his fathers to adopt one of which he had only heard that day for the first time with regard to the other points touched upon in the discourse he understood nothing it was a thing entirely new to him and he would much like to know where valverde had learned so many wonderful things in this book replied valverde handing him his breviary atahualpa received it with eagerness and turned over some of the leaves with much more curiosity then putting it to his ear he exclaimed what you show me there does not speak to me and tells me nothing with this he flung the book upon the ground this served as a signal for the combat or rather for the massacre cannon and muskets came into play the cavalry sprang forward and the infantry fell sword in hand upon the stupefied peruvians in a few moments the confusion was at its height the indians fled on all sides without attempting to defend themselves as to atahualpa although his principal officers tried to make a rampart of their own bodies while they carried him off pizarro sprang upon him dispersed or overthrew his guards and seizing him by his long hair threw him down from the litter in which he was carried only the darkness could arrest the carnage four thousand indians were killed a great number wounded and three thousand taken prisoners an incontestable proof that there was no real battle is that of all the spaniards pizarro alone was hit and he received his wound from one of his own soldiers who was too precipitately endeavouring to seize upon the inca the booty collected in the camp and from the dead exceeded anything the spaniards could have imagined and their enthusiasm was proportioned to the conquest of such riches at first atahualpa bore his captivity with resignation which may have been partly due to Pizarro's doing all he could see to soothe them, at least by words. 
but the Inca, soon understanding the unbridled covetousness of his jailers, made a proposal to Pizarro to pay him ransom, and to have a room of twenty-two feet in length by sixteen in width filled as high as the hand could reach with vases, utensils, and ornaments of gold. Pizarro eagerly agreed to this, and the captive Inca dispatched the necessary orders to once to all the provinces. These were carried out promptly and unmurmuringly. Beyond this, the Indian troops were disbanded, and Pizarro was able to send Soto and five Spaniards to Cusco, a town situated more than six hundred miles from Caxamalca, while he himself subjugated all the country within a circuit of three hundred miles. In the meantime, Almagro landed with two hundred soldiers. There had been set aside for him and his men, with what regrets may easily be imagined, hundred thousand pesos, a Spanish coin. A fifth was reserved for the king, and this left one million five hundred and twenty-eight five hundred pesos to be divided between the Pizarro and his companions. This product of pillage and massacre was solemnly divided between those entitled to it on the festival of St. James, the patron saint of Spain, after fervent prayer to God. A deplorable mixture of this of religion and profanity, too common, unfortunately, in these times of mingled superstition and avarice. Each horse soldier received eight thousand pesos as a share, and each foot soldier four thousand, which would be equivalent to about sixteen hundred and eight hundred sterling. This was enough to satisfy the most exacting soldier after a campaign which had been neither long nor difficult. Many of the adventurers wished to enjoy this unexpected good fortune in a peaceable manner in their own country, and eagerly asked for their dismissal. The Pizarro granted without hesitation, for he felt sure that the news of their rapidly acquired wealth would soon bring him new recruits. With his brother, Ferdinand, who went to Spain to give the emperor an account of Pizarro's triumph and some splendid presents, went sixty Spaniards, laden heavy indeed with money, but lightly with remorse. As soon as Atahualpa's ransom was paid, he claimed his freedom, but Pizarro, who had only saved his life, that he might make all the treasures of Peru his own and shelter himself under the prestige and authority which the Inca still exercised over his subjects, was soon varied by his entreaties. He suspected him also of having for some time secretly given orders to levy troops in the distant provinces of the empire besides atahualpa having soon discovered that pizarro was no better educated than one of the lowest of his soldiers felt in consequence a contempt for the governor which unfortunately he could not conceal such were the reasons all trivial as they were which determined pizarro to prepare for the trial of the inca nothing could have been more hateful than his trial in which almagro and pizarro were at the same time both suitors and judges the heads and the accusation were so ridiculous and absurd that one is in doubt whether to be most surprised by the effrontery of the wickedness of Pizarro in subjecting the head of a powerful empire over which he had no jurisdiction to such an inquiry. Atahualpa, being found guilty, was condemned to be burnt alive, but as he had at length asked to be baptized, that he might rid himself of the importunities of Valverde his enemies content himself with strangling him a worthy counterpart this of guatemozin's execution these were amongst the most atrocious and odious deeds committed by the spaniards in america which however they were sullied themselves with every imaginable crime among this herd of adventurers there were still some men who had retained sentiments of honor and self-respect they protested loudly against this perversion of justice, but their generous mispleadings were stifled by the selfish declamations of Pizarro and his worthy assistants. The governor now raised one of Atahualpa's son to the throne under the name of Paul Inca, but the civil war between the two brothers and the events which had occurred since the arrival of the Spaniards had done much to loosen the ties which bound the Peruvians to their kings, and this young man, destined soon to die in an egg nominis death had scarcely more authority than monco Quipac, the son of huasca who was acknowledged by the inhabitants of cusco soon after this some of the principal people in the country even tried to carve for themselves kingdoms out of the empire of peru such was Riminegi, 
the commandant of Quito, who caused the brother and the children of Athawalpa to be massacred, and declared himself independent. Discord reigned in the Peruvian camp, and the Spaniards resolved to take advantage of it. Pizarro advanced rapidly upon Cusco. The small number of his forces having been the only reason which had prevented him from doing so sooner. Now that a crowd of adventurers attracted by the treasures which had been brought back to Panama, wide with each other in hasting to Peru, now that he could assemble five hundred men. After leaving an important garrison at St. Miguel under Benal Cazar's command, Pizarro had no further reason for delay. On the way some skirmishes took place with large bodies of troops, but they ended as always with severe losses to natives, and a very insignificant one to the Spaniards. When they entered Cusco and took possession of the town, the invaders showed surprise at the small quantity of gold and precious stones which they found there, although it far exceeded Athawalpa's ransom. Was this because they were becoming accustomed to the riches of the country, or because there was a larger number to share in them? Meanwhile, Benal Cazar, being weary of inaction, took advantage of the arrival of a reinforcements from Nicaragua and Panama to set out for Quito, where, according to the Peruvians, Athawalpa had left the greater part of his treasure. He placed himself at the head of eighty horse soldiers and hundred and twenty infantry, defeated on several occasions. Ruminagi, who disputed his passage, and thanks to his prudence and cleverness, he entered Quito victorious, but did not find there what he sought, this is to say, the treasures of Athawalpa. At the same time, Peter de Alvado, who had so signally distinguished himself under Cortes, and who had been made governor of Guatemala, as a reward for his services, pretended to believe the provinces of Quito was not included in Pizarro's command, and organized an expedition consisting of five hundred men, two hundred of whom were cavalry. Landing at Porto Vigio, he wished to reach Quito without a guide by going up the Guaquil River and crossing the Andes. This road has always been one of the worst and the most trying that it is possible to choose. Before they had reached the plain of Quito, after horrible sufferings from hunger and thirst, without speaking of the burning cinders hurled from the crater of Chimborazo, a volcano near Quito, and the snowstorms which assailed them, the fifth part of the band of adventurers and half the horses had perished. The remainder were completely discouraged and quite unfit for fighting. It was therefore with the greatest surprise and some uneasiness that they found themselves face to face, not with a body of Indians as they had expected, but with a party of Spaniards under the command of Almagro. The latter were preparing to charge when some of the more moderate among the officers caused an arrangement to be entered into by virtue of which Alvarado was to withdraw to his own province after receiving hundred thousand pesos to defray the expenses of the armament. Ferdinand Pizarro had set sail for Spain while these events were happening in Peru, feeling sure that the immense quantity of gold, silver, and precious stones which he took with him would secure him a warm welcome. He obtained for his brother Francisco the confirmation of his appointment as governor. With more extended powers, he himself was made a knight of the order of St. Iago. As for Almagro, he was confirmed in his title of Adelantado, and his jurisdiction was extended six hundred miles without, however, its limits being very strictly refined, which left the door open for many contests and all kinds of arbitrary interpretations. Ferdinand Pizarro had not reached Peru again when Almagro, having learned that a special government had been assigned to him, pretended at Cusco formed part of it, and made preparations for its conquest. But Juan and Gonzalo Pizarro had no intention of allowing themselves to be robbed, and the parties were on the point of becoming to blows when Francisco Pizarro, who is often called Marquis or the Great Marquis, arrived at the capital. Almagro had never forgiven Francisco Pizarro the duplicity which he had displayed in his negotiation with Charles V, nor the coolness with which he had claimed for himself at the expense of his two friends, the principal share of authority and the most extended government. But as Almagro met with great oppositions to his designs, and as he was not the stronger, he concealed his vexation, put a good face on the matter, and seemed delighted at reconciliation. They renewed their partnership, therefore, says Zaret, 
on condition that don diego de almagro should go and discover the country on the south side and if he found it any that was really good they should ask his majesty to make the governor of it but that if he found nothing to suit him they should share don francisco's government between them this arrangement was made very solemnly and they took their oath upon the consecrated wafer and for the future they would undertake nothing against one another some say that almagro swore that he would never encroach either upon cusco or on the surrounding country within three hundred and ninety miles even if his majesty should give him the government of it they add that turning to it the holy sacrament he pronounced these words lord if i violate the oath that i now take i pray that thou wilt confound me and punish me both in my body and my soul after this solemn agreement which was destined to be observed with a little fidelity at the first almagro made his preparations for departure thanks to his well-known liberality as much as to his reputation for courage he gathered together five hundred and seventy men of being equal numbers of cavalry and infantry which he set out by land for chile the journey was an extremely trying one and the adventurers suffered severely from the intense cold while crossing the andes they had also to deal with the very warlike tribes unsoftened by any civilization who assailed them with a fury of which nothing they had seen in peru had given them any idea almagro could no longer make any settlement for he had scarcely been two months in the country where he heard that the indians in peru had revolted and massacred the greater part of the spaniards whereupon he immediately retraced his steps after the new partnerships had been assigned between the conquerors pizarro had returned to the provinces bordering on the sea in which he could establish a regular government there being no longer anything to dread from resistance for a man who had never studied legislation he had drawn up some very wise rules for administration of justice for the collection of taxes the apportionment of indians and the working of the mines some parts of the conquistadors character were doubtless very open to criticism but it is only just to recognize that he was not wanting in enlarged ideas but he was conscientious in playing his part as the founder of the great empire this it was which made him hesitate long before choosing the future capital of spanish possessions cusco had did the recommendation of having been the residence of the incas but this town situated more than four hundred miles from the sea was very distant from quito of which the importance seemed to pizarro to be extreme before long he was struck with the beauty and fertility of the great valley watered by a stream called the rimac there in fifteen thirty six he established the seat of his dominion soon the city of kings or lima as it is called by a corruption of this name of the river which flows at its feet assumed the aspect of a great city owing to the magnificent palace and the sumptuousness residence for officers which pizarro caused to be built there while these cares kept pizarro far from his capital small bodies of troops sent in different directions penetrated into the most distant provinces of the empire with the object of extinguishing the last smouldering embers of resistance so many of the soldiers were employed in this way that there remain in cusco itself but a very small body of troops the inca who had remained in the hands of the spaniards thought this an opportune moment for fomenting a general rising in which he earnestly hoped that the foreign government might be overthrown although closely guarded he contrived to take his measures with so much skill that he did not arouse the suspicions of his oppressors he obtained permission even to be present at a grand fete which was to be held at several miles distance from cusco and for which the most distinguished persons in the empire had met together as soon as the inca appeared the standard of the revolt was raised the country was soon in arms from the confines of the province of quito as far as chile and a number of small detachments of spaniards were surprised and destroyed cusco defended by the three brothers pizarro but about one hundred and seventy spaniards were exposed for eight consecutive months to the incessant attacks of the peruvians who had now become an expert in the use of arms which they had taken from their enemies the conquerors made a most valiant resistance but experienced some severe losses especially that of juan pizarro 
Almagro left Chile in the greatest haste, crossed the stony and the sandy desert of Atacama, where he suffered as severely from heat and drought as he had done in the Andes from cold and snow, penetrated into the Peruvian territory, defeated Manco Capac in a great battle, and succeeded in approaching the town of Cusco, after having driven away the Indians. He then tried to get the town given up to him, on the pretext that it was not included in Pizarro's government, and violating a truce, during which the followers of the Marquis were taking a short rest, he entered Cusco, seized both Ferdinand and Gonzalo Pizarro, and had acknowledged himself as a governor. End of second part, chapter 3, part 1a Recording by TechSavvy, www.techsavvy.wordpress.com Section 30 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 3C. While this was going on, a considerable body of Indians invested Lima, intercepted all communications, and annihilated the various small bodies of troops which Pizarro sent at intervals to the aid of the Spaniards at Cusco. At this time he sent away all his vessels to Panama to compel his companions to make a desperate resistance. He recalled from Truxillo the forces under the command of Alonso de Alvarado, and entrusted to the latter a column of five hundred men, which advanced to within several miles of the capital, without having the slightest suspicion that the town was now in the hands of fellow countrymen, who were fully determined to bar their passage. But Almagro desired much rather to attract these new adversaries to himself than to destroy them. He arranged, therefore, to surprise them and make them prisoners. He had now a fine opportunity in his hands of ending the war, and making himself master of the two governments by a single blow. Several of his officers had observed this to him, and especially Orgonios, who proposed that the two brothers of the conquistador should be put to death, and that Almagro should advance by forced marches with his victorious troops against Lima, or Pizarro, taken by surprise, would not be able to resist him. But as a Latin poet says, Jupiter makes dotards of those whom he means to ruin. Almagro, who in so many other instances had thrown aside all scruples, did not wish to put himself in the wrong by invading Pizarro's dominions as a rebel, and he quietly took the road back to Cusco. Looking at it only from the side of Almagro's own interests, he evidently committed in this a gross blunder, of which he was soon to repent. But if we consider what we should never lose sight of, the interest of the country, he had already committed a capital crime in the acts of aggression of which he had been guilty, and in kindling civil war in face of an enemy quite ready to take advantage of it. His adversaries did not delay to remind him of it, whereas prompt decision would have been necessary for Almagro to make him master of the situation, Pizarro had everything to expect from time and opportunity. While waiting for the promised reinforcements from Darien, he commenced negotiations with his adversary, lasting for several months, during which time one of his brothers, as well as Alvarado, found means to escape with more than seventy men. Although Almagro had been so often duped, he consented again to receive the licentiate Espinosa, who was ordered to represent to him that if the emperor knew what was taking place between the two competitors and learned the condition to which their contest had reduced affairs no doubt he would recall them both and put someone else in their place at last after the death of espinosa it was decided by the friar francisco de bovadilla to whom pizarro and almagro had referred their differences that ferdinand pizarro should be immediately set free that cusco should be given back to the marquis and that they should send several officers on both sides to Spain, charged with representing the respective rights of the two parties and submitting them to the emperor's decision. 
scarcely had the last of his brothers been set at liberty than pizarro rejecting all idea of peace and amicable arrangement declared that arms alone should decide whether he or almagro was to be lord of peru in a short time he had assembled a body of seven hundred men of which he entrusted the command to his two brothers finding it impossible to cross the mountains which would have been the most direct road to cusco they followed the line of the sea-coast as far as nazca and then penetrated into a branch of the andes by which they could reach a capital in a short time possibly almagro ought to have defended the mountain defiles but he had only five hundred men and he reckoned much on his splendid cavalry whom he could not deploy in a confined space he therefore waited for the enemy in the plain of cusco the two parties encountered each other on the twenty sixth of april fifteen thirty eight with equal animosity but the victory was decided by two companies of musketeers which the emperor had sent to pizarro when he heard of the revolt of the indians one hundred and forty soldiers perished in this engagement which received the name of las salinas Orgonios and several officers of distinction were killed in cold blood after the battle and almagro himself aged and ill could not escape from pizarro the indians who assembled in arms on the surrounding mountains had reckoned upon falling on the conqueror had need instead to fly in all haste nothing says robertson more entirely proves the ascendancy gained by the spaniards over the americans than seeing that the latter witnesses of the defeat and dispersion of one of the parties had not the courage to attack the other even weakened and fatigued as they were by their victory and dared not fall upon their oppressors when fortune offered them so favourable an opportunity for attacking them with advantage at this period a victory not followed by pillage was incomplete so the town of cusco was sacked and all the riches that pizarro's companions found there did not suffice to content them they had such exalted ideas of their merits and of the services which they had rendered that each would have desired an appointment as governor ferdinand pizarro therefore dispersed them and sent them to conquer fresh territories with some of the partisans of almagro who had rallied and whom it was important to send to a distance. As for Almagro himself, Ferdinand Pizarro, feeling convinced that his name constituted a focus of permanent agitation, resolved to get rid of him. He caused him, therefore, to be put upon his trial, which ended, as it was easy to foresee, in a sentence of death. When Almagro received this news, after giving way for a few moments of a very natural grief pleading his great age and the different way in which he had behaved with regard to ferdinand and gonzalo pizarro when they were his prisoners he recovered his calmness and awaited his death with a soldier's courage he was strangled in his prison and afterwards publicly beheaded fifteen thirty eight after several successful expeditions ferdinand pizarro set out for spain to give the emperor an account of what had taken place he found most minds there strangely prejudiced against him and his brothers their cruelty their violence and their disregard for the most sacred engagements had been laid bare without reserve by some friends of almagros ferdinand pizarro needed the utmost cleverness to win the emperor round Charles V had no means of judging fairly on which side the justice of the case lay, for he had only heard of it from the interested parties. He could only discern the deplorable consequences to his own government of the civil war. He decided, therefore, to send a commissioner to the country, to whom he gave most extensive powers, and who, after having inquired into all that had taken place, should establish whatever form of government he thought most advisable. This delicate mission was confided to Cristobal de Vaca, a judge of audience at Valladolid. He proved not unequal to his task. One fact is worthy of notice. He was recommended to show the greatest respect toward Francisco Pizarro, at the very time when his brother Ferdinand was arrested and thrown into a prison, where he was destined to remain forgotten for twenty years. While these events were taking place in Spain, the Marquis portioned out the conquered country, keeping for himself and his trustworthy friends the most fertile and best situated districts, and giving to Almagro's companions, the men of Chile, as they were called, only the more sterile and distant territories. Next he confided to Pedro de Valdivia, one of his aides de camp, the execution 
of the project which Almagro had only been able to sketch out, the conquest of Chile. Valdivia set out on the 28th of January, 1540, with 150 Spaniards, amongst whom Pedro Gómez, Pedro de Miranda, and Alonso de Monroy were destined especially to distinguish themselves. He crossed first the desert of Atacama, which even at the present day is considered a most troublesome enterprise, and reached Copiapo, standing in the midst of a beautiful valley. Received at first with great cordiality, he had to sustain, as soon as harvest was over, several combats with the Araucanians, a race of brave, indefatigable warriors, very different from the Indians of Peru. In spite of this, he laid the foundations of the town of Santiago on the 12th of February, 1541. Valdivia spent eight years in Chile, presiding over the conquest and organization of the country. Less greedy than the other conquistadores his contemporaries, he only sought for the mineral riches of the country that he might ensure the development of the prosperity of his colony, in which he had taken care, first of all, to encourage agriculture. The best mine that I know of is one of corn and wine with nourishment for livestock. Who has this has money. As for mines, we do not depend upon them for subsistence, and often that which looks well outwardly is not really worth much. These wise words of Lescarbot in his Histoire de la Nouvelle France might have been used by Valdivia, so exactly do they correspond with and express his sentiments. His valour, prudence, and humanity, more especially the latter quality, which shines forth strangely in contrast with the cruelty of Pizarro, ensures for him a distinction, all of his own, among the conquistadores of the sixteenth century. At the time that Valdivia set out for Chile, Gonzalo Pizarro crossed the Andes at the head of three hundred and forty Spaniards, half of whom were mounted, and four thousand Indians, of whom the greater part of the Indians perished from cold. Then he penetrated eastwards into the interior, seeking for a country where spices and cinnamon were said to abound. In these vast savannas, intersected by marshes and virgin forests, the Spaniards encountered torrents of rain, which lasted quite two months. They found only a scattered population who were not industrious and also hostile. In consequence, the invaders often suffered from hunger in a country where there were then neither horses nor oxen, where the largest quadrupeds were tapirs and llamas and even the latter was seldom met with on this slope of the Andes. In spite of these difficulties, which would have discouraged any less energetic explorers than the descubridores of the sixteenth century, they persevered in their attempt and descended the Rio Napo or Coca, an affluent on the left of the Marañón, as far as its confluence. There, with great difficulty, they built a brigantine, which was manned by fifty soldiers under the command of Francisco Orellana. But either the strength of the current carried him away, or else being no longer under the eyes of his chief, he wished in his turn to be the leader of an expedition of discovery, he did not wait for Gonzalo Pizarro at the appointed rendezvous, but continued to descend the river until he reached the ocean. Such a voyage is simply marvellous. Through nearly six thousand miles of an unknown region, without guide, without compass, without provisions, with a crew who murmured more than once against the foolish attempt of their leader, and in the midst of populations almost invariably hostile. From the mouth of the river, which he had just descended in his badly built and dilapidated vessel, Orellana succeeded in reaching the island of Cubagua, whence he set sail for Spain. If the proverb he who comes from a distance tells many lies, were not of much earlier date, one might have thought it had been coined for Orellana. He invented the most preposterous fables as to the wealth of the countries he had traversed. The inhabitants were so rich that the roofs of the temples were formed with plates of gold, an assertion which gave rise to the legend of El Dorado. Orellana had heard of the existence of a republic of female warriors who had founded a vast empire, which caused the river Marañón to be called the River of the Amazons. If, however, we strip this narrative of all that is ridiculous and grotesque, and calculated to please the imaginations of his contemporaries, it remains certain that Orellana's expedition is one of the most remarkable of this epoch, so fertile in gigantic enterprises, 
and it furnishes the first information upon the immense zone of country lying between the Andes and the Atlantic. But we must return to Gonzalo Pizarro. His embarrassment and consternation had been great when, on arriving at the confluence of the Napo and the Marañón, he had not found Orellana, who was to have been awaiting him. Fearing that some accident might have befallen his lieutenant, he had descended the course of the river for a hundred and fifty miles, until he met with an unfortunate officer who had been left behind for having addressed some remonstrances to his chief upon his perfidy. The bravest among Pizarro's men were discouraged at the news of the cowardly way in which they had been abandoned, and at the destitute condition in which they were left. Pizarro was obliged to yield to their entreaties, and to return to Quito, from which they were more than 1,200 miles away. To give an idea of their sufferings on this return journey, it suffices to say that after having eaten horses, dogs, and reptiles, roots and wild beasts, and after having devoured every article made of leather in their accoutrements, the unfortunate survivors who reached Quito, lacerated by brambles, emaciated and utterly impoverished, numbered only twenty-four. Four thousand Indians and two hundred and ten Spaniards had perished in this expedition, which had lasted less than two years. While Gonzalo Pizarro was conducting the fortunate expedition just related, the old partisans of Almagro, who had never frankly joined Pizarro, gathered round the son of their old leader, and formed a plot for murdering the Marquis. In vain was Francisco Pizarro several times warned of what was threatening him. He would pay no heed to the report. He said, Keep quiet, I shall be safe as long as there is no one in Peru who does not know that I can in a moment take the life of any one who should dare to form the project of attempting mine. On Sunday the 26th of June, 1541, at the hour of siesta, Juan de Herrada and eighteen conspirators left the house of Almagro's son with drawn swords in their hands and armed from top to toe. They ran towards the house of Pizarro, crying out, Death to the tyrant! death to the infamous wretch they entered the palace killed francisco de chavez who had appeared in haste on hearing the noise and gained the hall where was francisco pizarro with his brother francisco martin the doctor juan velasquez and a dozen servants these jumped out of the windows with the exception of martin pizarro two other gentlemen and two tall pages who were killed while defending the door of the governor's apartment he himself had not had time to put on his cuirass, but he seized his sword and buckler and defended himself valiantly, killing four of his adversaries and wounding several others. One of his assailants, in the spirit of self-devotion, attracted to himself the blows of Pizarro. Meanwhile the other conspirators made their way in and attacked him, with such fury that he could not parry all the blows, being so exhausted that he could scarcely wield his sword. Thus says Zarata, they made an end and succeeded in killing him by a thrust in the throat. Falling to the ground, he asked in a loud voice that he might be allowed to confess, and then not being able any longer to speak, he made the sign of the cross on the ground, which he kissed, and then yielded up his soul to God. Some negroes carried his body to the church, where Juan Barbazan, his old servant, alone ventured to come and claim it. This faithful servant secretly rendered to it funeral honors, for the conspirators had pillaged the house of Pizarro, not leaving enough even to pay for wax tapers. Thus did Francisco Pizarro come to his end, assassinated even in the capital of the vast empire which Spain owed to his valor and indefatigable perseverance, but which he bestowed upon his country, it must be admitted, ravaged, decimated, and drowned in a deluge of blood. Pizarro is often compared with Cortés, the one had as much ambition, courage, and military capacity as the other, but the cruelty and avarice of the Marquis de la Valle were carried to an extreme in Pizarro, and united in him to perfidy and duplicity. If we are inclined to excuse certain parts of Cortés's character which are not estimable by the times in which he lived, we are at least charmed by that grace and ability of manners, and by that way of a gentleman above prejudices, which made him so much beloved by the soldier. In Pizarro, on the contrary, we find roughness, and a harsh and sympathizing way of feeling, 
while his chivalrous qualities disappear entirely behind the rapacity and perfidy which are the salient features of his character if cortes found brave and resolute adversaries among the mexicans who opposed almost insurmountable difficulties to his progress pizarro had no trouble in vanquishing the peruvians who were timid and enervated and who never made any serious resistance to his arms of the conquests of peru and mexico the less difficult produced the greater metallurgic advantage to spain and thus it was more appreciated the civil war was on the point of breaking out again after pizarro's death when the governor arrived who was delegated by the metropolitan government as soon as he had collected the needful troops he marched towards cusco he seized young almagro without trouble had him beheaded with forty of his confederates and governed the country with firmness until the viceroy blasco nunez vela arrived it is not our intention to enter into the detail of the disputes which took place between the latter and gonzalo pizarro who profiting by the general discontent caused by the new regulations as to the repartimientos revolted against the emperor's representative after many changes of fortune for which we have not space the struggle ended by the defeat and execution of gonzalo pizarro which took place in fifteen forty eight his body was taken to cusco and buried fully dressed no one said garcilaso de la vega being willing to give even a winding sheet for it thus ended the judicial assassin of almagro is not the text appropriate in this case they that take the sword shall perish with the sword end of second part chapter one part three c Section 31 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2013. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World, by Jules Verne second part chapter two part one the first voyage round the world no one as yet was aware of the immense size of the continent discovered by christopher columbus still was sought perseveringly on the coast of america which was thought to be a collection of several islands the famous strait which should lead at once to the pacific ocean and to those spice islands the possession of which would have made the fortune of spain while corte real and cabot were seeking for it in the atlantic ocean and cortez in the furthest part of the gulf of california while pizarro was coasting along peru and valdivia was conquering chile the solution of this problem was found by a portuguese in the service of spain Ferdinand de Magellan. The son of a gentleman of Cota e Armas, Ferdinand de Magellan was born either at Oporto, at Lisbon, at Villa de Sabrosa, or at Villa de Figuero. It is not actually known which. The date of his birth is unknown, but it took place towards the end of the fifteenth century. He had been brought up in the house of King John the Second, where he received as complete an education as could then be given him. After having made mathematics and navigation his special study, for at this time in Portugal there was an irresistible current which drew the whole country towards maritime expeditions and discoveries, Magellan early embraced a maritime career and embarked in 1505 with Almeida, who was on his way to the Indies he took part in the sacking of Kiloa and in all the events of that campaign. The following year he accompanied Vas Pereira to Sofala. Then, on returning to the Malaba coast, we find him assisting Albuquerque at the taking of Malacca, and bearing himself on that occasion with equal prudence and bravery. He took part in the expedition sent by Albuquerque about 1510 to seek for the famous Spice Islands under the command of Antonio de Abreu and of Francisco Serrao, which discovered Banda, Amboina, Ternate and Tidor. During this time Magellan had landed at the Malaysian Islands, distant 1,800 miles from Malacca, 
and in the archipelago of the moluccas he had obtained the circumstantial information which gave birth in his mind to the idea of the voyage which he was destined to accomplish later on on his return to portugal magellan obtained leave though not without difficulty to search through the royal archives he soon became certain that the moluccas were situated in the hemisphere which the bull of demarcation adopted at tordesillas by the kings of spain and portugal and conformed in fourteen ninety five by pope alexander the sixth had given to spain in virtue of this line of demarcation which was destined to give rise to so many impassioned debates all the countries situated at three hundred sixty miles west of the meridian of the cape de verde islands were to belong to spain and all those lying to the east of the same meridian to portugal magellan was of too active a nature to remain long without again taking service he went next to fight in africa at azamor a town in morocco where he received a slight wound in his knee but one which by injuring a nerve made him lame for the remainder of his life and obliged him to return to portugal conscious of the superiority which his theoretical and practical knowledge and his services had earned for him above the herd of courtiers magellan naturally felt more keenly than another would have done the unjust treatment he received from emmanuel with regard to certain complaints laid by the people of azamor against the portuguese officers king emmanuel's prejudices soon changed to a real dislike it showed itself by the outrageous imputation that magellan was pretending to suffer from a wound which was really of no consequence and was completely cured that he might escape from accusations which he could not refute such an assertion was a serious matter for the honour of magellan so susceptible and suspicious he thereupon came to a desperate determination which corresponded moreover with the greatness of the insult which he had received that no one might be ignorant of it he caused it to be legally set forth that he renounced his rights as a portuguese citizen and changed his nationality and he then took out letters of naturalization in spain this was to proclaim as solemnly as could possibly be done that he intended to be looked upon as a subject of the crown of castile to which henceforward he would consecrate his services and his whole life this was a serious determination as we can see which no one blamed and which even the most severe historians such as barros and faria y Souza, have excused at the same time as magellan the licentiate ere falero left lisbon with his brother francisco and a merchant named cristovam de haro the former was a man deeply versed in cosmographical knowledge and had equally with magellan fallen under emmanuel's displeasure falero had entered into a treaty of partnership with magellan to reach the moluccas by a new way but one which was not otherwise specified and which remained magellan's secret as soon as they arrived in spain fifteen seventeen the two partners submitted their project to charles v who accepted it in principle but there remained the always delicate question touching the means for putting it into execution happily magellan found in juan de aranda the factor of the chamber of commerce an enthusiastic partisan of his theories and one who promised to exert all his influence to make the enterprise a success he had an interview accordingly with the high chancellor the cardinal and bishop of burgos fonseca he set forth with such skill the great advantage that spain would derive from the discovery of a route leading to the very centre of the spice production and the great prejudice which it would cause to the trade of portugal that an agreement was signed on the twenty second of march fifteen eighteen the emperor undertook to pay all the expenses of the expedition on condition that the greater part of the profits should belong to him but magellan had still many obstacles to surmount before taking to the sea in the first place there were the remonstrances of the portuguese ambassador alvaro de costa who seeing that his endeavours were in vain even tried to compass the assassination of magellan so says faria y Souza. 
then he encountered the ill will of the employees of the casa de contratacion at seville who were jealous of a stranger being entrusted with the command of such an important expedition and envious of the last token of favour which had been accorded to magellan and rey falero who had been named commanders of the order of st james but charles v had given his consent by a public act which seemed to be irrevocable they tried however to make the emperor alter his decision by organizing on the twenty second of october fifteen eighteen a disturbance paid for with portuguese gold it broke out on the pretext that magellan who had just had one of his ships drawn on shore for repairs and painting had decorated it with the portuguese arms this last attempt failed miserably and three statutes of the thirtieth of march and sixth and thirtieth of april fixed the composition of the crews and named the staff while a final official document dated from barcelona the twenty sixth of july fifteen nineteen confided the sole command of the expedition to magellan what had meanwhile been happening to rey falero we cannot exactly say but this man who had up to this time been treated on the same footing as magellan and who had perhaps first conceived the project now found himself quite excluded from the command of the expedition after some dissensions of which the cause is unknown his health already shaken received a last shock from this affront and poor rey falero who had become almost childish having returned to portugal to see his family was arrested there and only released upon the intercession of charles v at last after having sworn fidelity and homage to the crown of castille magellan received in his turn the oath of his officers and sailors and left the port of san lucar de barameda on the morning of the tenth of august fifteen nineteen but before entering on the narrative of this memorable campaign we must give a few particulars of the man who has left us the most complete account of it francesco antonio pigafetta or jerome pigafette as he is often called in france born at venice about fourteen ninety one of a noble family pigafetta formed part of the suit of the ambassador francesco chiericalco sent by leo x to charles v who was then at barcelona his attention was no doubt aroused by the noise which the preparations for the expedition made at that time in spain and he obtained permission to take part in the voyage this volunteer proved an excellent recruit for he showed himself in every respect as faithful and intelligent an observer as he was a brave and courageous companion he was wounded at the battle of zebu fighting beside magellan which prevented him from being present at the banquet during which so many of his companions were destined to lose their lives as to his narrative with the exception of some exaggerations of detail according to the taste of that time it is exact and the greater part of the descriptions which we owe to him have been verified by modern travellers and learned men especially by m alcide d'orbigny upon his return to san lucar on the sixth of september fifteen twenty two after having fulfilled the vow which he had made to go barefoot to return thanks to nuestra senora de la victoria the lombard as they called him on board the victoria presented to charles v then at valladolid a complete journal of the voyage when he returned to italy by means of the original as well as of some supplementary notes he wrote a longer narrative of the expedition at the request of pope clement the seventh and of villiers de l'isle d'adam grand master of the knights of malta he sent copies of his work to several distinguished personages and notably to louisa of savoy mother of francis i but she not understanding so thinks harris the very learned author of the bibliotheca americana vestustissima the kind of patois used by pigafetta and which resembles a mixture of italian venetian and spanish employed a certain jacques antoine fabre to translate it into french instead of giving a faithful translation fabre made a kind of abridgment of it 
some critics however suppose that this narrative must have been written originally in french they found their opinion upon the existence of three french manuscripts of the sixteenth century which give very different readings and of which two are deposited in the bibliothèque nationale at paris pigafetta died at venice about fifteen thirty four in a house in the rue de la lune which in eighteen hundred was still to be seen and which bore the well-known device no rose without a thorn at the same time not wishing to confine ourselves to pigafetta's narrative entirely we have compared and completed it with that of maximilian transylvan secretary to charles v of which there is an italian translation in ramusio's valuable collection the fleet of magellan consisted of the trinidad of one hundred twenty tons burden which carried the flag of the commander of the expedition the sant antonio also of one hundred twenty tons commanded by juan de carthagena the second in rank the person joined with magellan says the official document the concepcion of ninety tons commanded by gaspar de quesada the famous victoria of eighty-five tons commanded by louis de mendoza and lastly the santiago of seventy-five tons commanded by joao serrao called by the spaniards serrano four of these captains and nearly all the pilots were portuguese barbosa and gomez on board the trinidad luis alfonso de goes and vasco gallego on the victoria serrao joao lopez de carvalho on the concepcion joao rodriguez de muefrapil on the sant antonio and joao serrao on the santiago with twenty-five sailors formed a total of thirty-three portuguese out of the whole body of two hundred thirty-seven individuals whose names have all been handed down to us and amongst whom are found a considerable number of frenchmen of the officers whose names have been mentioned it is to be remembered that duarte barbosa was brother-in-law to magellan and that estavam gomez who by returning to seville on the sixth of may fifteen twenty one did not participate in the conclusion of this memorable voyage was afterwards sent by charles v to seek for the north-west passage and in fifteen twenty one sailed along the coast of america from florida to rhode island and perhaps as far as cape cod nothing could have been better arranged than this expedition for the equipment of which the whole resources of the nautical science of that epoch had been taxed at the moment of departure magellan gave his last orders to his pilots and captains and the code of signals which were to ensure anonymity in manoeuvres and prevent a possible separation on monday morning the tenth of august fifteen nineteen the fleet weighed anchor and sailed down the gualquivir as far as san lucar de barameda which forms the port of seville where the victualling of the ships was completed and it was the twentieth of september before they were really off six days afterwards the fleet anchored at tenerife in the canary archipelago where both wood and water were taken on board it was on leaving this island that the first symptoms appeared of the misunderstanding between magellan and juan de carthagena which was to prove so fatal to the expedition the latter claimed to be informed by the commander-in-chief of the route which he intended to take a claim which was at once rejected by magellan who declared that he was not called upon to give any explanation to his subordinate after having passed between the cape de verde islands and africa the ships reached the shores of sierra leone where contrary winds and dead calms detained the fleet for twenty days a painful incident now occurred during a council which was held on board the flagship a sharp dispute arose and juan de carthagena who affected to treat the captain-general with contempt having answered him with pride and insolence magellan felt obliged to arrest him with his own hand and to have him put in the stocks an instrument made of two pieces of wood placed one upon the other and pierced with holes in which were placed the legs of the sailor who was to be punished 
the other captains remonstrated loudly with magellan against a punishment which was too degrading for a superior officer and carthagena in consequence was simply put under arrest and guarded by one of the captains to the calms now succeeded rain tempests and heavy squalls which obliged the vessels to lie too during these storms the navigators several times witnessed an electric phenomenon of which the cause was not then known but which they considered an undoubted sign of the protection of heaven and which even at the present day is known by the name of st elmo's fire once past the equinoctial line a passage which does not at the time seem to have been celebrated by the grotesque ceremony of baptism which is in vogue at the present day they steered for brazil where on the thirteenth of december fifteen nineteen the fleet cast anchor in the magnificent port of santa lucia now known under the name of rio janeiro this was not however the first time that this bay had been seen by europeans as was long believed since the year fifteen eleven it had been known under the name of bahia de cabo frio it had been visited also four years before magellan's arrival by pero lopez and seems to have been frequented since the commencement of the sixteenth century by mariners from dieppe who inheritors of the passion for adventurous navigation of their ancestors the northmen roamed over the world and founded small establishments or factories in all directions here the spanish expedition procured cheaply in exchange for looking-glasses pieces of ribbon scissors hogs bells or fish hooks a quantity of provisions amongst which pigafetta mentions pineapples sugar canes sweet potatoes fowl and the flesh of the anta which is thought to be the tapir the account given in the same narrative of the manners of the inhabitants is sufficiently curious to be repeated the brazilians are not christians he says but no more are they idolaters for they worship nothing natural instinct is their only law this is an interesting fact and a singular avowal for an italian of the sixteenth century deeply imbued with superstition it offers one more proof that the idea of the divinity is not innate as some theologians have imagined these natives live to a great age they go entirely naked and sleep in cotton nets called hammocks suspended by the two ends to beams as to their boats called canoes each is hollowed out of a single trunk of a tree and can hold as many as forty men they are anthropophagi cannibals but only on special occasions and scarcely ever eat any but their enemies taken in battle their dress of ceremony is a kind of vest made of parroquet's feathers woven together and so arranged that the large wing and tail feathers form a sort of girdle round their loins which gives them a whimsical and ridiculous appearance we have already said that the feather clock was in use on the shores of the pacific among the peruvians it is curious to ascertain that it was worn equally by the brazilians some specimens of this singular garment may be seen at the exhibition of the ethnographical museum this was not however the only ornament of these savages they suspended little stone cylinders from three holes pierced in the lower lip a custom which is common among many of the oceanic people and which may be compared with our fashion of earrings these people were extremely credulous and of good disposition and thus as pigafetta says they could easily have been converted to christianity for they assisted in silence and with gravity at the mass which was said on shore a remark that alvarez cabral had already made after remaining thirteen days in this place the squadron continued its route to the south coasting along the shore and arrived at thirty-four degrees forty minutes of south latitude in a country where flowed a large river of fresh water it was the la plata the natives called charuas were so frightened at the sight of the vessels that they hastily took refuge in the interior of the country carrying with them all their valuables 
and it was impossible to overtake any of them. It was in this country that four years previously Juan Díaz de Solís had been massacred by a tribe of Charuas, armed with that terrible engine which is still in use at the present day among the gauchos of the Argentine Republic, the bolas, which are metal balls fastened to the two ends of a long leather thong, called the lasso. A little below the estuary of the La Plata, once thought to be an arm of the sea opening into the Pacific, the flotilla anchored at Port Desire. Here they obtained an ample supply of penguins for the crews of the five vessels, a bird which did not make a very delicious meal. Then they anchored in 49 degrees 30 minutes in a beautiful harbour, where Magellan resolved to winter, and which received the name of St. Julian's Bay. The Spaniards had been two months there, when one day they perceived a man who seemed to them to be of gigantic stature. At the sight of them he began dancing and singing and throwing dust upon his head. This was a Patagonian who allowed himself without resistance to be taken on board the vessels. He showed the greatest surprise at all he saw around him, but nothing astonished him so much as a large steel mirror which was presented to him. The giant, who had not the least idea of the use of this piece of furniture, and who, no doubt, now saw his own face for the first time, drew back in such terror that he threw to the ground four of our people who were behind him. He was taken back on shore loaded with presents, and the kind welcome which he had received induced eighteen of his companions, thirteen women and five men, to come on board. They were tall and had broad faces, painted red except the eyes, which were encircled with yellow. Their hair was whitened with lime, they were wrapped in enormous fur cloaks, and wore those large leather boots from which was given to them the name of large feet, or Patagonians. Their stature was not, however, so gigantic as it appeared to our simple narrator, for it varies from five feet ten inches to five feet eight inches, being somewhat above the middle height among Europeans. For arms they had a short massive bow and arrows made of reed, of which the point was formed of a sharp pebble. The captain, to retain two of these savages whom he wished to take to Europe, used a stratagem which we should characterize as hateful in the present day, but which had nothing revolting about it for the sixteenth century, when Indians and Negroes were universally considered to be a kind of brute beasts. Magellan loaded these Indians with presents, and when he saw them embarrassed with the quantity, he offered to each of them one of those iron rings used for chaining captives. They would have desired to carry them away, for they valued iron above everything, but their hands were full. It was then proposed to fasten the rings to their legs, to which they agreed without suspicion. The sailors then closed the rings, so that the savages found themselves in fetters. Nothing can give an idea of their fury when they discovered this stratagem, worthy rather of savages than of civilized men. The capture of others was attempted, but in vain, and in the chase one of the Spaniards was wounded by a poisoned arrow, which caused his death almost instantaneously. Intrepid hunters, these people wander about perpetually in pursuit of guana kiss and other game. They are endowed with such wonderful voracity, that what would suffice for the nourishment of twenty sailors can scarcely satisfy seven or eight of them. Magellan, foreseeing that the stay here was likely to be prolonged, and perceiving that the country only presented meagre resources, gave orders to economize the provisions, and to put the men on fixed rations, that they might not experience too great privations before the spring, when they might reach a country where there was more game. But the Spaniards, discontented at the sterility of the place, and at the length and rigor of the winter, began to murmur. This land seemed to stretch southward as far as the Antarctic Pole, they said. There did not seem to be any strait. Already several had died from the privations they had endured. 
lastly it was time to return to spain if the commander did not wish to see all his men perish in this place End of Second Part, Chapter 2, Part 1section thirty two of celebrated travels and travellers volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by avai in april two thousand and twelve celebrated travels and travellers volume one exploration of the world by jules verne second part chapter two part two magellan fully resolved to die or else to bring the enterprise he commanded to a successful issue replied that the emperor had assigned him the course which the voyage was to take and he neither could nor would depart from it under any pretext and that in consequence he should go straight forward to the end of this land or until he met with some strait as to provisions if they found them insufficient his men might add to their rations the produce of their fishing or hunting magellan thought that so firm a declaration would impose silence on the malcontents and that he would hear no more of privations from which he suffered equally with his crews he deceived himself completely certain of the captains and juan de cartagena in particular were interested in causing a revolt to break out these rebels, therefore, began by reminding the Spaniards of their old animosity against the Portuguese. The captain-general, being one of the latter nation, had never, according to them, tendered a wholehearted allegiance to the Spanish flag. In order to be able to return to his own country, and to gain pardon for what he had done wrong, he wished to commit some heinous crime, and nothing could be more advantageous to Portugal than the destruction of this fine fleet. Instead of leading them to the archipelago of the Moluccas, of the riches of which he had boasted to them, he wished to take them into frozen regions, the dwelling place of eternal snow, where he could easily manage that they should all perish then with the help of the portuguese on board the squadron he would take back to his own country the vessels which he had seized such were the reports and accusations that the partisans of juan de cartagena luis de mendoza and gaspar de quesada had disseminated along the sailors when on palm sunday the first of april fifteen twenty Magellan summoned the captains, officers, and pilots to hear mass on board his vessel and to dine with him afterwards. Alvaro de la Mesquita, a cousin of the captain-general, accepted this invitation with Antonio de Coca and his officers, but neither Mendoza nor Quesada nor Juan de Cartagena, who was Quesada's prisoner, appeared. The next night the malcontents boarded the Sant Antonio with thirty of the men of the Concepcion, and desired to have La Mesquita given up to them. The pilot, Juan de Elioraga, while defending his captain, received four stabs from a poniard in the arm. Quesada cried out at the same time, You will see that this fool will make our business fail. The three vessels, the Concepcion, Sant Antonio, and Santiago, fell without difficulty into the hands of the rebels, who reckoned more than one accomplice among the crews. In spite of this success, the three captains did not dare openly to attack the commander-in-chief, and sent to them some proposals for a reconciliation. Magellan ordered them to come on board the Trinidad to confer with him, but this they stoutly refused to do whereupon Magellan, having no further need of caution, had the boat seized which had brought him this answer, and choosing six strong and brave men from amongst his crew, he sent them on board the Victoria under the command of the Alguazil Espinosa. He carried a letter from Magellan to Mendoza, enjoining him to come on board the Trinidad, and when Mendoza smiled in a scornful manner, Espinosa stabbed him in the throat with a poniard, while the sailor struck him on the head with a cutlass. While these events were taking place, another boat, laden with fifteen armed men, came alongside the Victoria, and took possession of her without any resistance from the sailors, surprised by the rapidity of the action. 
on the next day the third of april the two other rebel vessels were taken not however without bloodshed mendoza's body was divided into quarters while a clerk read in a loud voice the sentence that blasted his memory three days afterwards quesada was beheaded and cut in pieces by his own servant who undertook this sad task to save his own life as to carthagena the high rank which the royal edict had conferred upon him in the expedition saved him from death but with gomez de la arena the chaplain he was left behind on the shore where some months afterwards he was found by estevam gomez forty sailors convicted of rebellion were pardoned because their services were considered indispensable after this severe lesson magellan might well hope that the mutinous spirit was really subdued when the temperature became milder the anchors were weighed the squadron put to sea on the twenty fourth of august following the coast and carefully exploring all the gulfs to find that strait which had been so persistently sought at the level of cape saint croix one of the vessels the santiago was lost on the rocks during a violent gale from the east happily both the men and merchandise on board were saved and they succeeded also in taking from the wrecked vessel the rigging and appurtenances of the ship which they divided among the four remaining vessels at last on the twenty first of october according to picafetta the twenty seventh of november according to maximilian transylvan the flotilla penetrated by a narrow entrance into a gulf at the bottom of which a strait opened which as they soon saw passed into the sea to the south first they called this the strait of the eleven thousand virgins because this was the day dedicated to them on each side of the strait rose high land covered with snow on which they saw numerous fires especially to the left but they were unable to obtain any communication with the natives the details which pigafetta and martin transylvan have given with regard to the topological and hydrographical dispositions of this strait are rather vague and as we shall have to mention it again when we speak of the bougainville's expedition we shall not dilate upon it now after sailing for twenty-two days across this succession of narrow inlets and arms of the sea in some places three miles wide in some twelve which extends for a distance of four hundred forty miles and has received the name of magellan's strait the flotilla emerged upon a sea of immense extent and great depth the rejoicings were general when at last the sailors found themselves at the long wished-for end of their efforts henceforward the route was open and magellan's clever conjectures were realized nothing is more extraordinary than the navigation of magellan upon this ocean which he called pacific because for four months no storm assailed him upon it the privations endured by the crews during this long space of time were excessive the biscuit was nothing more than dust mixed with worms while the water had become bad and gave out an unbearable smell the sailors were obliged to eat mice and sawdust to prevent themselves from dying of hunger and to gnaw all the leather that it was possible to find as it was easy to foresee under these circumstances the crews were decimated by scurvy nineteen men died and thirty were seized with violent pains in their arms and legs which caused prolonged sufferings at last after having sailed over more than twelve thousand miles without meeting with a single island in a sea where so many and such populous archipelagos were destined to be discovered the fleet came upon two desert and sterile islands called for that reason the unfortunate islands but of which the position is indicated in much too contradictory a manner for it to be possible to recognize them in twelve degrees north latitude and one hundred forty six degrees longitude on wednesday the sixth of march the navigators discovered successively three islands at which they greatly desired to stop to recruit and take in fresh provisions but the islanders who came on board stole so many things without the possibility of preventing them that the sailors were obliged to give up the idea of remaining there the natives contrived even to carry off a long boat 
Magellan, indignant at such daring, made a descent with forty armed men, burned some houses and boats, and killed seven men. These islanders had neither chief, king, nor religion. Their heads were covered with palm-leaf hats, they wore beards, and their hair descended to their waists. Generally of an olive tint, they thought they embellished themselves by colouring their teeth black and red, while their bodies were anointed with coconut oil, no doubt in order to protect themselves from the heat of the sun. Their canoes of curious construction carried a very large matting sail, which might have easily capsized the boat if the precaution had not been taken of giving a more stable trim by means of a long piece of wood capped at a certain distance by two poles. This is what is called the balance. These islanders were very industrious, but had a singular aptitude for stealing, which has gained for their country the name of the Islands of Thieves, Ladrone Islands. On the 16th of March was seen, at about 900 miles from the Ladrones, some high ground. This was soon discovered to be an island which now goes by the name of Samar Island. There Magellan, resolving to give his exhausted crews some rest, caused two tents to be pitched on land for the use of the sick. The natives quickly brought bananas, palm wine, coconuts, and fish, for which mirrors, combs, bells, and other similar trifles were offered in exchange. The coconut, a tree which is valuable beyond all others, supplied these natives with their bread, wine, oil, and vinegar, and besides they obtained from it their clothing and the necessary wood for building and roofing in their huts. The natives soon became familiar with the Spaniards and told them that their archipelago produced cloves, cinnamon, pepper, nutmegs, ginger, maize or Indian corn, and that even gold was found there. Magellan gave this archipelago the name of the St. Lazarus Islands, afterwards changed to that of the Philippines from the name of Philip of Austria, son of Charles V. This archipelago is formed of a great number of islands which extend in Malaysia, between 5 degrees 32 minutes and 19 degrees 38 minutes north latitude, and 114 degrees 56 minutes and 123 degrees 43 minutes longitude east of the meridian of Paris. The most important are Luzon, Mindoro, Leyte, the Salon of Pigafetta, Samar, Panay, Negros, Cebu, Bohol, Palawan, and Mindanao. When they were a little restored, the Spaniards put to sea again, in order to explore the archipelago. They saw in succession the islands of Senalo, Huinaugan, Ibuson, and Abarien, as well as another island called Masava, of which the king Colambu could make himself understood by a slave, a native of Sumatra, whom Magellan had taken to Europe from India, and who, by his knowledge of Malay, rendered signal service in several instances. The king came on board with six or eight of his principal subjects. He brought with him presents for the captain-general, and in exchange he received a vest of red and yellow cloth, made in Turkish fashion, and a cap of fine scarlet, while mirrors and knives were given to the members of his suit. The Spaniards showed him all their firearms and fired some shots from the cannon in his presence, at which he was much terrified. Then Magellan caused one of our number to be fully armed, says Pigafetta, and ordered three men to give him blows with the sword and stiletto to show the king that nothing could wound a man armed in this manner, which surprised him greatly, and turning to the interpreter he said to the captain through him, that a man thus armed could fight against a hundred. Yes, replied the interpreter in the name of the commandant, and each of the three vessels carries two hundred men armed in this manner. The king, astonished by all that he had seen, took leave of the captain, begging him to send two of his men with him to let him see something of the island. Pigafetta was chosen and was much satisfied with the welcome that he received. The king told him that in this island they found pieces of gold as large as nuts and even eggs, mixed with the earth which they passed through a sieve to find them. 
all his vessels and even some of the ornaments of his house were of this metal he was very neatly dressed according to the custom of the country and was the finest man that i have seen among these people his black hair fell upon his shoulders a sink veil covered his head and he wore two rings in his ears from his waist to his knees he was covered with a cotton cloth embroidered in silk on each of his teeth there were three spots of gold arranged in such a manner that one would have said all his teeth were fastened together with this metal he was perfumed with storax and benzoin his skin was painted but his natural tint was olive on easter day the europeans went on shore to celebrate mass in a kind of little church which they had constructed on the seashore with sails and branches of trees an altar had been set up and during the whole time that the religious ceremony lasted the king with a large concourse of people listened in silence and imitated all the motions of the spaniards then a cross having been planted on a hill with great solemnity they weighed anchor and made for the port of zebu as being the best for revictualling the vessels and trading they arrived there on sunday the seventh of april magellan sent one of his officers on shore at once with the interpreter as ambassador to the king of zebu the envoy explained that the chief of the squadron was under the orders of the greatest king in the world the object of the voyage he added was the wish to pay him a visit and at the same time to take in some fresh provisions in exchange for merchandise and then go to the molucca islands such were the motives which caused them to tarry in a country where they came as friends they are welcome replied the king but if they intend to trade they should pay a duty to which all vessels are subject that enter my port as did not four days since a junk from siam which came to seek for slaves and gold to which a moorish merchant who has remained in this country can testify the spaniard replied that his master was too great a king to submit to such an unreasonable demand they had come with pacific intentions but if war were declared it would be seen with whom they had to deal the king of zebu warned by the moorish merchant of the power of those who stood before him and whom he took for portuguese at length consented to forego his claims moreover the king of massava who had continued to serve as pilot to the spaniards so altered the inclinations of his brother sovereign that the spaniards obtained the exclusive privilege of trading in the island and a loyal friendship was sealed between the king of zebu and magellan by an exchange of blood which each drew from his right arm from this moment provisions were brought and cordial relations established the nephew of the king came with a numerous suit to visit magellan on board his ship and the latter took this opportunity to relate to his visitors the wonderful history of the creation of the world and of the redemption of the human race and to invite him and his people to become converts to christianity they showed no repugnance to being baptized and on the fourteenth of april the kings of zebu and massaba and the moorish merchant with five hundred men and as many women received baptism but what was only a fashion at first for it cannot be said that the natives knew the religion which they embraced or were persuaded of its truth became a real frenzy after a wonderful cure had been effected by magellan having learned that the father of the king had been ill for two years and was on the point of death the captain-general promised that if he consented to be baptized and the natives would burn their idols he would find himself cured he added that he was so convinced of what he said relates pigafetta for it is as well to quote the author verbatim in such a matter that he agreed to lose his head if what he promised did not happen immediately we then made a procession with all possible pomp from the place where we were to the sick man's house whom we found really in a very sad state that he could neither speak nor move we baptized him with two of his wives and ten daughters the captain asked him directly after his baptism how he found himself and he suddenly replied that thanks to our lord he was well we were all witnesses of this miracle the captain above all rendered thanks to god for it 
he gave the prince a refreshing drink and continued to send him some of it every day till he was quite restored on the fifth day the invalid found himself quite cured and got up his first care was to have burned in the presence of the king and all the people an idol for which he had great veneration and which some old women guarded carefully in his house he also caused some temples which stood on the seashore and in which the people assembled to eat the meat consecrated to their old divinities to be thrown down all the inhabitants applauded these acts and proposed themselves to go and destroy all the idols even those which were in use in the king's house crying at the same time vive la castile in honour of the king of spain near to the island of zebu is another island called matan which had two chiefs one of whom had recognized the authority of spain while the other having energetically resisted it magellan resolved to impose it upon him by force on friday the twenty sixth of april three long boats left for the island of matan containing sixty men wearing caresses and helmets and armed with muskets and thirty balangais bearing the king of zebu his son-in-law and a number of warriors the spaniards waited for day and then to the number of forty-nine leapt into the water for the boats could not approach the land on account of the rocks and shallow water more than one thousand five hundred natives awaited them and at once threw themselves upon them and attacked them in three troops both in front and flank the musketeers and the crossbow men fired on the multitude of warriors from a distance without doing them much harm they being protected by their bucklers the spaniards assailed by stones arrows javelins and lances and overwhelmed by numbers set fire to some huts to disperse and intimidate the natives but these made more furious by the sight of the fire redoubled their efforts and pressed the spaniards on all sides who had the greatest difficulty in resisting them when a sad event took place which compromised the issue of the combat the natives were not slow in remarking that all the blows which they had directed towards those parts of their enemies bodies which were protected by armour caused no wounds they set themselves therefore to hurl their arrows and javelins against the lower part of the body which was undefended magellan wounded in the leg by a poisoned arrow gave the order for retreat which begun in good order soon changed into such a flight that seven or eight spaniards alone remained at his side with much difficulty they kept moving backwards fighting as they went in order to reach the boats they were already knee-deep in the water when several islanders rushed all together upon magellan who wounded in the arm was unable to draw his sword they gave him such a sabre-cut upon his leg that he immediately fell down in the water where he was speedily dispatched his remaining companions and among them pigafetta every one of whom had been hit hastily regained the boats thus perished the illustrious magellan on the twenty seventh of april fifteen twenty one he was adorned with every virtue says pigafetta and ever exhibited an unshaken constancy in the midst of the greatest adversity at sea he always condemned himself to greater privations than the rest of his crew better versed than any one else in the knowledge of nautical charts he was perfect at the art of navigation as he proved by making the tour of the world which none before him had ventured to do pigafetta's funeral eulogy though a little hyperbolical is not untrue in the main magellan had need of singular constancy and perseverance to penetrate despite the fears of his companions into regions peopled by the superstitious spirit of the time with fantastic dangers peculiar nautical science was also necessary to achieve the discovery at the extremity of that long coast of the strait which so justly bears his name he was obliged to give unceasing attention to avoid all untoward accidents while exploring those unknown parts without any exact instruments that one of the vessels was lost must be imputed to pride and a spirit of revolt in her own captain 
more than to any incapacity or want of caution in the captain-general let us add with our enthusiastic narrator the glory of magellan will survive his death end of second part chapter two part two Section 33 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in April 2012. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 2, Part 3 Duarte Barbosa, Magellan's brother-in-law, and Juan Serrano were elected commanders by the Spaniards, who were destined to meet with further catastrophes. The slave who had acted as interpreter up to this time had been slightly wounded during the battle. From the time of his master's death he had kept aloof, not rendering any further service to the Spaniards, and remaining extended upon his mat. After some rather sharp reproofs from Barbosa, who told him that his master's death did not make him a free man, he disappeared all at once. He was gone to the newly baptized king, to whom he declared that if he could allure the Spaniards into some trap and then kill them, he would make himself master of all their provisions and merchandise. Serrano, Barbosa, and twenty-seven Spaniards were accordingly invited to a solemn assembly to receive the presents destined by the king of Zebu for the emperor, during the banquet they were attacked unexpectedly and were all massacred except serrano who was led bound to the seashore where he besought his companions to ransom him for if they did not he would be murdered but juan de carvalho and the others fearing that the insurrection would become general and that they might be attacked during the negotiations by a numerous fleet which they would not be able to resist turned a deaf ear to the unfortunate serrano's supplications the ship set sail and reached the island of bohol which was not far distant when there thinking that their numbers were too much reduced to navigate three vessels they burned the concepcion after having transshipped all that was most precious on board the other vessels then after having coasted along the island of panilongon they stopped at butuan which forms part of mindanao a magnificent island with numerous ports and rivers abounding in fish to the northwest of which lies the island of luzon the most considerable of the archipelago the ships touched also at paloan where they found pigs goats fowls different kinds of bananas coconuts sugar canes and rice with which they provisioned the ships this was for them as pigafetta expresses it a promised land among the things which he thought worthy of notice the italian traveller mentions the cocks kept by the natives for fighting a passion which after so many years is still deeply rooted amongst the population of the whole philippine archipelago from paloan the spaniards next went to the island of borneo the centre of malay civilization from that time they had no longer to deal with poverty-stricken people but with a rich population who received them with magnificence their reception by the rajah is sufficiently curious to warrant a few words being devoted to it at the landing-place they found two elephants with silk trappings who bore the strangers to the house of the governor of the town while twelve men carried the presents which were to be offered to the rajah from the governor's house where they slept to the palace of the king the streets were kept by armed men upon descending from their elephants the spaniards were admitted to a room filled with courtiers at the end of this room opened another smaller room hung with cloth of gold in which were three hundred men of the king's guard armed with poniards through a door they could then see the rajah sitting by a table with a little child chewing betel nut behind him there were only some women etiquette required that the petition to be made must pass in succession through the mouths of three nobles 
each of higher rank than the last, before being transmitted, by means of a hollow cane placed in a hole in the wall, to one of the principal officers, who submitted it to the king. Then there was an exchange of presents, after which the Spanish ambassadors were conducted back to their vessels with the same ceremony as on their arrival. The capital is built on piles in the sea, so that when the tide rises, the women who sell provisions go about the town in boats. On the 29th of July, more than 100 canoes surrounded the two vessels, whilst at the same time some junks weighed anchor to approach them more nearly. The Spaniards, fearing to be treacherously attacked, took the initiative and fired off their artillery, which killed a number of people in the canoes, upon which the king excused himself, saying that his fleet had not been directed against them, but against the genteels with whom the Mussulmen had daily combats. This island produces arak, the alcohol of rice, camphor, cinnamon, ginger, oranges, citrons, sugar canes, melons, radishes, onions, etc., the articles of exchange are copper, quicksilver, cinnabar, glass, woolen cloths and canvas, and above all iron and spectacles, without mentioning porcelain, and diamonds, some of which were of extraordinary size and value. The fauna comprises elephants, horses, buffaloes, pigs, goats, and domestic poultry. The money in use is of bronze, it is called sapec, and consists of small coins which are perforated with holes, that they may be strung together. On leaving Borneo the travellers sought for a suitable spot in which to repair their vessels, which were in such great need of it that the men were not less than forty-two days over the work. The oddest things which I have found in this island, says Pigafetta, are the trees of which all the leaves are animated. These leaves resemble those of the mulberry, but are not so long, the stalk is short and pointed, and near the stalk on both sides there are two feet. If you touch the leaves they escape, but when crushed no blood comes from them. I have kept one of them in a box for nine years. When I opened the box the leaf was walking about in it. I believe they must live upon air." These very curious animals are well known at the present day, and are commonly called leaf-flies, mouchefeuille. They are of a grey-brown, which makes them more easily mistaken for dead leaves, which they exactly resemble in appearance. It was while in these parts that the Spanish expedition, which, during Magellan's life had preserved its scientific character, began perceptibly to become piratical. Thus, on several occasions, junks were seized upon, and their crews forced by their Spanish captors to pay large ransoms. The ships next passed by the archipelago of the Sulu Islands, the haunt of Malay pirates, who have even now only largely submitted to the Spanish arms. Then by Mindanao, which had been already visited, for it was known that the eagerly sought-for Moluccas must be in its neighbourhood, whether more or less remote. At last, after having seen a number of islands, of which the names would not convey much idea to us, on Wednesday, the 6th of November, the Spaniards discovered the archipelago, about which the Portuguese had related such terrifying fables, and two days later they landed at Tidor. Thus the object of the voyage was attained. The king came to meet the Spaniards and invited them to go on board his canoe. He was seated under a silk parasol which covered him entirely. In front of him were placed one of his sons who carried the royal sceptre, two men who had each a golden vase full of water for washing the king's hands, and two others holding small gilt boxes filled with beetle. Then the Spaniards made the king come on board the vessels, where they showed him much respect, at the same time loading him and those who accompanied him with presents, which seemed to them very precious. This king is a Moor, that is to say, an Arab, Pigafetta affirms. He is nearly forty-five years of age, tolerably well made, and with a fine physiognomy. His clothing consisted of a very fine shirt, the cuffs of which were embroidered in gold, drapery descended from his waist to his feet, a silk veil, 
no doubt a turban covered his head and upon this veil there was a garland of flowers his name is raja sultan manzor the next day in a long interview which he had with the spaniards manzor declared his intention of placing himself with the islands of ternate and tidor under the protection of the king of spain this is the place to give some details of the archipelago of the Moluccas, drawn from Pigafetta's narrative, which we are following step by step in the version that M. E. D. Charton has given, and to which he has added such valuable notes. This archipelago, properly speaking, comprises the islands of Gilolo, Ternate, Tidor, Mornay, Bachian, and Misal, but the Banda and Mboina groups are also often comprehended under the general name of Molucca. Formerly convulsed by repeated volcanic commotions, this archipelago contains a great number of craters, almost all extinct, or in repose during a long succession of years. The air there is burning and would be almost unfit to breathe if frequent rains did not fall and refresh the atmosphere the natural productions are extremely valuable in the first rank must be placed the sago tree of which the pith called sago takes with yams the place of cereals throughout malacca as soon as the tree is cut down the pith is extracted which is then grated passed through a sieve and afterwards cut up in the form of small rolls which are dried in the shade there are also the mulberry, the clove, the nutmeg, the camphor and pepper trees, in fact all the spice trees and all the tropical fruits. The forests contain some valuable kinds of wood, ebony, ironwood, teak, famous for its strength and employed from the most ancient times in costly buildings, and the caliliban laurel, which yields an aromatic essential oil that is highly prized at this period domestic animals were not numerous in the moluccas but among the wild animals the most curious were the barbirusa an enormous wild boar with long tusks bent backwards the opossum a kind of didelphus a little larger than our squirrel the phalanger a marsupial which lives in thick dark forests where it feeds upon leaves and fruit and the tarsier, a kind of jaboa, a very harmless, inoffensive little animal, with reddish-coloured hair, about the size of a rat, but whose body bears some resemblance to that of an ape. Among the birds, the most remarkable were the parakeets and cockatoos, the birds of paradise of which so many fabulous accounts were given, and which until then had been believed to be without legs, the kingfishers, and the cassowaries, great wading birds almost as large as ostriches a portuguese named lorosa had been long settled in the moluccas and to him the spaniards forwarded a letter in the hope that he would betray his country and attach himself to spain they obtained the most curious information from him with regard to the expeditions which the king of portugal has dispatched to the cape of good hope to the rio de la plata and to the moluccas but from various circumstances these latter expeditions had not been able to take place he himself had been sixteen years in this archipelago the portuguese had been installed there for ten years but upon this fact they preserved the most complete silence when lorosa saw the spaniards making their preparations for departure he came on board with his wife and his goods to return to europe on the 12th of November all the merchandise destined for barter was landed, it being chiefly derived from the four junks which had been seized in Borneo. Certainly the Spaniards traded to great advantage, but nevertheless not to so great an extent as they might have done, for they were in haste to return to Spain. Some vessels from Gilolo and Bachian came also to trade with them, and a few days later they received a considerable stock of cloves from the king of Tidor. This king invited them to a great banquet, which he said it was his custom to give when a vessel or junk was loaded with the first cloves. But the Spaniards, remembering what had happened to them in the Philippines, refused the invitation while presenting compliments and excuses to the king. When their cargo was completed, they set sail. 
scarcely had the trinidad put to sea before it was perceived that she had a serious leak and the return to tidor as fast as possible was unavoidable the skilful divers whom the king placed at the disposal of the spaniards were unable to discover the hole and it became necessary to partly unload the ship to make the necessary repairs the sailors who were on board the victoria would not wait for their companions and the ship's officers seeing clearly that the trinidad would not be fit for the voyage to spain decided that she should go to darien where her valuable cargo would be discharged and transported across the isthmus to the atlantic where a vessel would be sent to fetch it but neither the unfortunate vessel nor her crew was destined ever to return to spain the trinidad commanded by the alguazil gonzalo gomez de espinosa who had juan de carvalho as pilot was in so bad a state that after leaving tidor she was obliged to anchor at ternate in the port of talangomi where her crew consisting of seventeen men was immediately imprisoned by the portuguese the only reply given to espinosa's remonstrances was a threat to hang him to the yard of a vessel and the unfortunate alguazil after having been transferred to cochin was sent to lisbon where for seven months he remained shut up in the prison of the limoeiro with two spaniards the sole survivors of the crew of the trinidad as to the victoria she left tidor richly laden under the command of juan sebastian del cano who after having been simply a pilot on board of one of magellan's ships had taken the command of the concepcion on the twenty seventh of april fifteen twenty one and who succeeded to juan lopez de carvalho when the latter was superseded in his command for incapacity the crew of the victoria was composed of only fifty-three europeans and thirteen indians fifty-four europeans remained at tidor on board the trinidad after passing amidst the islands of Caioan, Laigoma, Sico, Giofi, Cafi, Laboan, Toliman, Bachian, Mata, and Batu, the Victoria left this latter island to the west, and, steering west-south-west, stopped during the night at the islands of Zulla or Zala. At thirty miles from thence, the Spaniards anchored at Buro, the Boero of Borganville, where the ship was revictualled. They stopped 105 miles further on, at Banda, where mace and nutmegs are found, then at Solor, where a great trade in white sandalwood is carried on. They spent a fortnight there to repair their ship, which had suffered much, and there they laid in an ample provision of wax and pepper. Then they anchored at Timor, where they could only obtain provisions by retaining by stratagem the chief of the village and his son, who had come on board the ship. This island was frequented by junks from Luzon, and by the Praos from Malacca and Java, which traded largely there in sandalwood and pepper. A little further on the Spaniards touched at Java, where, as it appears, sati was practised at that time, as it has been in India until quite recently. Among the stories which Pigafetta relates, without entirely believing them, is one which is most curious. It concerns a gigantic bird, the Epiornis, of which the bones and the enormous eggs were discovered in Madagascar about the year 1850. It is an instance proving the caution needed before rejecting as fictitious many apparently fabulous legends, but which on examination may prove to possess a substratum of truth. To the north of greater Java, says Pigafetta, in the Gulf of China, there is a very large tree called Kampangangi, inhabited by certain birds called Garulla, which are so large and strong that they can bear away a buffalo and even an elephant, and carry it as they fly to the place where the tree Pusater is. This legend has been current ever since the ninth century among the Persians and Arabs, and this bird plays a wonderful part in Arabian tales under the name of the Rock. It is not surprising, therefore, that Pigafetta found an analogous tradition among the Malays. After leaving Greater Java, the Victoria rounded the peninsula of Malacca, which had been subjugated to Portugal by the great Albuquerque ten years before. 
in the immediate neighbourhood are siam and cambodia and chiampa where rhubarb grows this substance is discovered in the following manner a company of from twenty to twenty and five men go into the wood where they pass the night in the trees to protect themselves from lions note here that there are no lions in this country and other ferocious beasts and also that they may better perceive the odour of the rhubarb which the wind wafts towards them in the morning they go towards the place whence came the odour and search there for the rhubarb until they find it rhubarb is the putrefied wood of a great tree and acquires its odour even from its putrefaction the best part of the tree is its root nevertheless the trunk which they call kalama has the same medicinal virtue decidedly it is not from pigafetta that we should seek to acquire botanical knowledge we should run a great risk of deceiving ourselves if we took in earnest the nonsense that the moor told him from whom he drew his information the lombard traveller gives us also fantastic details about china with the greatest seriousness and falls into the grave errors which his contemporary duarte barbosa had avoided it is to the latter we owe the information that the trade in anfiam or opium has existed from this period when once the victoria had left the shores of malacca sebastian del cano took great care to avoid the coast of zangebar where the portuguese had been established since the beginning of the century he kept to the open sea as far as forty two degrees south latitude and for nine weeks he was obliged to keep the sails furled on account of the constant west and north-west winds which ended in a fearful storm to keep to this course required great perseverance on the part of the captain with a settled desire on his part to carry his enterprise to a successful issue the vessel had several leaks and a number of the sailors demanded an anchorage at mozambique for the provisions which were not salted having become bad the crew had only rice and water for food and drink at last on the sixth of may the cape of tempests was doubled and a favourable issue to the voyage might be hoped for nevertheless many vexatious accidents still awaited the navigator in two months twenty-one men europeans and indians died from privations and if on the ninth of july they had not landed at santiago one of the cape de verde islands the whole crew would have died of hunger as this archipelago belonged to portugal the sailors took care to say that they came from america and carefully concealed the route which they had discovered but one of the sailors having had the imprudence to say that the victoria was the only vessel of magellan's squadron which had returned to europe the portuguese immediately seized the crew of a longboat and prepared to attack the spanish vessel however del cano on board his vessel was watching all the movements of the portuguese and suspecting by the preparations which he saw that there was an intention of seizing the victoria he set sail leaving thirteen men of his crew in the hands of the portuguese maximilian transylvan assigns a different motive from the one given by pigafetta for the anchorage at the cape de verde islands he asserts that the fatigued state of the crew who were reduced by privations and who in spite of everything had not ceased to work the pumps had decided the captain to stop and buy some slaves to aid them in this work having no money the spaniards would have paid with some of their spices which would have opened the eyes of the portuguese to see if our journals were correctly kept says pigafetta we inquired on shore what day of the week it was they replied that it was thursday which surprised us because according to our journals it was as yet only wednesday we could not be persuaded that we had made the mistake of a day i was more astonished myself than the others were because having always been sufficiently well to keep my journal i had uninterruptedly marked the days of the week and the course of the months we learnt afterwards that there was no error in our calculation for having always travelled towards the west following the course of the sun and having returned to the same point we must have gained twenty-four hours upon those who had remained stationary one has only need of reflection to be convinced of this fact 
Sebastian del Cano rapidly made the coast of Africa, and on the 6th of September entered the Bay of San Lucar de Barameda with a crew of 17 men, almost all of whom were ill. Two days later he anchored before the mole at Seville, after having accomplished a complete circuit of the world. As soon as he arrived, Sebastian del Cano went to Valladolid, where the court was, and received from Charles V the welcome which was merited after so many difficulties had been courageously overcome. The bold mariner received permission to take as his armorial bearings a globe with this motto, Primus Circum Dedisti Me, and he also received a pension of five hundred ducats. The rich freight of the Victoria decided the emperor to send a second fleet to the Moluccas. The supreme command of it was not, however, given to Sebastian del Cano, it was reserved for the commander Garcia de Loaiza, whose only claim to it was his grand name. However, after the death of the chief of the expedition, which happened as soon as the fleet had passed the Strait of Magellan, del Cano found himself invested with the command, but he did not hold it long, for he died six days afterwards. As for the ship Victoria, she was long preserved in the port of Seville, but in spite of all the care that was taken of her, she at length fell to pieces from old age. End of Second Part, Chapter 2, Part 3section thirty four of celebrated travels and travelers volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tech savvy celebrated travels and travelers volume one exploration of the world by jules Verne. second part chapter three Part 1a The Polar Expeditions and the Search for the Northwest Passage Part 1a The North Men Pythias had opened up the road to the north to the Scandinavians by discovering Iceland, the famous Thule, and the Cronian Ocean of which the mud, the shallow water, and the ice render the navigation dangerous and where the nights are as light as twilight. The traditions of the voyages undertaken by the ancients to the Orkneys, the Faroe Islands, and even to Iceland were treasured up among Irish monks, who were learned men, and themselves bold mariners as their successive establishments in this archipelagos clearly prove. They were also the pilots of the North Men, a name given generally to the Scandinavian pirates, both Danish and Norwegian, who rendered themselves so formidable to the whole of Europe during the Middle Ages. But if all the information that we owe to the ancients, both Greeks and Romans, with regard to this Hyperborean countries be extremely vague and, so to speak, fabulous, it is not so with that which concerns the adventurous enterprises of the men of the North. The sagas, as the Icelandic and the Danish songs are called, are extremely precise, and the numerous data which we owe to them are daily confirmed by the archaeological discoveries made in America, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and Denmark. This is a source of valuable information which was long unknown and unexplored, and of which we owe the revelation to the learned Dane, C. C. Raffin who was furnished us with the authentic facts of the greatest interest bearing on the pre-columbian discovery of america norway was poor and encumbered with population hence arose the necessity for a permanent emigration which should allow a considerable portion of the inhabitants to seek in more favored regions of the nourishment which a frozen soil denied them when they had found some country rich enough to yield them an abundant spoil they then returned to their own land and set out the following spring accompanied by all those who could be enticed either by the love of lucre the desire for of an easy life or by the thirst of strife intrepid hunters and fishermen accustomed to a dangerous navigation between the continent and the mass of islands which border it and appear to defend it against the assaults of the ocean and across the narrow deep fiords 
which seem as though they were cut into soil itself by some gigantic sword they set out in those oak vessels the sight of which made the people tremble who lived on the shores of the north sea and the british channel sometimes decked these vessels long or short large or small were usually terminated in front by a spur of enormous size about which the pro sometimes rose to a great height taking the form of an s the hall wrist ninja for so they call the graphic representation so often met on the rocks of sweden and norway enable us to picture to ourselves this swift vessels which could carry a considerable crew such was the long serpent of olaf trigwesson which had thirty-two benches of rowers and held ninety men canute's vessel which carried sixty and the two vessels of olaf and saint which carried sometimes two hundred men the sea kings as they often call these adventurers lived on the ocean never settling on shore passing from the pillage of a castle to the burning of an abbey devastating the coasts of france ascending rivers especially the seine as far as paris sailing over the mediterranean as far as constantinople establishing themselves later in sicily and leaving traces of their incursions or their sojourn in all the regions of the known world piracy far from being as at the present day an act falling under the ban of the law was not only encouraged in that barbarous or half-civilized society but was celebrated in the songs of scalds who reserve their most enthusiastic eulogies for celebrating chivalrous struggles adventurous privateering and all the exhibitions of strength from the eighth century these formidable sea rovers frequented the groups of the orkney the hebrides the shetland and then the faroe islands where they met with the irish monks who had settled themselves there nearly a century earlier to instruct the idolatrous population in eight sixty one a norwegian pirate named nadod was carried by the storm towards an island covered with snow which he named snowland land of snow a name changed later to that of iceland land of ice there again the northmen found the irish monks under the name of papis in the cantons of papaya and papillae in gulf installed himself some years afterwards in the country and founded rishkiavik in eighteen eighty five the triumph of harold harfager who had just subjugated the whole of norway by force of arms brought a considerable number of malcontents to iceland they established there the republican form of government which had just been overthrown in their own country and which subsisted till twelve sixty one the epoch when iceland passed under the dominion of the kings of norway when established in iceland these bold fellows lovers of adventure and of long hunts in pursuit of seals and walrus retained their wandering habits and pursued their bold plans in the west where only three years after the arrival of ingolf Gumbjorn, discovered the snowy peaks of the mountains of greenland five years later eric the red banished from iceland for murder rediscovered the land in latitude sixty four degrees north of which Gumbjorn had caught a glimpse the sterility of this ice-bound coast made him decide to seek a milder climate with a more open country and one producing more game in the south so he rounded cape farewell at the extremity of greenland established himself on the west coast and built himself vast dwellings for himself and his companions of which m jorgensen has discovered the ruins this country was worthy at that period of the name of greenland which the northmen gave to it but the annual and great increase of the glaciers has rendered it since that epoch a land of desolation eric returned to iceland to seek his friends and in the same year that he returned to bratihalida for so he called his settlement fourteen vessels laden with emigrants came to join him it was a veritable exodus these events took place in the year one thousand as quickly as the resources of the country allowed of it the population of greenland increased and in eleven twenty one Gauda, the capital of the country became the seat of Vesabric 
which existed until after the discovery of Antilles by Christopher Columbus. In 986, John Harriolfsen, who had come from Norway to Iceland to spend the winter with his father, learned that the latter had joined Eric the Red in Greenland. Without hesitation, the young man again put to sea, seeking at haphazard for a country of which he did not even know the exact situation, and was cast by currents on coasts which we think must have been those of New Scotland, Newfoundland, and Maine. He ended, however, by reaching Greenland, where Eric, the powerful Norwegian, Jarl, reproached him for not having examined with more care countries of which he owed his knowledge to a happy accident of sea eric had sent his son life to the norwegian court so close at this time was the connection between the metropolis and the colonies the king who had been converted to christianity had just dispatched a mission to iceland charged to overthrow the worship of odin he committed to life's care some priests who were to instruct the greenlanders but scarcely had the young adventurer returned to his own country when he left the holy men to work out the accomplishment of their difficult task and the hearing of the discovery made by Jorn, he fitted out his vessels and went to seek for the lands which had been only imperfectly seen. He landed first on a desolate and stony plain to which he gave the name of Halulin, of which we have no hesitation in recognizing as Newfoundland and afterwards on a flat sandy shore behind which rose an immense screen of dark forests cheered by the songs of innumerable birds a third time he put to sea and steering towards the south he arrived at the bay of rhode island where the mild climate and the river teeming with salmon induced him to settle and where he constructed vast buildings of planks which he called life's buddha life's house then he sent some of his companions to explore the country, and they returned with the good news that the wild wine grows in the country to which it owes the name of Vinland. In the spring of the year 1001, Life, having laded his ship with skins, grapes, wood, and other productions of the country, set out for Greenland. He had made the valuable observation that the shortest day in Vinland lasted nine hours which places the site of lives at forty one degrees twenty four minutes ten seconds this fortunate voyage and the salvage of a norwegian vessel carrying fifteen men gained for life the surname of the fortunate this expedition made a great stir and the account of the wonders of the country in which leif had settled induced his brother thorwald to set out with thirty men after passing the winter at lives buddha thorwald explored the coasts to the south returning in the autumn to vinland and in the following year one thousand and four he sailed along the coast to the north of lives buddha during this return voyage the northmen met the esquimaux for the first time and without any provocation slaughtered them without mercy the following night they found themselves all at once surrounded by a numerous flotilla of kayaks from which came a cloud of arrows thorvald alone the chief of the expedition was mortally wounded he was buried by the companions on a promontory to which they gave the name of the promontory of the cross now in the gulf of boston in the eighteenth century a tomb of masonry was discovered in which with the bones was found a sword hilt of iron the indians not being acquainted with this metal it could not be one of their skeletons it was not either the remains of one of the europeans who had landed after the fifteenth century for their swords had not this very characteristic form this tomb has been thought to be that of the scandinavian and we venture to say that of thorvald son of eric the red in the spring of one thousand and seven three vessels carrying hundred and sixty men and some cattle left Eriksford. the object in view was the foundation of a permanent colony the emigrants after sighting haluland markland and winland landed in an island upon which they constructed some barracks and began the work of cultivation but they must either have laid their plans badly or have been wanting in foresight for the winter found them without provisions and they suffered cruelly from hunger 
They had, however, the good sense to regain the continent where, in comparative ease, they could await the end of the winter. At the beginning of 1008, they set out to seek for Lives Buddha and settled themselves at the Mount Hope Bay, on opposite shore to the old settlement of life. There, for the first time, some intercourse was held with the natives, called Skrellings, in the sagas, and whom, from the manner in which they are portrayed, it is easy to recognize as Exquimox. The first meeting was peaceable, and the barter was carried on with them until the day when the desire of Exquimox to acquire iron hatchets, always prudently refused them by the North men, drove them to acts of aggression which decided the newcomers, after three years of residence, to return to their own country, which they did without leaving behind any lasting trace of their stay in the country it will be easily understood that we cannot give any detailed account of all the expeditions which set out from greenland and succeeded each other on the coasts of labrador and the united states those of our readers who wish for circumstantial details should refer to m gabriel gravier's interesting publication the most complete work on the subject and from which we have borrowed all that relates to the norman expeditions the same year as Eric the Red landed in Greenland, 983, a certain Harry Marson, being driven out of the ordinary cause by storms, was cast upon the shores of a country known by the name of White Man's Land, which extended, according to Raffin, from Chesapeake Bay to Florida. What is the meaning of this name, White Man's Land? Had some compatriots of Marson's already settled there? There is some reason to suppose so even from the words used in the chronicle. We can understand how interesting it would be to be able to determine the nationality of these first colonists. However, the sagas have not as yet revealed all their secrets. There are probably some of them still unknown, and as those which have been successively discovered have confirmed facts already admitted, there is every reason to hope that our knowledge of Icelandic navigation may become more precise. Another legend of which great part is mere romance, but which nevertheless contains a foundation of truth relates that a certain Jean obliged to quit Iceland in consequence of an unfortunate passion took refuge in the countries beyond vinland where in ten twenty seven he was found by some of his countrymen in ten fifty one during another expedition an icelandic woman was killed by some skrellings and in eighteen sixty seven a tomb was exhumed bearing a runic inscription and containing bones and some articles of the toilet which are now preserved in the museum at washington this discovery was made at the exact spot indicated in the saga which relates these events and which was not itself discovered until eighteen sixty three but the north men established in iceland and greenland were not the only people who frequented the coast of america about the year one thousand which is proved by the name of the great ireland which was given to the white man's land as the history of madoc op oven proves that irish and the welsh founded colonies there regarding which we have but little information but vague and uncertain as it is m m d avzac and gufferel agree in recognizing its probability having now said a few words upon the travels and the settlements of the north men in labrador vinland and the more southern countries we must return to the north the colonies first founded in the neighborhood of cape farewell had not been slow in stretching along the western coast which at this period was infinitely less desolate than it is at the present day as far as the northern latitudes which were not again reached until our own day thus at this time they caught seals walrus and whales in the bay of disco there were a hundred and ninety towns counted then in westerbeck and eighty six in Esterbid while at the present day there are far fewer danish settlements on these icy shores these towns were probably only inconsiderable groups of those houses in stone and wood of which so many ruins have been found from cape farewell as far as upper Navik, in about seventy two degrees fifty minutes at the same time numerous runic inscriptions which have now been deciphered have given a degree of absolute certainty to facts so long unknown 
But how many of these vestiges of the past still remain to be discovered? How many of these valuable evidences of the bravery and the spirit of enterprise of the Scandinavian race are forever buried under the glaciers? We have also obtained evidence that Christianity had been brought into America, and especially into Greenland. To this country, according to the instructions of Pope Gregory the Fourth, there were pastoral visits made to strengthen the newly converted North men in the faith, and to evangelize the Esquimaux and the Indian tribes. Besides this, M. Ryant, in 1865, has proved incontrovertibly that the Crusades were preached in Greenland in the bishopric of Gorda, as well as in the islands and the neighboring lands, and that up to 1418 Greenland paid to the Holy See Tithes and St. Peter's Pens, which for that year consisted of 2,600 pounds of walrus tusks. The Norwegian colonies owe their downfall and ruin to various causes. To the very rapid extension of the glaciers, Hayes has proved that the glacier of Friar John moves at the rate of about 33 yards annually, to the bad policy of the mother country which prevented the recruiting of the colonies, to the Black Plague which decimated the population of Greenland from 1347 to 1351, lastly to the depredations of the pirates who ravaged this already and feeble countries in 1418, and in whom some have thought they recognized certain inhabitants of the Orkney and the Faroe Islands, of which we are now about to speak. One of the companions of William the Conqueror named St. Clair or Sinclair, not thinking that the portion of the conquered country allotted to him was proportioned to in his merits, went to try his luck in Scotland, where he was not long in rising to fortune and honors. In the latter half of the fourteenth century, the Orkney Islands passed into the hands of his descendants. About 1390, a certain Niccolo Zeno, a member of one of the most ancient and noble Venetian families who had fitted out a vessel at his own expense to visit England and Flanders as a matter of curiosity, was wrecked in the archipelago of the Orkneys, whither he had been driven by a storm. He was about to be massacred by the inhabitants when the Earl Henry Sinclair took him under his protection. The history of this wreck and the adventures and the discoveries which followed it, published in the collection of Remusio, had been written by Antonio Zeno, says Clemens Parkham, the learned geographer, in his threshold of the unknown region. Unfortunately, one of his descendants, named Niccolo Zeno, born in 1515, when a boy, not knowing the value of these papers, tore them up, but some of the letters surviving he was able from them subsequently to compile the narrative as we now have it, and which was printed in Venice in 1558. There was also found in the palace an old map, rotten with age, illustrative of his voyages. Of this he made a copy, unluckily supplying from his own reading of the narrative what he thought was a requisite for its illustration. By doing this in a blundering way, unaided by the geographical knowledge which enables us to see where he goes astray, he threw the whole of the geography which he derived from the narrative into the most lamentable confusion, while those parts of the map which are not thus sophisticated, and which are consequently original, present an accuracy far in advance by many generations of the geography even of Niccolo Zeno's time, and confirm in a notable manner the site of the old Greenland colony. In these facts we have not only the solution of all the discussions which have arisen on the subject but the most indisputable proof of the authenticity of the narrative for it is clear that nicolo zeno the junior could not himself have been the ingenious concocter of a story the straightforward truth of which he could thus ignorantly distort upon the face of the map the name of Zishni, in which writers of the present day, and the chief among them, Mr. H. Major, who was rescued these facts from the domain of fable, recognized the name of Sinclair, appears to be in fact only applicable to his Earl of Orkneys. At this time the seas of the north of Europe were infected by Scandinavian pirates. Sinclair, who had recognized in Zeno a clever marina attached him to himself, and with him conquered the country of Frisland, the haunt of pirates who ravaged all the north of Scotland. 
in the maps at the end of the fifteenth and the beginning of the sixteenth century this name is applied to the archipelago of the faroe islands a reasonable indication for Buash has recognized in the present names of the harbors and the islands of the archipelago a considerable number of those given by Zeno. Finally, the facts which we owe to the Venetian navigator about the waters, abounding in fish and dangerous from shallows, which divide this archipelago, are still true at the present day satisfied with his position zeno wrote to his brother antonio to come and join him while sinclair was conquering the faroe islands the norwegian pirates desolated the shetland islands then called eastland nicolo set sail to give them battle but was himself obliged to fly before their fleet much more numerous than his own and to take refuge on a small island on the coast of iceland after wintering in this place zeno must have landed the following year in the eastern coast of greenland at sixty nine degrees north latitude in a place where was a monastery of the order of preaching friars and a church dedicated to saint thomas the cells were warmed by a natural spring of hot water which the monks used to prepare their food and bake their bread the monks had also gardens covered over in the winter season and warmed by the same means, so that they were able to produce flowers, fruits, and herbs, as well as if they lived in a mild climate. There would seem to be some confirmation of these narratives in the fact that between the years 1828 to 1830, a captain of the Danish navy met with a population of 600 individuals at 69 degrees north latitude of a purely European type. But these adventurers travels in countries of which the climate was so different from that of venice proved fatal to zeno who died a short time after his return to frisland an old sailor who had returned with the venetian and who said had been for many long years a prisoner in the countries of the extreme west gave to sinclair such precise and tempting details of the fertility and the extent of these regions that the latter resolved to attempt their conquest with antonio zeno who had rejoined his brother but the inhabitants showed themselves everywhere so hostile and opposed such resistance to the stranger's landing that sinclair after a long and dangerous voyage was obliged to return to frisland these are all the details that have been left to us and they make us deeply regret the loss of those that antonio should have furnished in his letters to the father carlo on the subject of the countries which forster and malto brun have thought may be identified with newfoundland who knows if in his voyage to england and during his wanderings as far as thule Christopher Columbus may not have heard mention the ancient expeditions of the North men and the Zeni, and if this information may not have appeared to him a strange confirmation of the theories of which he held, and of the ideas of whose realization he came to claim the protection of the King of England. From the collection of facts which have been there briefly given, it follows that America was known to Europeans and had been colonized before the time of Columbus, but in consequence of various circumstances, and foremost among these must be placed the rarity of communication between the people in the north of Europe and those in the south, discoveries made by the north men when only vaguely known in Spain and Portugal. Judging by the appearance we of the present day know much more on this subject than did the fellow countrymen and the contemporaries of columbus if the genoa marina had been informed of the existence of some rumours he classed them with this information he had collected in the cape de word islands and his classical recollections of the famous island of antilia and the atlantides of plato from this information which came from so many different sides the certainty awoke with him that the east should be reached by the western route however it may be his glory remains whole and entire he is really the discoverer of america and not those who were carried thither in spite of themselves by chances of wind and storm and without their having any intention of reaching the shores of asia which christopher columbus would have done had not the way been barred by america the information that we are about to give on the family of Corterio, although it may be much more complete than which can be met 
with in biographical dictionaries is still extremely vague nevertheless we must content ourselves with it for up to this time history has not collected further details concerning this race of intrepid navigators jean was couturier was a natural son of a gentleman named vasco on the costa who had received the sobriquet of couturier from the king of portugal on account of the magnificence of his house and followers devoted like so many other gentlemen of this period to seafaring adventure jawas had carried off in galicia a young girl named maria de abarca who became his wife after having been gentlemen ushered to the infant don fernando he was sent by the king of the north atlantic with alvaro martin's omen the two navigators saw an island known from this time by the name of terra do Basilaus, the land of codfish which must really have been newfoundland the date of this discovery is approximately fixed by the fact that on their return they landed at Tercera, and finding the captainship vacant by the death of jacome de bruges they went to ask for it from the infanta dona brids the widow of the infante dona fernando she bestowed it upon them on condition that they would divide it between them a fact which is confirmed by a deed of gift dated from evora the second of april fourteen sixty four though one cannot guarantee the authenticity of this discovery of america it is nevertheless an certain fact that courtierial's voyage must have been signalized by some extraordinary event donations of such importance as this were only made to those who had rendered some great service to the crown when was courtierial was settled at to syria from fourteen ninety to fourteen ninety seven he caused a fine palace to be built in the town of angra where he lived with his three children his third son gaspard after having been in the service of king emmanuel when the latter was only duke de Bourgeois, had felt himself attracted while still young to the enterprises of discovery which had rendered his father illustrious by an act dated from Sintra, the 12th of March, 1500, King Emmanuel made a gift to Gaspard Couturier of any islands or terra firma which he might discover, and the king added this valuable information that already and at other times he had sought for them on his own account and at his own expense. For Gaspard Couturier, this was not his first essay. Probably his researches may have been directed to the parts where his father had discovered the island of Code. At his own expense, although with the assistance of the king, Gaspard Couturier fitted out two vessels at the commencement of the summer of 1500, and after having touched at Tessaria, he sailed towards the northwest. His first discovery was of a land of which the fertile and the verdant aspect seems to have charmed him this was canada he saw there a great river bearing ice along with it on its coast the st lawrence which some of his companions mistook for an arm of the sea and to which he gave the name of rio navarro its volume is so considerable that it is not probable that is this country is an island besides it must be completely covered with a very thick coating of snow to produce such a stream of water the houses in this country were of wood and covered with skins and furs the inhabitants were unacquainted with iron but used swords made of sharpened stones and their arrows were tipped with fish bones or stones tall and well made their faces and bodies were painted in different colors according to taste they wore golden and copper bracelets and dressed themselves in garments of fur Coterial pursued his voyage and arrived at the cape of Bacalaos fishes which were found in such great quantities upon this coast that they hindered the advance of the caravels then he followed the shore for a stretch of six hundred miles from fifty six degrees to sixty degrees or even more naming the islands the rivers and the gulfs that he met with as is proved by terra do labrador bahia de Concisao, and the landing and holding intercourse with the natives severe cold and a veritable river of gigantic blocks of ice prevented the expedition from going farther north and it returned to portugal bringing bath with it fifty-seven natives 
the very year of his return on the fifteenth of may fifteen o one gaspard cotirio in pursuance of an order of the fifteenth of april received provisions and left lisbon in the hope of extending the field of his discoveries from this time he is never again mentioned michael cotirio his brother who was the first gentleman usher to the king then requested and obtained permission to go and seek his brother and to pursue his enterprise by an act of the fifteenth of january fifteen o two a deed of gift conveyed to him the half of the terra firma and the islands which his brother might have discovered setting out on the tenth of may of this year with three vessels michael cotirio reached newfoundland where he divided his little squadron so that each of the vessels might explore the coast separately while he fixed the place of rendezvous but at the time fixed he did not reappear and the two other vessels after waiting for him till the twentieth of august set out on their return to portugal in fifteen o three the king sent two caravels to try to obtain news of the two brothers but the search was in vain and they returned without having acquired any information when vasco ans the last of the brothers cotirio who was captain and the governor of the islands of st george and terceria and alcade more of the town of tavilla became acquainted with these sad events he resolved to fit out a vessel at his own cost and to go and search for his brothers the king however would not allow him to go fearing to lose the last of this race of good servants upon the maps of this period canada is often indicated by the name of terra de cotirials a name which is sometimes extended much further south embracing a great part of north america end of second part chapter three part one a Section 35 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 3, Part 1b all that concerns john and sebastian cabot has been until recently shrouded by a mist which is not even now completely dissipated notwithstanding the conscientious labors of biddle the american in eighteen thirty one and of our compatriot monsieur de avenzac as also those of mr nicholas the englishman who taking advantage of the discoveries made among the english spanish and venetian archives has built up an imposing monument of which some parts however are open to discussion it is from the last two named works that we shall draw the materials for this rapid sketch, but principally from Mr. Nichols' book, which has this advantage over the smaller volume of Monsieur de Avenzac that it relates the whole life of Sebastian Cabot. It has been found impossible to determine with certainty either the name or the nationality of John Cabot, and still less to settle the period of his birth. John Cabota, Coboto, or Cabot, must have been born, if not in Genoa itself, as M. de Avenzac asserts, at least in the neighborhood of that town, possibly at Castiglione, about the first quarter of the fifteenth century. Some historians have considered that he was an Englishman, and perhaps Mr. Nichols, from national considerations, is inclined to adopt this opinion. At least this seems to be the meaning of the expressions used by him. What we do know, without room for doubt, is that John Cabot came to London to occupy himself with commerce, and that he soon settled at Bristol, then the second town in the kingdom, in one of the suburbs which had received the name of Cathay, probably from the number of Venetians who resided there, and the trade carried on by them with the countries of the extreme east. It was at Bristol that Capet's two youngest children were born, Sebastian and Sancho, if we may rely upon the following account given by the old chronicler Eden. Sebastian Cabot told me that he was born at Bristol, and that at four years of age he went with his father to Venice, returning with him to England some years later. This made people imagine that he was born in Venice. In 1476, John Cabot was at Venice, and there, on the 29th of March, he received letters of naturalization, which proved that he was not a native of this city, and that he must have merited the honor by some service rendered to the Republic. Monsieur de Avanzac is inclined to think that he devoted himself to the study of cosmography and navigation, perhaps even in company with the celebrated Florentine Paul Toscanelli, 
with whose theories upon the distribution of land and sea on the surface of the globe he would certainly be acquainted at this time. He may also have heard mention made of the islands situated in the Atlantic, and known by the names of Antilla, the land of the seven cities, or Brazil. What seems more certain is that his business affairs took him to the Levant, and, it is said, to Mecca, and that while there he would learn from what country came the spices, which then constituted the most important branch of Venetian commerce. Whatever value we may attach to these speculative theories, it is at least certain that John Cabot founded an important mercantile house at Bristol. His son Sebastian, who in these first voyages had acquired an inclination for the sea, studied navigation, as far as it was then known, and made some excursions on the sea, to render himself as familiar with the practice of this art as he already was with its theory. For seven years past, says the Spanish ambassador in a dispatch of the 25th of July, 1498, speaking of an expedition commanded by Cabot, the people of Bristol had fitted out two, three, or four caravels every year to go in search of the island of Brazil, and of the seven cities, according to the ideas of the Genoese. At this time, the whole of Europe resounded with the fame of the discoveries of Columbus. It awoke in me, says Sebastian Cabot, in a narrative preserved by Ramusio, a great desire and a kind of ardor in my heart to do myself also something famous, and knowing by examining the globe that if I sailed by the west wind I should reach India more rapidly, I at once made my project known to His Majesty, who was much satisfied with it. The king to whom Cabot addressed himself was the same Henry the Seventh, who, some years before, had refused all support to Christopher Columbus. It is evident that he received with favor the project which John and Sebastian Cabot had just submitted to him, and though Sebastian, in the fragment which we have just quoted, attributes to himself alone all the honor of the project, it is no less true that his father was the promoter of the enterprise, as the following charter shows, which we translate in an abridged form. We, Henry, preserve our much-beloved Jehan Cabot, citizen of Venice, and Luis, Sebastian, and Sancho, his sons, under our flag, and with five vessels of the tonnage and crew which they shall judge suitable to discover at their own expense and charge. We grant to them as well as to their heirs and assigns license to occupy, possess, at the charge of, by them, upon the profits, benefits, and advantages accruing from this navigation, to pay us in merchandise or in money the fifth part of the profit thus obtained for each of their voyages, every time that they shall return to the port of Bristol, at which port they shall be compelled to land. We promise and guarantee to them, their heirs and assigns, that they shall be exempt from all custom-house duties on the merchandise which they shall bring from the countries thus discovered. We command and direct all our subjects, as well on land as on the sea, to render assistance to the same Jehan and to his sons, given at the fifth day of March, 1495. Such was the charter that was granted to John Cabot and his sons upon their return from the American continent, and not, as certain authors have pretended, anterior to this voyage. From the time that the news of the discovery made by Columbus had reached England, that is to say, probably in 1493, John and Sebastian Cabot prepared the expedition at their own expense, and set out at the beginning of the year 1494 with the idea of reaching Cathay, and finally the Indies. There can be no doubt upon this point, for in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris is preserved a unique copy of the map engraved in 1544, that is to say, in the lifetime of Sebastian Cabot, which mentions this voyage and the precise and exact date of the discovery of Cape Breton. It is probable that we must attribute to the intrigues of the Spanish ambassador the delay which occurred in Cabot's expedition, for the whole of the year 1496 passed without the voyage being accomplished. The following year he set out at the beginning of summer. After having again sighted the Terra Buena Vista, he followed the coast, and was not long in perceiving to his great disappointment that it trended towards the north. Then, sailing along it to make sure if I could not find some passage, I could not perceive any, and having advanced as far as fifty-six degrees, and seeing that at this point the land turned towards the east, I despaired of finding any passage, and I was about to examine the coast in this direction towards the equinoctial line, always with the same object of finding a passage to the Indies, and in the end I reached the country now called Florida, where, as provisions were beginning to run short, I resolved to return to England. This narrative, of which we have given the commencement above, was related by Cabot of Forcaster, forty or fifty years after the event. Also, is it not astonishing that Cabot mixes up in it two perfectly distinct voyages, that of 1494 and that of 1497? Let us add some reflections upon this narrative. The first land scene was, without doubt, the North Cape, 
the northern extremity of the island of cape breton and the island which is opposite to it is that of prince edward long known by the name of st john's island cabot probably penetrated in the estuary of the st lawrence which he took for an arm of the sea near to the place where quebec now stands and coasted along the northern shore of the gulf so that he did not see the coast of labrador stretching away in the east he took newfoundland for an archipelago and continued his course to the south not doubtless as far as florida as he states himself the time occupied by the voyage making it impossible that he could have descended so low but as far as the chesapeake bay these were the countries which the spaniards afterwards called terra de Efestam gomez on the third of february fourteen ninety eight king henry the seventh signed at westminster some new letters patent he empowered john cabot or his representative being duly authorized to take in english ports six vessels of two hundred tons burden and to procure all that should be required for their equipment at the same price as if they were for the crown he was allowed to take on board such master mariners pages and other subjects as might of their own accord wish to go and pass with him to the recently discovered lands and islands john cabot bore the expense of the equipment of two vessels and three others were fitted out at the cost of the merchants of bristol in all probability it was death a sudden and unexpected death which prevented john cabot from taking command of this expedition his son sebastian then assumed the direction of the fleet which carried three hundred men and provisions for a year after having sighted land at forty-five degrees sebastian cabot followed the coast as far as fifty-eight degrees perhaps even higher but then it became so cold and although it was the month of july there was so much floating ice about that it would have been impossible to go further northwards the days were very long and the nights excessively light an interesting detail by which to fix the latitude reached for we know that below the sixtieth parallel of latitude the longest days are eighteen hours these various reasons make sebastian cabot decide to put about and he touched at the Balacos islands of which the inhabitants who were clothed in the skins of animals were armed with bows and arrows lance javelin and wooden sword the navigators here caught a great number of codfish they were even so numerous says an old narrative that they hindered ships from advancing after having sailed along the coast of america as far as thirty-eight degrees cabot set out for england where he arrived at the beginning of autumn this voyage had indeed a threefold object that of discovery commerce and colonization as is shown by the number of vessels which took part in it and the strength of their crews nevertheless it does not appear that cabot landed any one or that he made any attempts at forming a settlement either in labrador or in hudson's bay which he was destined to explore more completely in fifteen seventeen in the reign of henry the eighth or even to the south of the Bocos, known by the general name of newfoundland at the close of this expedition which was almost entirely unproductive we lose sight of sebastian cabot if not completely at least so as to be insufficiently informed about his deeds and voyages until fifteen seventeen the traveller hoyeda whose various enterprises we have related above had left spain in the month of may fourteen ninety nine we know that in this voyage he met with an englishman at cocobaco on the coast of america can this have been cabot nothing has come to light to enable us to settle this point but we may believe that cabot did not remain idle and that he would be likely to undertake some fresh expedition what we know is that in spite of the solemn engagements he had made with cabot the king of england granted certain privileges of trading in the countries which he had discovered to the portuguese and to the merchants of bristol this ungenerous manner of recognizing his services wounded the navigator and decided him to accept the offers which had been made to him on different occasions to enter the spanish service from the death of Vespucius, which happened in 1512, Cabot was the navigator held in most renown. To attach him to himself, Ferdinand wrote on the 13th of September, 1512, to Lord Willoughby, commander-in-chief of the troops which had been transported to Italy, to treat with the Venetian navigator. As soon as he arrived in Castile, Cabot received the rank of captain by an edict dated the 20th of October, 1512, with the salary of 5,000 maravedis. Seville was fixed upon for his residence until an opportunity might arise of turning his talents and expedition to account. There was a plan on foot for his taking the command of a very important expedition, when Ferdinand, the Catholic, died on the 23rd of January, 1516. Cabot returned at once to England, probably having obtained a leave of absence. Eden tells us that the following year Cabot was appointed with Sir Thomas Pert to the command of a fleet which was to reach China by the northwest. On the 11th of June, he was in Hudson's Bay at 67.5 degrees of latitude, the sea free from ice spread itself out before him so far that he reckoned upon success for his enterprise when the faint-heartedness of his companion together with the cowardice and mutinous spirit of the crews who refused to go any further obliged him to return to england in his theratum obest terrarum 
Ortelius traces the shape of Hudson's Bay as it really is. He even indicates at its northern extremity a strait leading northwards. How can the geographer have attained such exactness? Who, says Mr. Nichols, can have given him the information set forth in his map, if not Cabot? On his return to England, Cabot found the country ravaged by a horrible plague, which put a stop even to commercial transactions. Soon, either because the time of his leave had expired, or that he wished to escape from the pestilence, or that he was recalled to Spain, the Venetian navigator returned to that country. In 1518, on the 5th of February, Cabot was made pilot major, with a salary which, added to that which he already had, made a total of 125,000 maravedas, say, 300 ducats. He did not actually exercise the function of his office until Charles V returned from England. His principal duty consisted in examining pilots who were not allowed to go to the Indies until after having passed this exam. This epoch was by no means favorable to great maritime expeditions. The struggle between France and Spain absorbed all the resources both in men and money of these two countries. Cabot, too, who seems to have adopted science for his fatherland much more than any particular country, made some overtures to Contarini, the ambassador of Venice, to take service on board the fleets of the Republic. But when the favorable answer of the Council of Ten arrived, he had other projects in his head, and did not carry his attempt any further. In the month of April, 1524, Cabot presided at a conference of mariners and cosmographers, which met at Badajoz, to discuss the question whether the Moluccas belonged, according to the celebrated Treaty of Cordesillas, to Spain or Portugal. On the 31st of May, it was decided that the Moluccas were within the Spanish waters by 20 degrees. Perhaps this resolution of the Junta, of which Cabot was president, and which again placed in the hands of Spain a great part of the spice trade, was not without its influence upon the resolutions of the Council of the Indies. However this may be, in the month of September of the same year, Cabot was authorized to take the command of three vessels of a hundred tons and a small caravel, carrying together a hundred and fifty men, with the title of Captain General. The declared aim of this voyage was to pass through the Straits of Magellan, carefully to explore the western coast of America, and to reach the Moluccas, where they would take in on their return a cargo of spices. The month of August, 1525, had been fixed upon as the date of departure, but the intrigues of Portugal succeeded in delaying it until April, 1526. Different circumstances seem from this moment to have augured ill for the voyage. Cabot had only a nominal authority, and the association of merchants who had defrayed the expenses of the equipment not accepting him willingly as chief, had found means to oppose all the plans of the Venetian sailor. Thus it was that in place of the man whom he had appointed as second-in-command, another was imposed upon him, and that instructions destined to be unsealed when at sea were delivered to each captain. They contained this absurd agreement, that in case of the death of the captain-general, eleven individuals were to succeed him, each in his turn. Was not this an encouragement given to assassination? Scarcely was the fleet out of sight of land, when discontent appeared. The rumor spread that the captain-general was not equal to his task. Then, as they saw that these calumnies did not affect him, they pretended that the flotilla was already short of provisions. The mutiny broke out as soon as land was reached, but Cabot was not the man to allow himself to be annihilated by it. He had suffered too much from Sir Thomas's pert cowardice to bear such an insult. In order to nip the evil in the bud, he had the mutinous captain seized, and notwithstanding their reputation and the brilliancy of their past services, he made them get into a boat and abandoned them on shore. Four months afterwards they had the good luck to be picked up by a Portuguese expedition, which seems to have had orders to thwart the plans of Cabot. The Venetian navigator then penetrated into the Rio de la Plata, the exploration of which had been commenced by his predecessor, the pilot Major de Solis. The expedition was not then composed of more than two vessels, one having been lost during the voyage. Cabot sailed up the Argent River, and discovered an island which he called Francis Gabriel, and upon which he built the fort of San Salvador, and trusting the command of it to Antonio de la Gaia. Cabot had the keel removed from one of his caravels, and with it, being towed by his small boats, entered the Piranha, built a new fort at the confluence of the Carmacaraja and Tercertio, and, after having thus secured his line of retreat, he pursued the course of these rivers further into the interior. Arriving at the confluence of the Piranha and the Paraguay, he followed the second, the direction of which agreed best with his project of reaching the region of the west where silver was to be obtained. But it was not long before the aspect of the country changed, and the attitude of the inhabitants altered also. Until now, they had collected in crowds, astonished at the sight of the vessels. But upon the cultivated shores of the Paraguay, they courageously opposed the stranger's landing, and three Spaniards, having tried to knock down the fruit from a palm tree, a struggle took place, in which three hundred natives lost their lives. This victory had disabled twenty-five Spaniards. It was too much for Cabot, 
who rapidly removed his wounded to the Fort San Spirito and retired, still presenting a bull's front to the enemy. Cabot had already sent two of his companions to the Emperor, to acquaint him with the attempt at revolt of the captains, to explain to him the motives which have obliged him to modify the course marked out for his voyage, and to request aid for him, both in men and provisions. The answer arrived at last. The Emperor approved what Cabot had done, and ordered him to colonize the country in which he had just made a settlement, but did not send him either one man or a single Maravedi. Cabot tried to procure the resources which he needed in the country, and caused some attempts at cultivation to be commenced. At the same time, to keep his troops in exercise, he reduced the neighboring nations to obedience, had some forts built, and again sailing up the Paraguay, he reached Potsi, the watercourses of the Andes which feed the basin of the Atlantic. At last he prepared to enter Peru, from whence came the gold and silver which he had seen in the possession of the natives, but it needed more troops than he could muster to attempt the conquest of this vast region. The emperor, however, was quite unable to send many. His European wars absorbed all his resources. The Cortes refused to vote new subsidies, and the Moluccas had just been pledged to Portugal. In this state of affairs, after having occupied the country for five years, and waited all this time for the assistance which never came, Cabot decided to evacuate a part of his settlements, and he returned with some of his people to Spain. The rest, amounting to 120 men who were left to guard the fort of San Spirito, after many vicissitudes which cannot be related here, perished by the hands of the Indians, or were obliged to take refuge in the Portuguese settlements on the coast of Brazil. It is to the horses imported by Cabot that is due the wonderful race of wild horses which may be seen in large troops on the pampas of La Plata at the present day. This was the only result of the expedition. Some time after his return to Spain, Cabot resigned his office and went to Bristol, where he settled about 1548, that is to say, at the beginning of the reign of Edward the Sixth. What were the motives of this fresh change? Was Cabot discontented at having been left to his own resources during the expedition? Was he hurt at the manner in which his services were recompensed? It is impossible to say. But Charles V took advantage of Cabot's departure to deprive him of his pension, which Edward the Sixth hastened to replace, causing him to receive 250 marks annually, about 116 pounds and a fraction, which was a considerable sum for that period. The post which Cabot occupied in England seems to be best expressed by the name of Intendant of the Navy. Under the authority of the King and Council, he appears to have superintended all maritime affairs. He issues licenses, he examines pilots, he frames instructions, he draws maps, a varied and complicated function for which he has possessed the rare gift of both practical and theoretical knowledge. At the same time, he instructed the young king in cosmography, explained to him the variation of the compass, and was successful in interesting him in nautical matters and in the glory resulting from maritime discoveries. It was a high and almost unique situation. Cabot used it to put into execution a project which he had long cherished. At this period, we might almost say that there was no trade in England. All commerce was in the hands of the Hanseatic towns, Antwerp, Hamburg, Brenham, etc. These companies of merchants had, on various occasions, obtained considerable reductions in import duties, and had ended up by monopolizing the English trade. Cabot held that Englishmen possessed as good qualifications as these merchants for becoming manufacturers, and that the already powerful navy which England possessed might assist marvelously in the export of the products of the soil and of the manufacturers. What was the use of having recourse to strangers when people could do their own business? If they had been unable up to this time to reach Cathay and India by the northwest, might they not endeavor to reach it by the northeast? And if they did not succeed, would they not find in this direction more commercial and more civilized people than the miserable Eskimos on the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland? Cabot assembled some leading London merchants, laid his projects before them, and formed them into an association, of which on the 14th of December, 1551, he was named president for life. At the same time, he exerted himself most vigorously with the king, and after having made him understand the wrong which the monopoly enjoyed by strangers did to his own subjects, he obtained its abolition on the 23rd of February, 1551, and inaugurated the practice of free trade. The Association of English Merchants, under the name of Merchant Adventurers, hastened to have some vessels built, adapted to the difficulties to be encountered in the navigation of the Arctic regions. The first improvement which the English marine owed to Cabot was the sheathing of the keels, which he had done in Spain, but which had not hitherto been practiced in England. A flotilla of three vessels was assembled at Deptford. They were the Buena Speranza, of which the command was given to Sir Hugh Willoughby, a brave gentleman who had earned a high reputation in war, the Buena Confidencia, Captain Cornwall Dortenforth, and the Bonaventure, Captain Richard Chancellor, a clever sailor, and a particular friend of Cabot's, he received the title of Pilot Major. The sailing master of the Bonaventure was Stephen Burrow, an accomplished mariner, who was destined to make numerous voyages in the North Seas, 
and later to become pilot-in-chief for England. Although age and its important duties prevented Cabot from placing himself at the head of the expedition, he wished at least to preside over all the details of the equipment. He himself wrote out the instructions which have been preserved, and which prove the prudence and skill of this distinguished navigator. He there recommends the use of the log line, an instrument intended to measure the speed of the vessel, and he desires that the journal of events happening at sea be kept with regularity, and that all information as to the character, manners, habits, and resources of the people visited, and the productions of the country, may be recorded in writing. The sailors were to offer no violence to the natives, but to act towards them with courtesy. All blasphemy and swearing was to be punished with severity, and also drunkenness. The religious exercises are prescribed, prayers are to be said morning and evening, and the holy scriptures are to be read once in the day. Cabot ends by recommending union and concord above all, and reminds the captains of the greatness of their enterprise, and the honor which they might hope to gain. Finally, he promises them to add his prayers to theirs, for the success of their common work. The squadron set sail on the 20th of May, 1558, in presence of the court assembled at Greenwich, amid an immense concourse of people, after fetes and rejoicing, at which the king, who was ill, could not be present. Near the Lufton Islands, on the coast of Norway, at the bearing of Wadwos, the squadron was separated from the Bonaventure. Carried away by the storm, Willoughby's two vessels touched, without doubt, at Nova Zembla, and were forced by the ice to return southward. On the 18th of September, they entered the port formed by the mouth of the river Arnza in East Lapland. Some time afterwards, the Bueno Convenencia, separated from Willoughby by a fresh tempest, returned to England. As to the latter, some Russian fishermen found his vessel the following year in the midst of the ice. The whole crew had died of cold. This, at least, is what we are led to suppose from the journal kept by the unfortunate Willoughby up to the month of January, 1554. Chancellor, after having waited in vain for his two consorts at the rendezvous which had been agreed upon in case of separation, thought they must about sailed him, and rounding the North Cape, he entered a vast gulf which was none other than the White Sea. He then landed at the mouth of Duena, near the monastery of St. Nicholas, on the spot upon which the town of Archangel was soon to stand. The inhabitants of these desolate places told him that the country was under the dominion of the Grand Duke of Russia. Chancellor resolved at once to go to Moscow, in spite of the enormous distance which separated him from it. The Tsar then on the throne was Ivan IV, Vesuvelevich, called the Terrible. For some time before this, the Russians had shaken off the Tartar yoke, and Ivan had united all the petty rival principalities in one body politic, of which the power was already becoming considerable. The situation of Russia, exclusively continental, far from any frequented sea, isolated from the rest of Europe, of which it did not yet form part, so much were its habits and manners still Asiatic, promised success to Chancellor. The Tsar, who up to this time had not been able to procure European merchandise, except by way of Poland, and who wished to gain access to the German seas, saw with pleasure the attempts of the English to establish trade which would be beneficial to both parties. He not only received Chancellor courteously, but he made him most advantageous offers, granted him great privileges, and encouraged him, by the kindness of his reception, to repeat his voyage. Chancellor sold his merchandise to great advantage, and after taking on board another cargo of furs, of seal and whale oils, copper and other products, returned to England, carrying a letter from the Tsar. The advantages which the company of merchant adventurers had derived from this first voyage encouraged them to attempt a second. So Chancellor, the following year, made a fresh voyage to Archangel, and took two of the company's agents to Russia, who concluded an advantageous treaty with the Tsar. Then he set out again for England, with an ambassador and his suite, sent by Ivan to Great Britain. Of the four vessels which composed the flotilla, one was lost on the coast of Norway, another as it left Rontheim, and the Bonadventure, on board which were Chancellor and the Ambassador, founded in the Bay of Fitzligo, on the east coast of Scotland, on the 10th of November, 1556. Chancellor was drowned in the wreck, being less fortunate than the Muscovite Ambassador, who had the good luck to escape, but the presents and merchandise which he was carried to England were lost. Such was the commencement of the Anglo-Russian Company. A goodly number of expeditions succeeded each other in those parts, but it would be beside our purposes to give an account of them. Let us now return to Cabot. It was in 1554 that Queen Mary of England was married to Philip II, King of Spain. When the latter came to England, he showed himself very ill-disposed towards Cabot, who had abandoned the service of Spain, and who, at this very moment, was procuring for England a commerce which would soon immensely increase the maritime power of an already formidable country. Thus we are not surprised to learn that eight days after the landing of the King of Spain, Cabot was forced to resign his office and his pension, both of which had been bestowed upon him for life by Edward the Sixth. Worthington was nominated in his place. Mr. Nichols thinks that this dishonorable man, who had some quarrels with the law, 
had a secret mission to seize among Cabot's plans, maps, instructions, and projects, those which could be of use to Spain. The fact is that all these documents are now lost, at least unless they may yet be discovered among the archives of Simancas. At the end of this period, history completely loses sight of the old mariner. The same mystery which hangs over his birth also envelopes the place and date of his death. His immense discoveries, his cosmographical works, his study of the variations of the magnetic needle, his wisdom, his humane disposition, and his honorable conduct, place Sebastian Cabot in the foremost rank among discoverers. A figure lost in the shadow and vagueness of legend until our own day, Cabot owes it to his biographers, to Biddle, de Vanzac, and Nichols, that he is now better known, more highly appreciated, and for the first time really placed in the light. End of the Second Part Chapter 3, Part 1, B Recording by Todd Section 36 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 3, Part 2a Polar Expeditions From 1492 to 1524, France had stood aloof, officially at least, from enterprises of discovery and colonization. But Francis I could not look on quietly while the power of his rival, Charles V, received a large addition by the conquest of Mexico. He therefore ordered John Verrazzano, a Venetian who was in his service, to make a voyage of exploration. We will pause here for a short time. Although the various places may have already been visited on several occasions, because for the first time the banner of France floats over the shores of the New World, this exploration, besides, was to prepare the way for those of Jacques Cartier and of Champlain in Canada as well as for the unlucky experiments in colonization of Jean Ribot and of La Daunière, the sanguinary voyages of reprisals of Gourgues and Villegagnon's attempt at a settlement in Brazil. We possess no biographical details with regard to Verzano. Under what circumstances did he enter the service of France? Was his title to the command of such an expedition? Nothing is known of the Venetian traveller for all we possess of his writings is the Italian translation of his French report to Francis I, published in the collection of Ramusio. The French translation of this Italian translation exists in an abridged form in Lescarbot's work on New France, and in the Histoire des Voyages. For our very rapid epitome, we shall make use of the Italian text of Ramusio, except in some passages where Lescarbot's translation has appeared to give an idea of the rich, original, and marvelously modulated language of the sixteenth century. Having set out with four vessels to make discoveries in the ocean, says Verzano in a letter written from Dieppe to Francis I on 8th July 1524, he was forced by a storm to take refuge in Brittany, with two of his vessels, the Dauphine and the Normand, there to repair damages. Thence he set sail for the coast of Spain, where he seems to have given chase to some Spanish vessels. We see him leave the Dauphine alone on the 17th of January, 1524, a small uninhabited island in the neighborhood of Madeira, and launch himself upon the ocean with a crew of fifty men well furnished with provisions and ammunition for an eight months voyage. Twenty-five days later he has made fifteen hundred miles to the west, when he is assailed by a fearful storm, and twenty-five days afterwards, that is to say on the eighth or ninth of March, having made about twelve hundred miles, he discovers land at thirty degrees north latitude, which he thought had never been previously explored. When we arrived, it seemed to us to be very low, but on approaching, within a quarter of a league, we saw, by the great fires which were lighted among the harbors and borders of the sea, that it was inhabited, 
and in taking trouble to find a harbour in which to land and make acquaintance with the country, we sailed more than one hundred and fifty miles in vain, so that seeing the coast trended ever southwards, we decided to turn back again. The Frenchmen, finding a favourable landing place, perceived a number of natives who came towards them, but who fled away when they saw them land. Soon recalled by the friendly signs and demonstrations of the French, they showed a great surprise at their clothes, their faces, and the whiteness of their skin. The natives were entirely naked, except that the middle of the body was covered with sable skins, hung from a narrow girdle of prettily woven grasses, and ornamented with tails of other animals, which fell to their knees. Some wore crowns of bird's feathers. They have brown skins, says the narrative, and are exactly like the Saracens. Their hair is black, not very long, and tied at the back of the head, in the form of a small tail. Their limbs are well proportioned. They are of middle height, although a little taller than ourselves, and have no other defect beyond their faces being rather broad. They are not strong, but they are agile, and some of the greatest and quickest runners in the world. It was impossible for Verzano to collect any details about the manners and mode of life of these people, on account of the short time that he remained among them. The shore at this place was composed of fine sand, interspersed here and there with little sandy hillocks, behind which were scattered groves and very thick forests, which were wonderfully pleasant to look upon. There were in this country, as far as we could judge, abundance of stags, fallow deer and hares, numerous lakes, and streams of sparkling water, as well as a quantity of birds. This land lies at thirty-four degrees. It is therefore the part of the United States, which now goes by the name of Carolina. The air there is pure and salubrious, the climate temperate, the sea is entirely without rocks, and, in spite of the want of harbors, it is not unfavorable for navigators. During the whole month of March, the French sailed along the coast, which seemed to them to be inhabited by a numerous population. The want of water forced them to land several times, and they perceived that the savages were most pleased with mirrors, bells, knives, and sheets of paper. One day they sent a longboat ashore with twenty-five men in it. A young sailor jumped into the water, because he could not land on account of the waves and currents in order to give some small articles to these people, and having thrown to them from a distance because he was distrustful of the natives, he was cast violently on shore by the waves. The Indians, seeing him in this condition, take him and carry him far away from the sea, to the great dismay of the poor sailor, who expected they were about to sacrifice him. Having placed him at the foot of a little hill, in the full blaze of the sun, they stripped him quite naked, and wondered at the whiteness of his skin. Then, lighting a large fire, they made him come to it, and recover his strength. And it was then that the poor young man, as well as those who were in the boat, thought that the Indians were about to massacre and immolate him, roasting his flesh in this large brazier, and then eating their victim, as do the cannibals. But it happened quite differently, for having shown a desire to return to the boat, they reconducted him to the edge of the sea, and having kissed him very lovingly, they retired to a hill to see him re-enter the boat. Continuing to follow the shore northwards for more than one hundred and fifty miles, the Frenchmen reached a land which seemed to them more beautiful, being covered with thick woods. Into these forests twenty men penetrated for more than six miles, and only returned to the shore from the fear of losing themselves. In this walk, having met two women, one young and the other old, with some children, they seized one of the latter, who might be about eight years old, with the idea of taking him away to France. But they could not do the same with the young woman, who began to cry with all her might, calling for aid from her compatriots, who were hidden in the wood. In this place the savages were whiter than any of those hitherto met. They snared birds, and used a bow of very hard wood, and arrows tipped with fish bones. Their canoes, twenty feet long and four feet wide, were hollowed by fire out of the trunk of a tree. 
wild vines abounded and climbed over the trees in long festoons as they do in lombardy with a little civilization they would no doubt produce excellent wine for the fruit is sweet and pleasant like ours and we thought that the natives were not insensible to it for in all directions where these vines grew they had taken care to cut away the branches of the surrounding trees so that the fruit might ripen wild roses lilies violets and all kinds of odiferous plants and flowers new to the europeans carpeted the ground everywhere and filled the air with sweet perfumes after remaining for three days in this enchanting place the frenchmen continued to follow the coast northwards sailing by day and casting anchor at night as the land trended towards the east they went one hundred and fifty miles further in that direction and discovered an island of triangular shape about thirty miles distant from the continent similar in size to the island of rhodes and upon which they bestowed the name of the mother of francis i louisa of savoy then they reached another island forty-five miles off which possessed a magnificent harbour and of which the inhabitants came in crowds to visit the strange vessels two kings especially were of fine stature and great beauty they were dressed in deerskins with the head bare the hair carried back and tied in a tuft and they wore on the neck a large chain ornamented with coloured stones this was the most remarkable nation which they had until now met with the women are graceful says the narrative published by ramusio some wore the skins of the lynx on their arms their head was ornamented with their plaited hair and long plates hung down on both sides of the chest others had headdresses which were called those of the egyptian and syrian women only the elderly women and those who were married wore pendants in their ears of worked copper this land is situated on the same parallel as rome in forty one degrees forty minutes but its climate is much colder on the fifth of may verrazzano left this port and sailed along the sea shore for four hundred and fifty miles at last he reached a country of which the inhabitants resembled but little any of those whom he had hitherto met with they were so wild that it was impossible to carry on any trade with them or any sustained intercourse what they had appeared to esteem above everything else were fish-hooks knives and all articles of metal attaching no value to all the trifling baubles which up to this time had served for barter twenty-five armed men landed and advanced from four to six miles into the interior of the country they were received by the natives with flights of arrows after which the latter retired into the immense forests which appeared to cover the whole country one hundred and fifty miles further on spreads out a vast archipelago composed of thirty-two islands all near the land separated by narrow canals which reminded the venetian navigator of the archipelagos which in the adriatic border the coasts of scalvonia and dalmatia at length four hundred and fifty miles further on in latitude fifty degrees the french came to lands which had been previously discovered by the bretons finding themselves then short of provisions and having reconnoitred the coast of america for a distance of two thousand one hundred miles they returned to france and disembarked safely at dieppe in the month of july fifteen twenty four some historians relate that verrazzano was made prisoner by the savages who inhabit the coast of labrador and was eaten by them a fact which is simply impossible since he addressed from dieppe to francis i the account of his voyage which we have just abridged besides the indians of these regions were not anthropophagi certain authors but we have not been able to discover on the authority of what documents nor under what circumstances this happened relate that verrazzano having fallen into the power of the spaniards had been taken to spain and there hanged it is much wiser to admit that we know nothing certain about verrazzano and that we are totally ignorant what rewards his long voyage procured for him perhaps when some learned man shall have looked through our archives of which the abstract and inventory are far from being finished he may recover some new documents but for the present we must confine ourselves to the narrative of ramusio ten years later a captain of st malo named jacques cartier born on the twenty first of december fourteen eighty four 
conceived the project of establishing a colony in the northern part of America. Being favorably received by Admiral Philippe de Chabot and by Francis I, who asked to see the clause in Adams's will which disinherited him of the New World in favor of the kings of Spain and Portugal, Cartier left Saint-Malo with two vessels on the 20th of April, 1534. The vessel which carried him weighed only sixty tons, and carried a crew of sixty-one men. At the end of only twenty days, so favorable was the voyage, Cartier discovered Newfoundland at Cape Bonavista. He then went northwards, as far as Bird Island, which he found surrounded by ice, all broken up and melting, but on which he was able nevertheless to lay in a stock of five or six tons of guillemot, puffins, and penguins, without reckoning those which were eaten fresh. He then explored all the coast of the island, which at this time bore a number of Breton names, thus proving the assiduous manner in which the French frequented these shores. Then, penetrating into the Strait of Belle Isle, which separates the continent from the island of Newfoundland, Cartier arrived at the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Along the whole of this coast the harbors are excellent. If the land only corresponded to the goodness of the harbors, says the St. Malo sailor, it would be a great blessing, but one ought not call it itland. It is rather pebbles and savage rocks, and places fit for wild beasts. As for all the land towards the north, I never saw as much earth there as would fill a tumbrel. After having coasted along the continent, Cartier was cast by a tempest upon the west coast of Newfoundland, where he explored Cape Royal and Cape Milk, the Columba Islands, Cape St. Jean, the Magdalen Islands, and the Bay of Miramichi, on the continent. In this place he had some intercourse with the savages, who showed a great and marvellous eagerness in the acquisition of iron tools and other things, always dancing and performing various ceremonies, among others throwing sea-water on their heads with their hands. So well did they receive us that they gave us all that they had, keeping back nothing. The next day the number of the savages was even greater, and our French sailors made an ample harvest of furs and skins of animals. After having explored the Bay of Chaleur, Cartier arrived at the entrance of the estuary of the St. Lawrence, where he saw some natives who possessed neither the appearance nor the language of the first. The latter may truly be called savages, for no poorer people can be found in the world. And I think that all put together, excepting their boats and their nets, they could not have had the value of two pence halfpenny. They have the head entirely shaved, with the exception of a lock of hair on the very top, which they allow to grow as long as a horse's tail, and which they fasten upon the head with some small copper needles. Their only dwelling is underneath their boats, which they overturn and then stretch themselves on the ground beneath them without any covering. After having planted a large cross in this place, Jacques Cartier obtained the chief's permission to take away with him two of his children, whom he was to bring back again on his next voyage. Then he set out again for France, and landed at Saint-Malo on the 5th of September, 1534. The following year, on the 19th of May, Cartier left Saint-Malo at the head of a fleet composed of three vessels, called the Grand, and the Petit Hermine, and the Emerillon, on board of which some gentlemen of high rank had taken passages among whom may be named Charles de la Pomarée and Claude de Pombriand, son of the Sieur de Montcavel and cupbearer to the Dauphin. Very soon the squadron was dispersed by the storm, and could not be brought together again until it reached Newfoundland. After having landed at Bird Island in Whitesand Harbour, which is the Castle Bay, Cartier penetrated into the Bay of St. Lawrence. He discovered there the island of Natiscotec, which we call Anticosti, and entered a great river called Hochelega, which leads to Canada. On the banks of this river lies the country called Saugene, whence comes the red copper to which the two savages whom he had taken on his first voyage gave the name of Cacadazé. But before entering the St. Lawrence, Cartier wished to explore the whole gulf, 
to see if no passage existed to the north. He afterwards returned to the Bay of the Seven Islands, went up the river, and soon reached the river of Saguenay, which falls into the St. Lawrence on its northern bank. A little further on, after passing by fourteen islands, he entered the Canadian territories, which no traveller before him had ever visited. The next day the Lord of Canada, called Donacona, with twelve boats and accompanied by sixteen men, approached the ships. When abreast of the smallest of our vessels, he began to make a palaver or preachment in their fashion, while moving his body and limbs in a marvellous manner, which is a sign of joy and confidence. And when he arrived at the flagship, where there were two Indians who had been brought back from France, the said chief spoke to them, and they to him. And they began to relate to him what they had seen in France, and the good treatment which they had received, at which the said chief was very joyful, and begged the captain to give him his arms that he might kiss and embrace him, which is their mode of welcome in this country. The country of Stadacone, or St. Charles, is fertile and full of very fine trees of the same nature and kind as in France, such as oaks, elms, plum trees, yews, cedars, vines, hawthorns, which bear fruit as large as damsons, and other trees. Beneath them grows hemp as good as that of France. Cartier succeeded afterwards in reaching with his boats and his galleon a place which is the Richelieu of the present day, next a great lake formed by the river St. Peter's Lake, and at last he arrived at Hochelega, or Montreal, which is 630 miles from the mouth of the St. Lawrence. In this place are ploughed lands and large and beautiful plains full of the corn of the country, which is like the millet of Brazil, as large or larger than peas, on which they live as we do on wheat. And among these plains is placed and seated the said town of Hochelega, near to and joining on to some high ground which is around the town, and which is well cultivated and quite small. From the top of it one can see very far. We named this mountain Mount Royal. The welcome given to Jacques Cartier could not have been more cordial. The chief, or Agohana, who was crippled in all his limbs, begged the captain to touch them as if he had asked him for a cure. Then the blind and those who were blind in one eye, the lame and the impotent, came and sat down near Jacques Cartier, that he might touch them, so thoroughly were they persuaded that he was a god descended to heal them. The said captain, seeing the faith and piety of this people, recited the gospel of St. John, namely, in Principio, making the sign of the cross over the poor sick people, praying God that he would give them the knowledge of our holy faith and grace to accept Christianity and baptism. Then the said captain took a book of ours and read aloud the passion of our Saviour, so well that all those present could hear it all the poor people being quite silent, looking up to heaven and using the same ceremonies as they saw us use. After making themselves acquainted with the country, which could be seen for ninety miles around from the top of Mount Royal, and having collected some information about the waterfalls and rapids of the St. Lawrence, Jacques Cartier returned towards Canada, where he did not delay to rejoin his ships. We owe to him the first information on tobacco for smoking, which does not seem to have been in use throughout the whole extent of the new world. They have a herb, he says, of which they collect great quantities during the summer for the winter. They esteem it highly, and the men alone use it in the following manner. They dry it in the sun, and carry it on their necks in a small skin of an animal, in the shape of a bag, with a horn of stone or of wood. Then constantly they make the said herb into a powder, and put it into one of the ends of the said horn. They then place a live coal upon it, and blow through the other end, and so fill their body with smoke that it issues from the mouth and nostrils, as if from the shaft of a chimney. We have tried said smoke, but after having put it into our mouths, it seemed as if there were a ground pepper in them, so hot is it. In the month of December, the inhabitants of Staracone were attacked by an infectious disease which proved to be the scurvy. This malady spread so rapidly in our vessels that by the middle of February 
out of our one hundred and ten men there were but ten in good health. Neither prayers, nor orison, nor vows to Our Lady of Rocomador brought any relief. Twenty-five Frenchmen perished up to the 18th of April, and there were not four amongst them who were not attacked by the malady. But at this time a savage chief informed Jacques Cartier that a decoction of the leaves and the sap of a certain tree, probably either the Canadian fir tree or the barberry, was very salutary. As soon as two or three had experienced its beneficial effects, there was a crowding as if they would have killed each other to be the first to get the medicine. And one of the tallest and largest trees I ever saw was used in less than eight days, which had such an effect that if all the doctors of Louvain and Montpellier had been there with all the drugs of Alexandria, they had not done as much in a year as the said tree accomplished in eighty days. Some time after, Cartier, having noticed that Danacona were trying to excite sedition against the French, caused him to be seized as well as nine other savages, that he might take them to France, where they died. He set sail from the harbour of St. Croix on the 6th of May, descended the St. Lawrence, and after a voyage which was not marked by any incident, he landed at St. Malo on the 16th of July, 1536. Francis I, in consequence of the report of this voyage, which the St. Malo captain made to him, resolved to take effective possession of the country. After having appointed François de la Roque, Sieur de Roberval, viceroy of Canada, he caused five vessels to be fitted out, which, being laden with provisions and ammunition for two years, were to transport Roberval and a certain number of soldiers, artisans, and gentlemen to the new colony, which they were about to establish. The five vessels set sail on the 23rd of May, 1541. They met with such contrary winds that it took them three months to reach Newfoundland. Cartier did not arrive at the harbour of St. Croix until the 23rd of August. As soon as he had landed his provisions, he sent back two of his vessels to France, with letters for the king telling him what had been done, also that the Sieur de Roberval had not yet appeared, and that they did not know what had happened to him. Then he had works commenced to clear the land, to build a fort, and to lay the first foundations of the town of Quebec. He next set out for Hochelaga, taking with him Martin de Pampon and other gentlemen, and went to examine the three waterfalls of Saint-Marie, Le Chine, and Saint-Louis. On his return to Saint-Croix, he found Roberval had just arrived. Cartier returned to Saint-Malo in the month of October, 1542, where, probably ten years later, he died. As to the new colony, Roberval, having perished in a second voyage, it vegetated, and was nothing more than a factory until 1608, the date of the foundation of Quebec by Monsieur de Champlain, of whom we shall relate the services and discoveries a little further on. We have just seen how Cartier, who had set out first to seek for the northwest passage, had been led to take possession of the country and to lay the foundations of the colony of Canada. In England, a similar movement had begun set on foot by the writings of Sir Humphrey Gilbert and of Richard Wills. They ended by carrying public opinion with them, and demonstrating that it was not more difficult to find this passage than it had been to discover the Strait of Magellan. One of the most ardent partisans of this search was a bold sailor called Martin Frobisher, who, after having many times applied to rich shipowners, at last found in Ambrose Dudley, Earl of Warwick, the favorite of Queen Elizabeth, a patron whose pecuniary help enabled him to build a pinnace and two poor barks, of from twenty to twenty-five tons burden. It was with means thus feeble that the intrepid navigator went to encounter the ice in localities which had never been visited since the time of Northmen. Setting out from Deptford on the 8th of June, 1576, he sighted the south of Greenland, which he took to be the Frisland of Zeno. Soon stopped by the ice, he was obliged to return to Labrador without being able to land there, and he entered Hudson Straits. After having coasted along Savage and Resolution Islands, he entered a strait which has received his name, but which is also called by some geographers Lunley's Inlet. He landed at Cumberland, took possession of the country in the name of Queen Elizabeth, 
and entered into some relations with the natives. The cold increased rapidly, and he was obliged to return to England. Frobisher only brought back some rather vague scientific and geographical details about the countries which he had visited. He received, however, a most flattering welcome when he showed a heavy black stone in which a little gold was found. At once all imaginations were on fire. Several lords, and the queen herself, contributed to the expense of a new armament, consisting of a vessel of two hundred tons, with a crew of one hundred men, and two smaller barks, which carried six months' provisions both for war and for nourishment. Frobisher had some experienced sailors, Fenson, York, George Best, and C. Hall, under his command. On the 31st of May, 1577, the expedition set sail, and soon sighted Greenland, of which the mountains were covered with snow, and the shores defended by a rampart of ice. The weather was bad. Exceedingly dense fogs, as thick as peace soup, said the English sailors, islands of ice mile and a half in circumference, floating mountains which were sunk seventy or eighty fathoms in the sea, such were the obstacles which prevented Frobisher from reaching, before the ninth of August, the strait which he had discovered during his previous campaign. The English took possession of the country, and pursued both upon land and sea some poor Esquimaux, who, wounded in this encounter, jumped in despair from the top of the rocks into the sea, says Forrester in his Voyages in the North, which would not have happened if they had shown themselves more submissive or if we could have made them understand that we were not their enemies. A great quantity of stones, similar to that which had been brought to England, were soon discovered. They were of gold marcasite, and two hundred tons of this substance was soon collected. In their delight, the English sailors set up a memorial column on a peak to which they gave the name of Warwick Mount, and performed solemn acts of thanksgiving. Frobisher afterwards went ninety miles further on in the same strait, as far as a small island, which received the name of Smith's Island. There the English found two women, of whom they took one with her child, but left the other on account of her extreme ugliness. Suspecting, so much did superstition and ignorance flourish at this time, that this woman had cloven feet, they made her take the coverings off her feet to satisfy themselves that they really were made like their own. Frobisher, now perceiving that the cold was increasing, and wishing to place the treasures which he thought he had collected, in a place of safety, resolved to give up for the present any farther search for the northwest passage. He then set sail for England, where he arrived at the end of September, after weathering a storm which dispersed his fleet. The man, woman, and child who had been carried off were presented to the queen. It is said, with regard to them, that the man, seeing at Bristol Frobisher's trumpeter on horseback, wished to imitate him, and mounted with his face turned towards the tail of the animal. These savages were the objects of much curiosity, and obtained permission from the queen to shoot all kinds of birds, even swans, on the Thames, a thing which was forbidden to everyone else under the most severe penalties. They did not long survive, and died before the child was fifteen months old. People were not slow in discovering that the stones brought back by Frobisher really contained gold. The nation, but above all the higher classes, were immediately seized with a fever bordering on delirium. They had found a Peru, an El Dorado. Queen Elizabeth, in spite of her practical good sense, yielded to the current she resolved to build a fort in the newly discovered country to which she gave the name of Meta Incognita, Unknown Boundary, and to leave there with one hundred men as garrison, under the command of Captains Fenton, Best, and Philpot, three vessels which should take in a cargo of the auriferous stones. These one hundred men were carefully chosen. There were bakers, carpenters, masons, gold refiners, and others belonging to all the various handicrafts. The fleet was composed of fifteen vessels, which set sail from Harwich on the 31st of May, 1578. Twenty days later, the western coast of Frisland were discovered. Whales played around the vessels in innumerable troops. It is related even that one of the vessels, propelled by a favorable wind, 
struck against a whale with such force that the violence of the shock stopped the ship at once, and that the whale, after uttering a loud cry, made a spring out of the water, and then was suddenly swallowed up. Two days later the fleet met with a dead whale, which they thought must be the one struck by the salamander. When Frobisher came to the entrance of the strait, which has received his name, he found it blocked up with floating ice. The bark, Dennis, one hundred tons, says the old account of George Best, received such a shock from an iceberg that she sank in sight of the whole fleet. Following upon this catastrophe, a sudden and horrible tempest arose from the southeast. The vessels were surrounded on all sides by the ice. They left much of it, between which they could pass behind them, and found still more before them, through which it was impossible for them to penetrate. Certain ships, either having found a place less blocked with ice, or one where it was possible to proceed, furled sails and drifted. Of the others, several stopped and cast their anchors upon a great island of ice. The latter were so rapidly enclosed by an infinite number of islets of ice, and fragments of icebergs, that the English were obliged to resign themselves and their ships to the mercy of the ice, and to protect the ships with cables, cushions, mats, boards, and all kinds of articles, which were suspended to the sides, in order to defend them from the fearful shocks and blows of the ice. Frobisher himself was thrown out of his course. Finding the impossibility of rallying his squadron, he sailed along the west coast of Greenland, as far as the strait which was soon to be called Davis's Strait, and penetrated as far as the Countess of Warwick Bay. When he had repaired his vessels with the wood which was to have been used in the building of a dwelling, he loaded the ships with five hundred tons of stones, similar to those which had already been brought home. Judging the season to be then too far advanced, and considering also that the provisions had been either consumed or lost in the Dennis, that the wood for building had been used for repairing the vessels, and having lost forty men, he set out on his return to England on the 31st of August. Tempests and storms accompanied him to the shores of his own country. As to the results of his expedition, there were almost none as to discoveries, and the stones, which he had put on board, in the midst of so many dangers, were valueless. This was the last Arctic voyage in which Frobisher took part. In 1585 we meet with him again as vice-admiral under Drake. In 1588 he distinguished himself against the Invincible Armada. In 1590 he was with Sir Walter Raleigh's fleet on the coast of Spain. Finally, in a descent on the coast of France, he was so seriously wounded that he had only time to bring back his squadron to Portsmouth before he died. If Frobisher's voyages had only gain for their motive, we must put this down not to the navigator himself, but to the passions of the period. And it is not the less true that in difficult circumstances, and with means the insufficiency of which make us smile, he gave proof of courage, talent, and perseverance. To Frobisher is due, in one word, the glory of having shown the route to his countrymen, and of having made the first discoveries in the localities where the English name was destined to render itself illustrious. End of Second Part, Chapter 3, Part 2a Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut Section 37 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 3, Part 2b If it became necessary to abandon the hope of finding in these circumpolar regions countries in which gold abounded as it did in Peru, there was no ground for not continuing to seek there for a passage to China, an opinion supported by very skilful sailors, and one which found many adherents among the merchants of London. By the aid of several high personages, 
two ships were equipped, the Sunshine of fifty tons burden, carrying a crew of twenty-three in number, and the Moonshine of thirty-five tons. They quitted Portsmouth on the 7th of June, 1585, under the command of John Davis. Davis discovered the entrance of the strait which received his name, and was obliged to cross immense fields of drifting ice, after having reassured his crew, who were frightened while in the midst of a dense fog, by the dash of the icebergs and the splitting of the blocks of ice. On the 20th July, Davis discovered the land of desolation, but without being able to disembark upon it. Nine days later he entered Gilbert Bay, where he found a peaceable population, who gave him sealskins and furs in exchange for some trifling articles. These natives, some days afterwards, arrived in such numbers that there were not less than thirty-seven canoes around Davis's vessels. In this place the navigator perceived an enormous quantity of driftwood, amongst which he mentions an entire tree, which could not have been less than sixty feet in length. On the 6th of August he cast anchor in a fine bay called Totnes, near a mountain of the color of gold, which received the name of Raleigh. At the same time he gave the names of Dyer and Walshingham to two capes of that land of Cumberland. During eleven days Davis still sailed northwards on a very open sea, free from ice, and of which the water had the color of the ocean. Already he believed himself at the entrance of the sea, which communicated with the Pacific, when all at once the weather changed, and became so foggy that he was forced to return to Yarmouth, where he landed on the 30th of September. Davis had the skill to make the owners of his ships partake in the hope which he had conceived. Thus, on the 7th of May, 1586, he set out again with the two ships which had made the previous voyage. To them were added the mermaid of 120 tons, and the pinnace North Star. When, on the 25th of June, he arrived at the southern point of Greenland, Davis dispatched the Sunshine and the North Star towards the north, in order to search for a passage upon the eastern coast, while he pursued the same route as in the preceding year, and penetrated into the strait which bears his name as far as 69 degrees. But there was a much greater quantity of ice this year, and on the 17th of July the expedition fell in with an ice field, of such extent that it took thirteen days to coast along it. The wind, after passing over this icy plain, was so cold that the rigging and sails were frozen, and the sailors refused to go any further. It was needful, therefore, to descend again to the east-southeast. There Davis explored the land of Cumberland, without finding the strait he was seeking, and after a skirmish with the Esquimaux, in which three of his men were killed, and two wounded, he set out on the 19th of September on his return to England. Although once more his researches had not been crowned with success, Davis still had good hope, as is witnessed by a letter which he wrote to the company, in which he said that he had reduced the existence of the passage to a species of certainty. Foreseeing, however, that he would have more trouble in obtaining the dispatch of a new expedition, he added that the expenses of the enterprise would be fully covered by the profit arising from the fishery of walrus, seals, and whales, which were so numerous in those parts that they appeared to have there established their headquarters. On the 15th of May, 1587, he set sail with the Sunshine, the Elizabeth of Dartmouth, and the Helen of London. This time he went farther north than he had ever done before, and reached seventy-two degrees, twelve minutes, that is to say, nearly the latitude of Upper Navik, and he descried Cape Henderson's hope. Stopped by the ice and forced to retrace his way, he sailed in Frobisher's Strait, and after having crossed a large gulf, he arrived in sixty-one degrees, ten minutes latitude, in sight of a cape to which he gave the name of Chudley. This cape is a part of the Labrador coast, and forms the southern entrance to Hudson's Bay. After coasting along the American shores as far as 52 degrees, Davis set out for England, which he reached on the 15th of September. 
Although the solution of the problem had not been found, yet nevertheless precious results had been obtained, but results to which people at the period did not attach any great value. Nearly the half of Baffin's Bay had been explored, and clear ideas had been obtained of its shores, and of the people inhabiting them. These were considerable acquisitions, from a geographical point of view, but they were scarcely those which would greatly affect the merchants of the city. In consequence, the attempts at finding a northwest passage were abandoned by the English for a somewhat long period. A new nation was just come into existence. The Dutch, while scarcely delivered from the Spanish yoke, inaugurated that commercial policy which was destined to make the greatness and prosperity of their country, by the successive dispatch of several expeditions to seek for a way to China by the northeast. The same project, formerly conceived by Sebastian Cabot, and which had given to England the Russian trade. With their practical instinct, the Dutch had acquainted themselves with English navigation. They had even established factories at Kola and Archangel, but they wished to proceed further in their search for new markets. The Sea of Kara appeared to them too difficult. They resolved, acting on the advice of the cosmographer Plancius, to try a new way by the north of Nova Zembla. The merchants of Amsterdam applied, therefore, to an experienced sailor, William Barents, born in the island of Terschelling, near the Texel. This navigator set out from the Texel in 1594, on board the Mercure, doubled the North Cape, saw the island of Wegatz, and found himself on the 4th of July in sight of the coast of Nova Zembla, in latitude 73 degrees 25 minutes. He sailed along the coast, doubled Cape Nassau on the 10th of July, and three days later he came in contact with the ice. Until the 3rd of August he attempted to open a passage through the pack, testing the mass of ice on various sides, going up as far as the Orange Islands at the northwestern extremity of Nova Zembla, sailing over 1,700 miles of ground, and putting his ship about no less than 81 times. We do not imagine that any navigator had hitherto displayed such perseverance. Let us add that he turned this long cruise to account, to fix astronomically, and with remarkable accuracy, the latitude of various points. At last, wearied with the fruitless boxing about along the edge of the pack, the crew cried for mercy, and it became necessary to return to the Texel. The results obtained were judged so important that the following year the Dutch States General entrusted to Jacob van Himskirk the command of a fleet of seven vessels, of which Barents was named chief pilot. After touching at various points upon the coast of Nova Zembla and of Asia, this squadron was forced by the pack to go back without having made any important discovery, and it returned to Holland on the 18th of September. As a general rule, governments do not possess as much perseverance as do private individuals. The large fleet of the year 1595 had cost a great sum of money, and had produced no results. This was sufficient to discourage the States General. The merchants of Amsterdam, therefore substituting private enterprise for the action of the government, which merely promised a reward to the man who should first discover the northeast passage, fitted out two vessels, of which the command was given to Himskirk and to Jan Cornelzoon Riep, while Barents, who had only the title of pilot, was virtually the leader of the expedition. The historian of the voyage, Garrett de Vere, was also on board as second mate. The Dutchman sailed from Amsterdam on the 10th of May, 1596, passed by the Shetland and Faroe Islands, and on the 5th of June saw the first masses of ice, whereat we were much amazed, believing at first that they were white swans. They soon arrived at the south of Spitsbergen, at Bear Island, upon which they landed on the 11th of June. They collected there a great number of seagulls' eggs, and after much trouble killed at some distance inland a white bear, destined to give its name to the land which Barents had just discovered. 
On the 19th of June, they disembarked upon some far-spreading land, which they took to be a part of Greenland, and to which, on account of the sharp-pointed mountains, they gave the name of Spitsbergen. Of this they explored a considerable portion of the western coast. Forced by the polar pack to go southwards again to Bear Island, they separated there from Reap, who was once more to endeavor to find a way by the north. On the 11th of July, Heemskirk and Barents were in the parts of Cape Cannon, and five days later they had reached the western coast of Nova Zembla, which was called Willoughby's Land. They then altered their course, and again going northwards, they arrived on the 19th at the island of Crosses, where the ice which was still attached to the shore barred their passage. They remained in this place until the 4th of August, and two days later they doubled Cape Nassau. After several changes in course, which it would take too long to relate, they reached the Orange Islands at the northern extremity of Nova Zembla. They began to descend the eastern coast, but were soon obliged to enter a harbor, where they found themselves completely blocked by the pack ice, and in which they were forced in great cold, poverty, misery, and grief to stay all the winter. This was on the 26th of August. On the 30th, the masses of ice began to pile themselves one upon another against the ship with snow falling. The ship was lifted up and surrounded in such a manner that all that was about her and around her began to crack and split. It seemed as if the ship must break into a thousand pieces, a thing most terrible to see and to hear, and fit to wake one's hair stand on end. The ship was afterwards in equal danger when the ice formed beneath raising her and bearing her up as though she had been lifted by some instrument. Soon the ship cracked to such a degree that prudence dictated the debarkation of some of the provisions, sails, gunpowder, lead, the arquebuses, as well as other arms, and the erection of a tent or hut, in which the men might be sheltered from the snow and from any attacks by bears. Some days later, some sailors who had advanced from four to six miles inland found near a river of fresh water a quantity of driftwood. They discovered there also the traces of wild goats and of reindeer. On the 11th of September, seeing that the bay was filled with enormous blocks of ice piled one upon the other and welded together, the Dutchmen perceived that they would be obliged to winter in this place and resolved in order to be better defended against the cold and armed against the wild beasts, to build a house there which might be able to contain them all, while they would leave to itself the ship, which became each day less safe and comfortable. Fortunately, they found upon the shore whole trees, coming doubtless from Siberia, and driven here by the current, and in such quantity that they sufficed not only for the construction of their habitation, but also for firewood throughout the winter. Never yet had any European wintered in these regions, in the midst of that slothful and immovable sea, which, according to the very false expressions used by Tacitus, forms the girdle of the world, and which is heard the uproar caused by the rising of the sun. The Dutchmen, therefore, were unable to picture to themselves the sufferings which threatened them. They bore them, however, with admirable patience without a single murmur, and without the least want of discipline or attempt at mutiny. The conduct of these brave seamen, quite ignorant of what so apparently dark a future might have in reserve for them, but who with wonderful faith had placed their affairs in the hands of God, may be always proposed as an example, even to the sailors of the present day. It may well be said they had really in their hearts the ace triplex of which Horace speaks, it was owing to the skill, knowledge, and foresight of their leader Barents, as much as to their own spirit of obedience, that the Dutch sailors ever came forth from Nova Zembla, which threatened to be their tomb, and again saw the shores of their own country. The bears, which were extremely numerous at that period of the year, made frequent visits to the crew. More than one was killed, but the Dutchmen contented themselves with skinning them for the sake of their fur, and did not eat them, probably because they believed the flesh to be unwholesome. It would have been, however, a considerable addition to their food, and would have saved them from using their salted meat, 
and thus they might longer have escaped the attacks of scurvy. But that we may not anticipate. Let us continue to follow the journal of Garrett de Vere. On the 23rd of September, the carpenter died, and was interred the next day in the cleft of a mountain, it being impossible to put a spade into the ground on account of the severity of the frost. The following days were devoted to the transport of driftwood and the building of the house. To cover it in, it was necessary to demolish the fore and aft cabins of the ship. The roof was put on on the 2nd October, and a piece of frozen snow was set up like a maypole. On the 31st September there was a strong wind from the northwest, and as far as the eye could reach the sea was entirely open and without ice. But we remained as though taken and arrested in the ice, and the ship was raised full two or three feet upon the ice, and we could imagine nothing else but that the water must be frozen quite to the bottom, although it was three fathoms and a half in depth. On the 12th October they began to sleep in the house, although it was not completed. On the 21st, the greater part of the provisions, furniture, and everything which might be wanted, was withdrawn from the ship, for they felt certain that the sun was about to disappear. A chimney was fixed in the centre of the roof. Inside, a Dutch clock was hung up, bed places were formed along the walls, and a wine cask was converted into a bath, for the surgeon had wisely prescribed to the men frequent bathing as a preservative of health. The quantity of snow which fell during this winter was really marvellous. The house disappeared entirely beneath this thick covering, which, however, sensibly raised the temperature within. Every time that they wished to go forth, the Dutchmen were obliged to hollow out a long corridor beneath the snow. Each night they first heard the bears, and then the foxes, which walked upon the top of the dwelling and tried to tear off some planks from the roof, that they might get into the house. So the sailors were accustomed to climb into the chimney, whence, as from a watch-tower, they could shoot the animals and drive them off. They had manufactured a great number of snares, into which fell numbers of blue foxes, the valuable fur of which served as protection against the cold, while their flesh enabled the sailors to economize their provisions. Always cheerful and good-tempered, they bore equally well the ennui of the long polar night and the severity of the cold, which was so extreme, that during two of three days, when they had not been able to keep so large a fire as usual, on account of the smoke being driven back again by the wind, it froze so hard in the house that the walls and the floor were covered with ice to the depth of two fingers, even in the cots where these poor people were sleeping. It was necessary to thaw the sherry when it was served out, as it was done every two days, at the rate of half a pint. On the 7th of December the rough weather continued, with a violent storm coming from the northeast, which produced horrible cold. We knew no means of guarding ourselves against it, and while we were consulting together what we could do for the best, one of our men, in his extreme necessity, proposed to make use of the coal which we had brought from the ship into our house, and to make a fire of it, because it burns with great heat and lasts a long time. In the evening we lighted a large fire of this coal, which threw out a great heat, but we did not provide against what might happen, for as the heat revived us completely, we tried to retain it for a long time. To this end we thought it well to stop up all the doors and the chimney, to keep in the delightful warmth and thus each went to repose in his cot, and, animated by the acquired warmth, we discoursed long together. But in the end we were seized with a giddiness in the head, some, however, more than others. This was first perceived to be the case with one of our men who was ill, and who for this reason had less power of resistance. And we also ourselves were sensible of a great pain which attacked us so that several of the bravest came out of their cots and began by unstopping the chimney, and afterwards opening the door. But the man who opened the door fainted and fell senseless upon the snow, on perceiving which I ran to him and found him lying on the ground in a fainting fit. I went in haste to seek for some vinegar, and with it I rubbed his face until he recovered from his swoon. Afterwards, when we were somewhat restored, the captain gave to each a little wine, in order to comfort our hearts. 
On the 11th, the weather continued fine, but so extremely cold that no one who had not felt it could imagine it. Even our shoes, frozen to our feet, were as hard as horn, and inside they were covered with ice in such a manner that we could no longer use them. The garments which we wore were quite white with frost and ice. On Christmas Day, the 25th December, the weather was as rough as on the preceding days. The foxes made havoc upon the house, which one of the sailors declared to be a bad omen, and, upon being asked why he said so, answered, because we cannot put them in a pot or on the spit, which would have been a good omen. If the year 1596 had closed with excessive cold, the commencement of 1597 was not more agreeable. Most violent storms of snow and hard frost prevented the Dutchmen from leaving the house. They celebrated Twelfth Night with a gaiety, as is related in the simple and touching narrative of Gerrit de Vere, for this purpose we besought the captain to allow us a little diversion in the midst of our sufferings, and to let us use a part of the wine which was destined to be served out to us every other day. Having two pounds of flour, we made some pancakes with oil, and each one brought a white biscuit, which we soaked in the wine and eat. And it seemed to us that we were in our own country, and amongst our relations and friends, and we were as much diverted as if a banquet had been given in our honour, so much did we relish our entertainment. We also made a Twelfth Night King, by means of paper, and our Master Gunner was King of Nova Zembla, which is a country enclosed between two seas, and of the great length of six hundred miles. After the twenty-first January the foxes became less numerous. The bears reappeared, and daylight began to increase which enabled the Dutchman, who had been so long confined to the house, to go out a little. On the 24th, one of the sailors who had been long ill died, and was buried in the snow at some distance from the house. On the 28th, the weather being very fine, the men all went out, walking about, running for exercise, and playing at bowls, to take off the stiffness of their limbs, for they were extremely weak, and nearly all suffering from scurvy. They were so much enfeebled that they were obliged to go to work several times before they could carry to their house the wood which was needful. At length, in the first days of March, after several tempests and driving snowstorms, they were able to verify the fact that there was no ice in the sea. Nevertheless, the weather was still rough and the cold glacial. It was not feasible as yet to put to sea again, and rather because the ship was still embedded in the ice. On the 15th of April the sailors paid a visit to her, and found her in fairly good condition. At the beginning of May the men became somewhat impatient, and asked Barents if he were not soon intending to make the necessary preparations for departure. But Barents answered that he must wait until the end of the month, and then, if it should be impossible to set the ship free, he would take measures to prepare the long-boats and the launch, and to render them fit for a sea voyage. On the twentieth of the month the preparations for departure commenced. With what joy and ardor it is easy to imagine. The launch was repaired, the sails were mended, and both boats were dragged to the sea, and provisions put on board. Then, seeing that the water was free, and that a strong wind was blowing, Heemskirk went to see Barents, who had been long ill, and declared to him, that it seemed good to him to set out from thence, and in God's name to commence the voyage, and abandon Nova Zembla. William Barents had before this written a paper setting forth how we had started from Holland to go towards the kingdom of China, and all that had happened in order that, if by chance some one should come after us, it might be known what had befallen us, this note he enclosed in that case of a musket which he hung up in the chimney. On the 13th June, 1597, the Dutchmen abandoned the ship which had not stirred from her icy prison, and commending themselves to the protection of God, the two open boats put to sea. They reached the Orange Islands, and again descended the western coast of Nova Zembla in the midst of ceaselessly recurring dangers. On the 20th of June, Nicholas Andrew became very weak, and we saw clearly that he would soon expire. The lieutenant of the governor came on board our launch, and told us that Nicholas Andrew 
was very much indisposed, and that it was very evident that his days would soon end. Upon which William Barentz said, It appears to me that my life also will be very short. We did not imagine that Barentz was so ill, for we were chatting together, and William Barentz was looking at the little chart which I had made of our voyage, and we had various discourses together. Finally he laid down the chart and said to me, Gerard, give me something to drink. After he had drunk, such weakness supervened that his eyes turned into his head, and he died so suddenly that we had not time to call the captain, who was in the other boat. This death of William Barentz saddened us greatly, seeing that he was our principal leader and our sole pilot, in whom we had placed our whole trust. But we could not oppose the will of God, and this thought quieted us a little. Thus died the illustrious Barentz, like his successors Franklin and Hall, in the midst of his discoveries. In the measured and sober words of the short funeral oration of Garrett de Vere may be perceived the affection, sympathy, and confidence which this brave sailor had been able to inspire in his unfortunate companions. Barentz is one of the glories of Holland, so prolific in brave and skilful navigators. We shall mention presently what has been done to honor his memory. After having been forced several times to haul the boats out of the water when they were on the point of being crushed between the blocks of ice, after having seen on various occasions the sea open and again closed before them, after having suffered both from thirst and hunger, the Dutchman reached Cape Nassau. One day, being obliged to draw up the longboat, which was in danger of being stove in upon an iceberg, the sailors lost a part of their provisions, and were all deluged with water, for the ice broke away under their feet. In the midst of so much misery they sometimes met with good windfalls. Thus, when they were upon the ice on the island of Crosses, they found there seventy eggs of the mountain duck, but they did not know what they should put them in to carry them. At length one man took off his breeches, tying them together by the ends, and, having put the eggs into them, they carried them on a pike between two, while the third man carried the musket. The eggs were very welcome, and we eat them like lords. From the 19th July the Dutchman sailed over a sea, which, if not altogether free from ice, was at least clear of those great fields of ice which had given them so much trouble to avoid. On the 28th July, when entering the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they met with two Russian vessels, which at first they dared not approach. But when they saw the sailors come to them unarmed, and with friendly demonstrations, they put aside all fear, and rather as they recognized in the Russians, some people whom they had met with the year before in the neighborhood of Wagats, the Dutchmen received some assistance from them, and then continued their voyage, still keeping along the coast of Nova Zembla, and as close to the shore as the ice would allow. Upon one occasion, when they landed, they discovered the cochleura, scurvy grass, a plant of which the leaves and seeds form one of the most powerful of known antiscorbutics. They eat them, therefore by handfuls, and immediately experienced great relief. Their provisions were, however, nearly exhausted. They had only a little bread remaining, and scarcely any meat. They decided, therefore, to take to the open sea, in order to shorten the distance which separated them from the coast of Russia, where they still hoped to fall in with some fishermen's boats, from which they might obtain assistance. In this hope they were not deceived, although they still had many trials to undergo. The Russians were much touched by their misfortunes, and consented on several occasions to bestow provisions upon them, which prevented the Dutch sailors from dying of hunger. In consequence of a thick fog, the two boats were separated from each other, and did not come together again until some distance beyond Cape Cannon, on the further side of the White Sea, at Kildin Island, where some fishermen informed the Dutchmen that at Kola there were three ships belonging to their nation, which were ready to put to sea on their return to their own country. They therefore dispatched thither one of their men, accompanied by a Laplander, who returned three days afterwards with a letter signed Jan Rip. Great was the astonishment of the Dutch at the sight of this signature. It was only on comparing the letter just received with several others which Heemskirk had in his possession 
that they were convinced that it really came from the captain who had accompanied them the preceding year. Some days later, on the 30th September, Reap himself arrived with a boat laden with provisions to seek them out and take them to the Kola River, in which his ship was at anchor. Reap was greatly astonished at all they related to him, and at the terrible voyage of nearly twelve hundred miles which they had made, and which had not taken less than one hundred and four days, namely from the 13th June to the 25th September. Some days of repose accompanied by wholesome and abundant food sufficed to clear off the last remains of scurvy, and to refresh the sailors after their fatigues. On the 17th September, Jean Riep left the Kola River, and on the 1st November the Dutch crew arrived at Amsterdam. We had on, says Gerrit de Vere, the same garments which we wore in Nova Zembla, having on our heads caps of white fox skin, and we repaired to the house of Peter Hasselier, who had been one of the guardians of the town of Amsterdam charged with presiding over the fitting out of the two ships of Jan Riep, and of our own captain. Arriving at this house, in the midst of general astonishment, because that we had been long thought to be dead, and this report had been spread throughout the town, the news of our arrival reached the palace of the prince, where there were then at table the chancellor and the ambassador of the high and mighty king of Denmark and Norway, of the Goths and the Vandals. We were then brought before them by M. Le Couté, and two lords of the town, and we gave to the said lord ambassador, and to their lordships the burgomasters, a narrative of our voyage. Afterwards each of us retired to his own house. Those who had not dwellings in the town, were lodged in an inn, until such time as we received our money, when each went his own way. These are the names of the men who returned from this voyage. Jacob Heemskirk, clerk and captain, Peter Peterson Voss, Gerrit de Vere, mate, Jan Voss, surgeon, Jacob Jansen Sterenberg, Leonard Henry, Lawrence William, Jan Hillebrands, Jacob Jensen Huchwut, Peter Cornille, Jacob Dubursen, and Jacob Everts. Of all these brave sailors we have nothing further to record, except that de Vere published the following year the narrative of his voyage, and that Heemskirk, after having made several cruises to India, received in 1607 the command of a fleet of twenty-six vessels, at the head of which, on the 25th of April, he had a severe battle with the Spaniards under the guns of Gibraltar, in which battle, although the Dutch were conquerors, Heemskirk lost his life. The spot where the unfortunate Barents and his companions had wintered was not revisited until 1871, nearly three hundred years after their time. The first to double the northern point of Nova Zembla, Barents had remained alone in the achievement until this period. On the 7th September, 1871, the Norwegian captain Elling Carlsen, well known by his numerous voyages in the North Sea and the Frozen Ocean, arrived at the ice haven of Barents, and on the 9th he discovered the house which had sheltered the Dutchman. It was in such a wonderful state of preservation that it seemed to have been built but a day, and everything was found in the same position as at the departure of the shipwrecked crew. Bears, foxes, and other creatures inhabiting these inhospitable regions had alone visited the spot. Around the house were standing some large puncheons, and there were heaps of seal, bear, and walrus bones. Inside, everything was in its place. It was the faithful reproduction of the curious engraving of Gerrit de Vere. The bed places were arranged along the partition as they are shown in the drawing, as well as the clock, the muskets, and the halberd. Amongst the household utensils, the arms, and the various objects brought away by Captain Carlson, we may mention two copper cooking pans, some goblets, gun barrels, augers, and chisels, a pair of boots, nineteen cartridge cases, of which some were still filled with powder, the clock, a flute, some locks and padlocks, twenty-six pewter candlesticks, some fragments of engravings, 
and three books in Dutch, one of which, the last edition of Mendoza's History of China, shows the goal which Barentz sought in this expedition, and a manual of navigation, proves the care taken by the pilot to keep himself well up in all professional matters. Upon his return to the port of Hammerfest, Captain Carlson met with a Dutchman, Mr. Lister K., who purchased the Barentz relics and forwarded them to the authorities of the Netherlands. These objects have been placed in the Naval Museum at The Hague, where a house open in front has been constructed precisely similar to the one represented in the drawing of Gerrit de Vere, and each object or instrument brought back has been placed in the very position which it occupied in the house in Nova Zembla. Surrounded by all the respect and affection which they merit, these precious witnesses of a maritime event so important as the first wintering in the Arctic regions, these touching reminiscences of Baron Seemskirk, and their rough companions, constitute one of the most interesting monuments in the museum. Beside the clock is placed a copper dial, through the middle of which a meridian is drawn. This curious dial, invented by Plancius, which served without doubt to determine the variations of the compass, is now the only example extant of a nautical instrument which has never been in very general use. For this reason, it is as precious as, from another point of view, are the flute used by Barentz, and the shoes of the poor sailor who died during the winter sojourn. It is impossible to behold this curious collection without experiencing poignant emotion. End of Second Part, Chapter 3, Part 2b Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham Connecticut. Section 38 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne, Second Part, Chapter 4, Part 1. Voyages of Adventure and Privateering Warfare. A very poor cottage at Tavistock in Devonshire was the birthplace in 1540 of Francis Drake, who was destined to gain millions by his indomitable courage which, however, he lost with as much facility as he had obtained them. Edmund Drake, his father, was one of those clergy who devote themselves to the education of the people. His poverty was only equaled by the respect which was felt for his character. Burdened with a family as he was, the father of Francis Drake found himself obliged from necessity to allow his son to embrace the maritime profession, for which he had an ardent longing and to serve as cabin-boy on board a coasting vessel which traded with Holland. Industrious, active, self-reliant, and saving, the young Francis Drake had soon acquired all the theoretical knowledge needed for the direction of a vessel. When he had realized a small sum, which was increased by the sale of a vessel bequeathed to him by his first master, he made more extended voyages. He visited the Bay of Biscay and the Gulf of Guinea, and laid out all his capital in purchasing a cargo which he hoped to sell in the West Indies. But no sooner had he arrived at Rio de la Hacha than both ship and cargo were confiscated. We know not under what frivolous pretext. All the remonstrances of Drake, who thus saw himself ruined, were useless. He vowed to avenge himself for such a piece of injustice, and he kept his word. In 1567, two years after this adventure, a small fleet of six vessels, of which the largest was of seven hundred tons burden, left Plymouth with the sanction of the Queen to make an expedition to the coasts of Mexico. Drake was in command of a ship of fifty tons. At first starting they captured some negroes on the Cape de Verde Islands, a sort of rehearsal of what was destined to take place in Mexico. Then they besieged La Mina, where some more negroes were taken, which they sold at the Antilles. Hawkins, doubtless by the advice of Drake, captured the town of Rio de la Hacha, after which he reached St. Jean d'Ulia, having encountered a fearful storm. 
but the harbour contained a numerous fleet, and was defended by formidable artillery. The English fleet was defeated, and Drake had much difficulty in regaining the English coast in January 1568. Drake afterwards made two expeditions to the West Indies for the purpose of studying the country. When he considered himself to have acquired the necessary information, he fitted out two vessels at his own expense, the Swan, of twenty-five tons, commanded by his brother John, and the Pasha of Plymouth, of seventy tons. The two vessels had as crew seventy-three jack tars, who could be thoroughly depended on. From July 1572 to August 1573, sometimes alone, sometimes in concert with certain Captain Ross, Drake made a lucrative cruise upon the coasts of the Gulf of Darien, attacked the towns of Veracruz and of Nombre de Dios, and obtained considerable spoil. Unfortunately, these enterprises were not carried out without much cruelty and many acts of violence, which would make men of the present day blush. But we will not dwell upon the scenes of piracy and barbarity, which are only too frequently met with in the sixteenth century. After assisting in the suppression of the rebellion in Ireland, Drake, whose name was beginning to be well known, was presented to Queen Elizabeth. He laid before her his project of going to ravage the western coasts of South America by passing through the Strait of Magellan, and he obtained, with the title of Admiral, a fleet of six vessels, on board which were 160 picked sailors. Francis Drake started from Plymouth on the 15th November, 1577. He had some intercourse with the Moors of Mogador, of which he had no reason to boast made some capture of small importance before arriving at the Cape de Verde Islands, where he took in fresh provisions, and then was fifty-six days in crossing the Atlantic and reaching the coast of Brazil, which he followed as far as the estuary of La Plata, where he laid in a supply of water. He afterwards arrived at the Seal Bay in Patagonia, where he traded with the natives and killed a great number of penguins and sea-wolves for the nourishment of his crew. Some of the Patagonians, who were seen on the 13th May, a little below Seal Bay, says the original narrative, wore on the head a kind of horn, and nearly all had many beautiful bird's feathers by way of hats. They also had the face painted and diversified by several kinds of colors, and they each held a bow in the hand from which every time they drew it they discharged two arrows. They were very agile, and as far as we could see, well instructed in the art of making war, for they kept good order in marching and advancing, and for so few men as they were, they made themselves appear a large number. M. Charton, in his Voyageurs Anciens et Modernes, notices that Drake does not mention the extraordinary stature which Magellan had attributed to the Patagonians. For this there is more than one good reason. There exists in Patagonia more than one tribe, and the description here given by Drake of the savages whom he met does not at all resemble that given by Pigafetta of the Patagonians of Port St. Julian. If there exist, as seems now to be proved, a race of men of great stature, their habitat appears fixed upon the shores of the strait at the southern extremity of Patagonia, and not at fifteen days' sail from the Port Desire, at which Drake arrived on the 2nd June. On the following day he reached the harbour of St. Julian, where he found a gibbet erected of yore by Magellan for the punishment of some rebellious members of his crew. Drake, in his turn, chose this spot to rid himself of one of his captains, named Doughty, who had been long accused of treason and underhand dealing, and who on several occasions had separated himself from the fleet. Some sailors, having confessed that he had solicited them to join with him in frustrating the voyage, Doughty was convicted of the crimes of rebellion and of tampering with the sailors, and according to the laws of England he was condemned by a court-martial to be beheaded. This sentence was immediately executed, although Doughty, until the last moment, vehemently declared his innocence. Was his guilt thoroughly proved? If Drake were accused upon his return to England, in spite of the moderation which he always evinced towards his men, of having taken advantage of the opportunity to get rid of a rival whom he dreaded, it is difficult to conceive that the forty judges who pronounced the sentence should have concerted together to further the secret designs of their admiral and condemn an innocent man. On the 20th of August the fleet, now reduced to three vessels, two of the ships having been so much damaged that they were at once destroyed by the admiral, 
entered the strait, which had not been traversed since the time of Magellan. Although he met with fine harbors, Drake found that it was difficult to anchor in them, on account of the depth of the water close to the shore, and of the violence of the wind, which, blowing as it did in sudden squalls, rendered navigation dangerous. During a storm which was encountered at the point where the strait opens into the Pacific, Drake beheld one of his ships founder, while his last companion was separated from him a few days afterwards. Nor did he see her again until the end of the campaign. Driven by the currents to the south of the strait as far as fifty-five degrees forty minutes, Drake had now only his own vessel. But by the injury which he did to the Spaniards, he showed what ravages he would have committed if he had had still under his command the fleet with which he left England. During a descent upon the island of Mocha, the English had two men killed and several wounded, while Drake himself, hit by two arrows on the head, found himself utterly unable to punish the Indians for their perfidy. In the harbour of Valprecio, he captured a vessel richly laden with the wines of Chile, and with ingots of gold valued at thirty-seven thousand ducats. Afterward he pillaged the town, which had been precipitately abandoned by its inhabitants. At Coquimbo, the people were forewarned of his approach, so that he found there a strong force, which obliged him to re-embark. At Erica he plundered three small vessels, in one of which he found fifty-seven bars of silver, valued at two thousand six pounds. In the harbor of Lima, where he moored twelve ships or barks, the booty was considerable. But what most rejoiced the heart of Drake was to learn that a galleon named Cagafuego, very richly laden, was sailing toward Paraca. He immediately went in pursuit, capturing on the way a bark carrying eighty pounds of gold, which would be worth fourteen thousand and eighty French crowns and in the latitude of San Francisco he seized without any difficulty the Cagafuego, in which he found eighty pounds weight of gold. This caused the Spanish pilot to say, laughing, Captain, our ship ought no longer to be called Cagafuego, spitfire, but rather Cagaplata, spit money. It is yours which should be named Cagafuego. After making some other captures, more or less valuable, upon the Peruvian coast, Drake, learning that a considerable fleet was being prepared to oppose him, thought it time to return to England. For this there were three different routes open to him. He might again pass the Straits of Magellan, or he might cross the Southern Sea, and doubling the Cape of Good Hope, might so return to the Atlantic Ocean. Or he could sail up the coast of China, and return by the Frozen Sea and the North Cape. It was this last alternative, as being the safest of the three, which was adopted by Drake. He therefore put out to sea, reached the thirty-eighth degree of north latitude, and landed on the shore of the Bay of San Francisco, which had been discovered three years previously by Bodega. It was now the month of June, the temperature was very low, and the ground covered with snow. The details given by Drake of his reception by the natives are curious enough. When we arrived, the savages manifested great admiration at the sight of us, and thinking that we were gods, they received us with great humanity and reverence. As long as we remained, they continued to come and visit us, sometimes bringing us beautiful plumes made of feathers, of divers colors, and sometimes petun, tobacco, which is a herb in general use among the Indians. But before presenting these things to us, they stopped at a little distance, in a spot where we had pitched our tents. Then they made a long discourse, after the manner of a harangue, and when they had finished, they laid aside their bows and arrows in that place, and approached us to offer their presents. The first time they came, their woman remained in the same place, and scratched and tore the skin and flesh of their cheeks, lamenting themselves in a wonderful manner, whereat we were much astonished. But we have since learnt that it was a kind of sacrifice which they offered to us. The facts given by Drake with regard to the Indians of California are almost the only ones which he furnishes upon the manners and customs of the nations which he visited. We would draw the reader's attention here to that custom of long harangues which the traveller especially remarks, just as Cartier had observed upon it forty years earlier, and which is so noticeable amongst the Canadian Indians at the present day. Drake did not advance farther north, and gave up his project of returning by the frozen sea. When he again set sail, it was to descend toward the line, to reach the Moluccas, and return to England by the Cape of Good Hope. As this part of the voyage dealt with countries already known, 
and as the observations made by Drake are neither numerous nor novel, our narrative here shall be brief. On the 13th of October, 1579, Drake arrived in latitude 8 degrees north at a group of islands of which the inhabitants had their ears much lengthened by the weight of the ornaments suspended to them. Their nails were allowed to grow and appeared to serve as defensive weapons, while their teeth, black as ship's pitch, contracted this color from the use of the betel nut. After resting for a time, Drake passed by the Philippines, and on the 14th of November arrived in Ternate. The king of this island came alongside with four canoes bearing his principal officers dressed in their state costumes. After an interchange of civilities and presents, the English received some rice sugar canes, fowls, figo, cloves, and sago. On the morrow, some of the sailors who had landed were present at a council. When the king arrived, a rich umbrella or parasol all embroidered in gold was borne before him. He was dressed after the fashion of his country, but with extreme magnificence, for he was enveloped from the shoulders with a long cloak of gold, reaching to the ground. He wore as an ornament upon the head a kind of turban made of the same stuff, all worked in fine gold and enriched with jewels and tufts. On his neck there hung a fine gold chain, many times doubled, and formed of broad lengths. On his fingers he had six rings of very valuable stones, and his feet were encased in shoes of Morocco leather. After remaining some time in the country to refresh his crew, Drake again put to sea, but his ship, on the ninth of January, 1580, struck on a rock, and to float her off it was necessary to throw overboard eight pieces of ordnance and a large quantity of provisions. A month later Drake arrived at Baratania Island, where he repaired his ship. This island offered much silver, gold, copper, sulphur, spices, lemons, cucumbers, coconuts, and other delicious fruits. We loaded our vessels abundantly with these, being able to certify that since our departure from England we have not visited any place where we have found more comforts in the way of food and fresh provisions than in this island and that of Ternate. After quitting this richly endowed island, Drake landed at Greater Java, where he was very warmly welcomed by the five kings amongst whom the island was partitioned, and by the inhabitants. These people are of a fine degree of corpulence. They are great connoisseurs in arms, with which they are well provided, such as swords, daggers, and bucklers, and all these arms are made with much art. Drake had been some little time at Java, when he learnt that not far distant there was a powerful fleet at anchor, which he suspected must belong to Spain. To avoid it he put to sea in all haste. He doubled the Cape of Good Hope during the first days of June, and after stopping at Sierra Leone to take in water, he entered Plymouth Harbor on the 3rd November, 1580, after an absence of three years all but a few days. The reception which awaited him in England was at first extremely cold. His having fallen by surprise both upon Spanish towns and ships, at a time when the two nations were at peace, rightly caused him to be regarded by a portion of society as a pirate, who tramples underfoot the rights of nations. For five months the queen herself, under the pressure of diplomatic proprieties, pretended to be ignorant of his return. But at the end of that time, either because circumstances had altered, or because she did not wish to show herself any longer severe towards the skilful sailor, she repaired to Deptford, where Drake's ship was moored, went on board, and conferred the honor of knighthood upon the navigator. From this period, Drake's part as a discoverer is ended, and his afterlife as a warrior and as the implacable enemy of the Spaniards does not concern us. Loaded with honors and invested with important commands, Drake died at sea on the 28th January, 1596, during an expedition against the Spaniards. To him pertains the honor of having been the second to pass through the Straits of Magellan, and to have visited Tierra del Fuego as far as the parts about Cape Horn. He also ascended the coast of North America, to a point higher than any his predecessors had attained, and he discovered several islands and archipelagos. Being a very clever navigator, he made the transit through the Strait of Magellan with great rapidity. If there are but very few discoveries due to him, this is probably either because he neglected to record them in his journal, or because he often mentions them in so inaccurate a manner that it is scarcely possible to recognize the places. 
It was he who inaugurated that privateering warfare by which the English, and later on the Dutch, were destined to inflict much injury upon the Spaniards, and the large profits accruing to him from it encouraged his contemporaries, and gave birth in their minds to the love for long and hazardous voyages. Among all those who took example by Drake, the most illustrious was undoubtedly Thomas Cavendish, or Candish. Cavendish joined the English marine service at a very early age, and passed a most stormy youth, during which he rapidly dissipated his modest fortune. That which play had robbed him of, he resolved to recover from the Spaniards. Having, in 1585, obtained letters of mark, he made a cruise to the East Indies, and returned with considerable booty. Encouraged by his easy success as a highwayman on the great maritime roads, he thought that if he could acquire some honor and glory while engaged in making his fortune, so much the better would it be for him. With this idea, he bought three ships, the Desire of twenty tons, the Content of sixty tons, and the Hugh Gallant of forty tons, upon which he embarked one hundred and twenty-three soldiers and sailors. Setting sail on the 22nd July, 1586, he passed by the Canaries and landed at Sierra Leone, which town he attacked and plundered. Then, sailing again, he crossed the Atlantic, sighted Cape Sebastian in Brazil, sailed along the coast of Patagonia, and arrived on the 27th November at Port Desire. He found there an immense quantity of dogfish, very large and so strong that four men could with difficulty kill them, and numbers of birds, which, having no wings, could not fly, and which fed upon fish. They are classed under the general names of auks and penguins. In this very secure harbor, the ships were drawn up on shore to be repaired. During his stay at this place, Cavendish had some skirmishes with the Patagonians, men of gigantic size and having feet eighteen inches long, who wounded two of the sailors with arrows tipped with sharpened flints. On the 7th January, 1587, Cavendish entered the Strait of Magellan, and in the narrowest part of it received on board his ships one and twenty Spaniards and two women, the sole survivors of the colony founded three years previously under the name Philipville, by Captain Sarmiento. This town, which had been built to bar the passage through the strait, had possessed no fewer than four forts, as well as several churches. Cavendish could discern the fortress then deserted and already falling into ruins, its inhabitants, who had been completely prevented by the continual attacks of the savages from gathering in their harvests, had died of hunger, or had perished in endeavoring to reach the Spanish settlements in Chile. The admiral, upon hearing this lamentable tale, changed the name of Philipville into that of Port Famine, under which appellation the place is known at the present day. On the 21st, the ships entered a beautiful bay, which received the name of Elizabeth, and in which was buried the carpenter of the Hugh Gallant. Not far from thence a fine river fell into the sea, on the banks of which dwelt the Anthropophagae, who had fought so fiercely with the Spaniards, and who endeavored, but in vain, to entice the Englishmen into the interior of the country. On the 24th February, as the little squadron came forth from the strait, it encountered a violent storm, which dispersed it. The Hugh Gallant left alone, and letting in water in all directions, was only kept afloat with the greatest trouble. Rejoined on the 15th by his consorts, Cavendish tried in vain to land on Mocha Island, where Drake had been so maltreated by the Araucanians. This country, rich in gold and silver, had hitherto successfully resisted all Spanish attempts to subjugate it, and its inhabitants, fully determined to maintain their liberty, repulsed by force of arms every attempt to land. It was necessary, therefore, to go to the island of St. Maria, where the Indians, who took the Englishmen for Spaniards, furnished them with abundance of maize, fowls, sweet potatoes, pigs, and other provisions. On the 30th, March, Cavendish dropped anchor in 32 degrees 50 minutes in the Bay of Quintero. A party of 30 musketeers advanced into the country and met with oxen, cows, wild horses, hares, and partridges in abundance. The little troop was attacked by the Spaniards, and Cavendish was obliged to return to his ships after losing twelve of his men. He afterwards ravaged, plundered, or burnt the towns of Paraca, Sincha, Pisca, and Paita, and devastated the island of Puna, where he obtained a booty in coined money of the value of 25,760 pounds. 
After having scuttled the Hugh Gallant, which was totally unfit any longer to keep the water, Cavendish continued his profitable cruising. Burnt, in the latitude of New Spain, a ship of 120 tons, plundered and burnt Aguatillo, and captured, after six hours of fighting, a vessel of 708 tons, laden with rich stuffs, and with 122,000 gold pesos. Then, victorious and contented, Cavendish wished to secure the great spoils which he was conveying against any chance of danger. He touched at the Ladrones, the Philippines, and Greater Java, doubled the Cape of Good Hope, recruited himself at St. Helena, and on the 9th of September, 1588, anchored at Plymouth. After two years of sailing, privateering, and fighting, at the end of two years after his return, of all the great fortune which he had brought back with him, there remained only a sum sufficient for the fitting out of a third, and as it proved, a last expedition. Cavendish started on the 6th, August, 1591, with five vessels, but a storm on the coast of Patagonia scattered the flotilla, which could not be collected again, until the arrival at Port Desire. Assailed by fearful hurricanes in the Strait of Magellan, Cavendish was obliged to go back, after having seen himself deserted by three of his ships. The want of fresh provisions, the cold, and the privations of all kinds which he underwent, and which had decimated his crew, forced him to return northwards along the coast of Brazil, where the Portuguese opposed every attempt at landing. He was therefore obliged to put to sea again, without having been able to revictual. Cavendish died, from grief perhaps as much as from hardships, before he reached the English coast. End of Second Part Chapter 4 Part 1. Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut. Section 39 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 Exploration of the World by Jules Verne Second Part, Chapter 4, Part 2 One year after the return of the companions of Barents, two ships, the Mauritius and the Hendrik Frederick, with two yachts, the Indracht and Esperance, having on board a crew of 248 men, quitted Amsterdam on the 2nd of July, 1598. The commander-in-chief of this squadron was Oliver de Noort, a man at that time about thirty or thereabouts, and well known as having made several long cruising voyages. His second-in-command and vice-admiral was Jacob Claus d'Urpenda, and as pilot there was a certain Mellis, a skilful sailor of English origin. This expedition, fitted out by the merchants of Amsterdam, with the concurrence and aid of the States General of Holland, had a double purpose, at once commercial and military. Formerly, the Dutch had contented themselves with fetching from Portugal the merchandise which they distributed by means of their coasting vessels throughout Europe, but now they were reduced to the necessity of going to seek the commodities in the scene of their production. For this object, de Noort was to show his countrymen the route inaugurated by Magellan, and on the way to inflict as much injury as he could upon the Spaniards and Portuguese. At this period, Philip II, whose yoke the Dutch had shaken off, and who had just added Portugal to his possessions, had forbidden his subjects to have any commercial intercourse with the rebels of the Low Countries. It was thus a necessity for Holland, if she did not wish to be ruined, and as a consequence, to fall anew under Spanish rule, to open up for herself a road to the Spice Islands. The route, which was the least frequented by the enemy's ships, was that by the Strait of Magellan, and this was the one which de Noort was ordered to follow. After touching at Goree, the Dutch anchored in the Gulf of Guinea, at the island do Principe. Here the Portuguese pretended to give a friendly welcome to the men who went on shore but they took advantage of a favorable opportunity to fall upon and massacre them without mercy. Among the dead were Cornille de Nuort, brother of the Admiral, Mellis, Daniel Goertz, and John de Bremen, the captain, Peter Essius, being the only man who escaped it. It was a sorrowful commencement for a campaign, 
a sad presage which was destined not to remain unfulfilled. De Noort, who was furious over this foul play, landed from his ships 120 men, but he found the Portuguese so well entrenched that after a brisk skirmish in which 17 more of his men were either killed or wounded, he was obliged to weigh anchor, without having been able to avenge the wicked and cowardly perfidy to which his brother and twelve of his companions had fallen victim. On the 25th December, one of the pilots named Jan Volkers was abandoned on the African coast as a punishment for his disloyal intrigues, for endeavouring to foment a spirit of despondency amongst the crews, and for his well-proved rebellion. On the 5th January, the island of Anoban, situated in the Gulf of Guinea, a little below the line, was sighted, and the course of the ships was changed for crossing the Atlantic. De Noort had scarcely cast anchor in the Bay of Rio de Janeiro before he sent some sailors on shore to obtain water and buy provisions from the natives. But the Portuguese opposed the landing, and killed eleven men. Afterwards, repulsed from the coast of Brazil by the Portuguese and the natives, driven back by contrary winds, having made vain efforts to reach the island of St. Helena, where they had hoped to obtain the provisions for which they were in the most pressing want, the Dutchmen, deprived of their pilot, toss at random upon the ocean. They land upon the desert islands of Martin Vaz, again reach the coast of Brazil at Rio Doce, which they mistake for Ascension Island, and are finally obliged to winter in the desert island of Santa Clara, the putting into port at this place was marked by several disagreeable events. The flagship struck upon a rock with so much violence that had the sea been a little rougher, she must have been lost. There were also some bloody and barbarous executions of mutinous sailors, notably that of a poor man, who having wounded a pilot with a knife thrust was condemned to have his hand nailed to the mainmast. The invalids, of whom there were many on board the fleet, were brought on shore, and nearly all were cured by the end of a fortnight. From the 2nd to the 21st of June, de Noort remained in the island, which was not more than three miles from the mainland. But before putting to sea he was obliged to burn the Indracht, for he had not sufficient men to work her. It was not until the 20th December, after having been tried by many storms, that he was able to cast anchor in Port Desir, where the crew killed in a few days a quantity of dogfish and sea lions, as well as more than 5,000 penguins. The general landed, said the French translation of de Noort's narrative, published by de Vry, with a party of armed men, but they saw nobody, only some graves placed on high situations among the rocks, in which the people bury their dead, putting upon the grave a great quantity of stones, all painted red, having besides adorned the graves with darts, plumes of feathers, and other singular articles which they use as arms. The Dutch saw also, but at too great a distance to shoot them, buffaloes, stags, and ostriches, and from a single nest they obtained ten ostrich eggs. Captain Jacob Jean Souy de Cooper died during the stay at this place, and was interred at Port Desir. On the 23rd November, the fleet entered the Strait of Magellan. During a visit to the shore, three Dutchmen were killed by some Patagonians, and their death was avenged by the massacre of a whole tribe of Anus. The long navigation through the Narrows and the lakes of the Strait of Magellan was signalized by the meeting of, with two Dutch ships under the command of Sibald de Wert, who had wintered not far from the Bay of Mauritius, and by the abandoning of Vice Admiral Claus, who, as it would appear, had been several times guilty of insubordination. Are not these the acts which we see so frequently committed by English, Dutch, and Spanish navigators, a true sign of the times? a deed which we should now regard nowadays as one of terrible barbarity seemed doubtless a relatively mild punishment in the eyes of men so accustomed to set but little value upon human life nevertheless could anything be more cruel than to abandon a man in a desert country without arms and without provisions to put him on shore in a country peopled by ferocious cannibals prepared to make a repast on his flesh what was it but condemning him to a horrible death on the 29th of February, 1600, de Noort, after having been ninety-nine days in passing through the strait, came out onto the Pacific Ocean. A fortnight later a storm separated him from the Hendrik Frederick, which was never again heard of. As for de Noort, who had now with him only one yacht besides his own vessel, he cast anchor at the island of Mocha, 
and unlike the experience of his predecessors, he was very well received by the natives. Afterwards he sailed along the coast of Chile, where he was able to obtain provisions in abundance in exchange for Nuremberg knives, hatchets, shirts, hats, and other articles of no great value. After ravaging, plundering, and burning several towns on the Peruvian coast, after sinking all the vessels that he met with, and amassing a considerable booty, de Noort, hearing that a squadron commanded by the brother of the viceroy Don Luis de Velasco had been sent in pursuit of him, judged it time to make for the Ladrone Islands, where he anchored on the 16th of September. The inhabitants came around our ship with more than two hundred canoes, there being three, four, or five men in each canoe, crying out all together, Hero, Hero, iron, iron, which is greatly in request among them. They are as much at home in the water as upon land, and are very clever divers, as we perceived when we threw five pieces of iron into the sea, which a single man went to search for. De Noort could testify, unfortunately, that these islands well deserved their name. The islanders tried even to drag the nails out of the ship, and carried off everything upon which they could lay their hands. One of them, having succeeded in climbing along a part of the rigging, had the audacity to enter a cabin and seize upon a sword, with which he threw himself into the sea. On the 14th October following, de Noor traversed the Philippine archipelago, where he made several descents, and burned, plundered, or sunk a number of Spanish or Portuguese vessels, and some Chinese junks. While cruising the Strait of Manila, he was attacked by two large Spanish vessels, and in the battle which followed, the Dutch had five men killed and twenty-five wounded, and lost the brigantine, which was captured with her crew of twenty-five men. The Spaniards lost more than two hundred men, for their flagship caught fire and sank. Far from picking up the wounded, and the able-bodied men, who were trying to save themselves by swimming, the Dutch, making way with sails set on the foremast, across the heads which were to be seen in the water, pierced some with lances, and also discharged their cannon over them. After this bloody and fruitless victory, de Noort went to recruit at Borneo, captured a rich cargo of spices at Java, and having doubled the Cape of Good Hope, landed at Rotterdam on the 26th of August having only one ship and forty-eight men remaining. If the merchants who had defrayed the expenses of the expedition approved of the conduct of de Noort, who brought back a cargo, which more than reimbursed them for their expenditure, and who had taught his countrymen the way to the Indies, it behoves us, while extolling his qualities as a sailor, to take great exception to the manner in which he exercised the command, and to mete out severe blame for the barbarity which has left a stain of blood upon the first Dutch voyage of circumnavigation. We have now to speak of a man who, endowed with eminent qualities and with at least equal defects, carried on his life's work in divers, sometimes even in opposing directions, and who, after having reached the highest summit of honor to which a gentleman could aspire, at last laid his head upon a scaffold, accused of treason and felony. This man is Sir Walter Raleigh. If he have any claim to a place in this portrait gallery of great sailors, it is neither as founder of any English colony, nor as a sailor. It is as a discoverer, and what we have to say of him is not to his credit. Walter Raleigh passed five years in France, fighting against the League, in the midst of all those garçons who formed the basis of the armies of Henry of Navarre, and in such society he perfected the habits of boasting and falsehood which belonged to his character. In 1577, after a campaign in the Low Countries against the Spaniards, he returns to England and takes a deep interest in the questions so passionately debated among his three brothers by his mother's side, John, Humphrey, and Adrian Gilbert. At this period England was passing through a very grave economic crisis, the practice of agriculture was undergoing a transformation in all directions. Grazing was being substituted for tillage, and the number of agricultural laborers was greatly reduced by the change. From thence arose general distress, and also such a surplusage of population as was fast becoming a matter of anxious concern. At the same time, to long wars succeeds a peace, destined to endure throughout the reign of Elizabeth, so that a great number of adventurers know not how to find indulgence for their love of violent emotions. 
At this moment, therefore, arises the necessity for such an emigration as may relieve the country of its population, may permit all the miserable people dying of hunger to provide for their own wants in a new country, and by that means may increase the influence and prosperity of the mother country. All the more thoughtful minds of England, who follow the course of public opinion, Hacklett, Thomas Harriet, Carlyle, Peckham, and the brothers Gilbert, are struck with this need. But it is to the last name that belongs the credit of indicating the locality suitable for the establishing of colonies. Raleigh only joined with his brothers in the scheme, following their lead, but he neither conceived nor began the carrying into execution, as he has been too often credited with doing, of this fruitful project, the colonization of the American shores of the Atlantic. If Raleigh, all-powerful with Queen Elizabeth, fickle and nevertheless jealous in her affections, as she was, encourage his brothers, if he expend himself forty thousand pounds sterling in his attempts at colonization, he still takes good care not to quit England, for the life of patience and self-devotion of the founder of a colony would have no attractions for him. He gives up and sells his patent as soon as he perceives the inutility of his efforts, while he does not forget to reserve for himself the fifth part of any profit arising eventually from the colony. At the same time, Raleigh fits out some vessels against the Spanish possessions, and himself soon takes part in the strife and the battles which saved England from the invincible armada, afterwards proceeding to support the claims of the prior de Crato on the throne of Portugal. It is a short time after his return to England that he falls into disgrace with his royal mistress, and after his release from prison, while he is confined to his princely mansion in Sherborne, he conceives the project of his voyage to Guiana. To his mind, this is a gigantic enterprise, of which the marvellous results are destined to draw upon him the attention of the whole world, and to restore to him the favour of his sovereign. Would not the discovery and conquest of El Dorado, of the country in which, according to Aureliana, the temples are roofed with plates of gold, where all the tools, even those for the meanest purposes, are made of gold, where one walks upon precious stones, procure for him greater glory, these are the very words which Raleigh employs in his account, than Cortes had gained in Mexico or Pizarro in Peru. He will have under him more golden towns and nations than the king of Spain, the sultan of the Turks, and no matter what emperor. We have already spoken of the fables which Aureliana had invented in 1539, and which had been the fruitful source of more than one legend. Humboldt discloses what had given them birth when he describes to us the nature of the soil and the rocks which surround Lake Parima, between the Esquibo and Bronco. They are, says this great traveller, rocks of micaceous slate and of sparkling talc, which are resplendent in the midst of a sheet of water, which acts as a reflector beneath the burning tropical sun. So are explained those massive domes of gold, those obelisks of silver, and all those marvels of which the boastful and enthusiastic minds of the Spaniards afforded them a glimpse. Did Raleigh really believe in the existence of this city of gold, for the conquest of which he was about to sacrifice so many lives? Was he thoroughly convinced himself, or did he not yield to the illusions of a mind eager for glory? It is impossible to say, but this at least is indisputable, that, to borrow from the just expressions of M. Philaret Charles, at the moment, even of his embarkation, men did not believe in his promises. They were suspicious of his exaggerations, and dreaded the results of an expedition directed by a man so foolhardy and of a morality so equivocal. Nevertheless, it seemed that Raleigh had foreseen everything needful for this undertaking, and that he had made the necessary studies. Not only did he speak of the nature of the soil of Guiana, of its productions and its inhabitants with imperturbable insurance, but he had taken care to send, at his own expense, a ship commanded by Captain Whitton, to prepare the way for the fleet which he intended to, to conduct in person to the banks of the Orinoco. What he took good care, however, not to confide to the public, was that all the information he received from his emissary was unfavorable to the enterprise. Raleigh himself started from Plymouth on the 9th February, 1595, with a small fleet of five vessels and one hundred soldiers, without reckoning marines, officers, and volunteers. 
After stopping four days at Fort Aventura, one of the Canaries, to take in wood and water there, he reached Tenerife, where Captain Barreton ought to have rejoined him. Having waited for him in vain for eighty days, Raleigh sailed for Trinidad, where he met Witten. The island of Trinidad was at that time governed by Don Antonio de Berreo, who, it is said, had obtained accurate information concerning Guiana. The arrival of the English did not please him, and he immediately dispatched emissaries to Cumana and to Margarita, with orders to gather together the troops to attack the Englishmen, while at the same time he forbade any Indians or Spaniards to hold intercourse with them under pain of death. Raleigh, forewarned, determined to be beforehand with him. At nightfall he landed in secret with one hundred men, captured the town of St. Joseph, to which the Indians set fire, without a blow, and carried off Berrio and the principal personages to the ships. At the same time arrived Captains Gifford and Ninin, from whom he had been separated upon the Spanish coasts. Raleigh at once sailed for the Orinoco, entered Capuri Bay with a large galley and three boats carrying one hundred sailors and soldiers, became entangled in the inextricable labyrinth of islands and canals which form the mouth of the river, and ascended the Orinoco for a distance of three hundred and thirty miles. The account which Raleigh gives of his campaign is so fabulous, with the coolness of a garçon transported to the banks of the Thames, he so heaps one falsehood upon the top of another that one is almost tempted to class his narrative amongst the number of imaginary voyages. He says that some Spaniards who had seen the town of Manoa, called El Dorado, told him that this town exceeds in size and wealth all the towns in the world, and everything which the conquistadores had seen in America. There is no winter there, he says, a soil dry and fertile, with game and birds of every species in great abundance, who filled the air with hitherto unknown notes. It was a real concert for us. My captain, sent to search for mines, perceived veins both of gold and silver, but as he had no tool but his sword, he was unable to detach these metals to examine them in detail. However, he carried away several bits of them, which he reserved for future examination. A Spaniard of Caracas called this mine Madre del Oro, Mother of Gold. Then, as Raleigh well knows that the public is on its guard against his exaggerations, he adds, It will be thought, perchance, that I am the sport of a false and cheating delusion. But why should I have undertaken a voyage thus laborious if I had not entertained the conviction that there is not a country upon earth which is richer in gold than Guiana? Whidden and Millashap, or surgeons, brought back several stones which resembled sapphires. I showed these stones to several inhabitants of Orinoco, who have assured me that there exists an entire mountain of them. An old cacique of the age of one hundred and ten, who nevertheless could walk ten miles without fatigue, came to see Raleigh, boasted to him of the formidable power of the emperor of Manoa, and proved to him that his forces were insufficient. He depicted these peoples as much civilized, as wearing clothes and possessing great riches, especially in plates of gold. Finally he spoke to him of a mountain of pure gold. Raleigh relates that he wished to approach this mountain, but, sad mischance, it was at that moment half submerged. It had the form of a tower, and appeared to me rather white than yellow. A torrent, which precipitated itself from the mountain, swollen by the rains, made a tremendous noise which could be heard at the distance of many miles, and which deafened our people. I recollected the description which Berrio had given of the brilliancy of the diamonds, and of the other precious stones scattered over the various parts of the country. I had, however, some doubts as to the value of these stones. Their extraordinary whiteness nevertheless surprised me. After a short time of repose on the banks of the Vinicapara, and a visit to the village of the cacique, the latter promised to conduct me to the foot of the mountain by a circuitous route. But at the sight of the numerous difficulties which presented themselves, I preferred to return to the mouth of the Cumana, where the caciques of the neighborhood came to bring various presents, consisting of the rare productions of the country. We will spare the reader the description of people three times taller than ordinary men, of cyclops, of natives who had their eyes upon their shoulders, their mouths in their chest, and the hair growing from the middle of the back, all affirmations seriously related, 
but which give to Raleigh's narrative a singular resemblance to a fairy tale. One fancies while reading it, it must be a page taken out of the Thousand and One Nights. If we put on one side all these figments of an imagination run mad, what gain has been derived for geography? There was certainly no pain spared in announcing, with much noise, and very great puffing, this fantastic expedition. And we may well say, with the fable writer, In fancy free I an author see, who says, The awful war I'll sing, of titans with the thunder king, of this grand promise the result we find is often wind. End of second part, chapter four, part two. Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut. Section forty of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume One, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter Five, Part One. Missionaries and Settlers, Merchants and Tourists. The seventeenth century has a distinctive character of its own, differing from that of the preceding century, in the fact that nearly all the great discoveries have been already made, and that the work of this whole period consists almost exclusively in perfecting the information already acquired. It contrasts equally with a century which is to succeed it, because scientific methods are not yet applied by astronomers and sailors as they are to be one hundred years later. It appears, in fact, that the narratives of the first explorers, who were only able, so to speak, to obtain a glimpse of the regions which they traversed while waging their wars, may have in some degree exercised a baneful influence upon the public mind. Curiosity, in the narrowest sense of the word, is carried to an extreme. Men travel over the world to gain an idea of the manners and customs of each nation, of the productions and manufactures of each country, but there is no real study. They do not seek to trace what they see to its source, and to reason scientifically upon the why and wherefore of the facts. They behold, curiosity is satisfied, and they pass on. The observations made do not penetrate beneath the surface, and the great object appears to be to visit, as rapidly as may be, all the regions which the sixteenth century has brought to light. Besides, the abundance of the wealth diffused on a sudden over the whole of Europe has caused an economic crisis. Commerce, like industry, is transformed and altered. New ways are opened, new mediums arise, new wants are created, luxury increases, and the eagerness to make a fortune, rapidly, by speculation, turns the heads of many. If Venice, from a commercial point of view, be dead, the Dutch are about to constitute themselves, to use a happy expression of M. Leroy Beaulieu, the carriers and agents of Europe, and the English are preparing to lay the foundations of their vast colonial empire. To the merchants succeed the missionaries. They alight in large numbers upon the newly discovered countries, preaching the gospel, civilizing the barbarous nations, studying and describing the country. The development of apostolic zeal is one of the dominant features of the seventeenth century and it behoves us to recognize all that geography and historic science owe to these devoted, learned, and unassuming men. The traveller only passes through a country, the missionary dwells in it. The latter has evidently much greater facilities for acquiring an intimate knowledge of the history and civilization of the nations which he studies. It is therefore very natural that we should owe to them narratives of journeys, descriptions, and histories which are still consulted with advantage, and which have served as a basis for later works. If there be any country to which these reflections more particularly apply, it is to Africa, and especially to Abyssinia. How much of this vast triangular continent of Africa was known in the seventeenth century? Nothing but the coasts, it will be said. A mistake. From the earliest times, the two branches of the Nile, the Astapus and the Baral Abiyat, had been known to the ancients. They had even advanced, if the lists of countries and nations discovered at Karnak by M. Mariette may be believed, 
as far as the great lakes of the interior. In the twelfth century, the Arab geographer Edrisi writes an excellent description of Africa for Roger II of Sicily, and confirms these data. Later on, Cadamosto and Ibn Battuta travel over Africa, and the latter goes as far as Timbuktu. Marco Polo affirms that Africa is only united to Asia by the Isthmus of Suez, and he visits Madagascar. Lastly, when the Portuguese, led by Vasco da Gama, have completed the circumnavigation of Africa, some of them remain in Abyssinia, and in a short time diplomatic relations are established between that country and Portugal. We have already said something of Francesco Alvarez. In his train, several Portuguese missionaries settle in the country, amongst whom must be named Fathers Paez and Lobo. Father Paez left Goa in 1588 to preach Christianity upon the eastern coast of North Africa. After long and sad mishaps, he landed at Massowa in Abyssinia, traversed the country, and in 1618 pushed on as far as the sources of the Blue Nile, a discovery the authenticity of which Bruce was hereafter to dispute, but of which the narrative differs only in some unimportant particulars from that of the Scotch traveller. In 1604, Paez arrived at the court of the king Zadengel, had preached with such success that he had converted the king and all his court. He had even soon acquired so great an influence over the Abyssinian monarch that the latter, in writing to the Pope and to the King of Spain to offer them his friendship, asked them to send him men fitted to teach his people. Father Geronimo Lobo landed in Abyssinia with Alfonso Meneses, patriarch of Ethiopia, in 1625. But times were greatly changed. The king converted by Paez had been murdered, and his successor, who had summoned the Portuguese missionaries, died after a short time. A violent revulsion of feeling ensued against the Christians, and the missionaries were driven away, imprisoned, or given up to the Turks. Lobo was charged with the mission of obtaining the sum necessary for the ransom of his companions. After many wanderings which led him to Brazil, Cartagena, Cadiz, and Seville, to Lisbon and to Rome, where he gave the Pope and the King of Spain numerous and accurate details upon the Church of Ethiopia and the manners of the inhabitants, he made a last journey in India, and returned to Lisbon to die in 1678. Christianity had been introduced into Congo upon the Atlantic coast in 1489, the year of its discovery by the Portuguese. At first Dominicans were sent, but as they made scarce any progress, the Pope, with the consent of the King of Portugal, dispatched thither some Italian Capuchins. These were Carli de Placenza, in 1667, Giovanni Antonio Cavazzi, from 1654 to 1668, afterwards Antonio Zuccelli and Gradisca, from 1696 to 1704. We shall mention these missionaries only because they have published accounts of their journeys. Cavazzi explored in succession Angola, the country of Matumba, and the islands of Coanza and Loana. In the ardour of his apostolic zeal, he could devise no better means of converting the blacks than by burning their idols, rebuking the kings for the time-honoured custom of polygamy, and subjecting to torture or to being torn with whips those who relapsed into idolatry. Notwithstanding all this, he gained considerable ascendancy over the natives, which, if it had been well directed, might have produced very useful results in the development of civilization and the progress of religion. The same reproach is due also to Father Succelli and to the other missionaries in Congo. The narrative of Cavazzi, published at Rome in 1687, asserted that Portuguese influence extended from 200 to 300 miles from the coast, and that in the interior there existed a very important town known by the name of San Salvador, which possessed twelve churches, a Jesuit college, and a population of fifty thousand souls. At the close of the fourteenth century, Pigafetta published the account of the journey of Duarte Lopez, ambassador from the King of Congo to the courts of Rome and Lisbon. A map which accompanies this narrative presents to us a Lake Zambre, in the very place occupied by Lake Tanganyika, and more to the west, Lake Aqualunda, from whence issued the Congo River. South of the Equator, two lakes are indicated, one the Lake of the Nile, the other, more to the east, bears the name of Kolue. They appear to be the Albert and Victoria Nyanza. 
this most curious information was rejected by the geographers of the nineteenth century who left blank the whole interior of africa upon the west coast of africa at the mouth of the senegal the french had established settlements which under the skilful administration of andrew brew speedily received considerable extension Bourin, commandant for the king and director-general of the royal french company upon the senegal coast and in other parts of africa so ran his official title although he may be little known and the article which treats of him may be one of the most curtailed in the great collections of biography deserves to occupy one of the most prominent positions among colonizers and explorers not content with extending the colony as far as its present limits he explored countries which have been only lately revisited by lieutenant mage or which have not been visited at all since brewer's time he carried the french outposts eastwards above the junction of the senegal and the falame northwards as far as arguin which we have since abandoned although reserving our rights and southwards as far as the island of bissau he explored the interior galam and bambouk so rich in gold and collected the earliest documents concerning the pools pearls or fools the yolofs and the mussulman who coming from the north attempted the religious conquest of all the black nations of the country the information thus collected by brewer about the history and migrations of these various people is of the greatest value affording clear light even in the present day to the geographer and the historian not only has Bruin left us the narrative of deeds of which he was witness, and the description of the places which he visited, but we also owe to him much information about the productions of the countries, the plants, the animals, and all the objects which would give occasion for commercial or industrial enterprise. These most curious documents, put together very maladroitly, it must be confessed, by Father Labat, formed the subject, a few years ago, of a very interesting work by M. Balliou, to the southeast of Africa, during the first half of the seventeenth century, the French founded some commercial settlements in Madagascar, an island long known under the name of St. Lawrence. They built Fort Dauphin, under the administration of M. de Flacourt. Several unknown districts of the island are explored, as well as the neighboring islands upon the coast. The Mascarene Islands are occupied in 1649. Although firm and moderate towards his countrymen, the Flacour did not use the same self-control towards the natives. He even brought about a general revolt, as a consequence of which he was recalled. Expeditions into the interior of Madagascar were henceforth very rare, and it is not until the present day that we find a thorough exploration carried out. Of Indochina and Tibet, the only information which reached Europe during the whole of the seventeenth century was due to the missionaries. Such names as Father Alexandre de Rode, Ant d'Andrada, Avril, Benedict Goes, may not be passed over in silence. In their annual letters is to be found a quantity of information which even in the present day retains a real interest as concerning regions so long closed against Europeans. In Koshin, China, and Tonkin, Father Tachar devoted himself to astronomical observations of which the result was to prove by the most conclusive evidence the great errors in the longitudes given by Ptolemy. This called the attention of the learned world to the necessity of a reform in the graphic representation of the countries of the extreme east, and for attaining this end to the absolute need of close observations made by specially qualified scientific men or by navigators familiar with astronomical calculations. The country which specially attracted the missionaries was China, that enormous and populous empire which ever since the arrival of Europeans in India had persevered with the greatest strictness in the absurd policy of abstention from any intercourse whatsoever with foreigners. It was not until the close of the sixteenth century that the missionaries obtained the permission, so often demanded before in vain, to penetrate into the Middle Empire. Their knowledge of mathematics and astronomy facilitated their settlement and enabled them to gather as well from the ancient annals of the country as during their journeys a prodigious quantity of most valuable information concerning the history ethnography and geography of the celestial empire fathers mendoza ricci trigot visselou lecomte verbiès navarette chal and martini 
deserve a special mention for having carried to china the arts and sciences of europe while they diffuse in the west the first accurate and precise information upon the unprogressive civilization of the flowery land End of section 40section 41 of celebrated travels and travellers volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anna simon celebrated travels and travellers volume 1 exploration of the world by jules verne second part chapter 5 part 2a Missionaries and settlers, merchants and tourists. The Dutch were not slow in perceiving the weakness and decadence of the Portuguese power in Asia. They felt with how much ease a clever and prudent nation might in a short time become possessed of the whole commerce of the extreme east. After a considerable number of private expeditions and voyages of reconnaissance, they had founded in 1602 that celebrated company of the indies which was destined to raise to so high a pitch the wealth and prosperity of the metropolis equally in its strife with the portuguese as in its dealing with the natives the company pursued a very skilful policy of moderation far from founding colonies or repairing and occupying the fortresses which they took from the portuguese the dutch bore themselves as simple traders exclusively occupied with their commerce they avoided building any fortified factory, except at the intersection of the great commercial roads. Thus they were able in a short time to seize all the carrying trade between India, China, Japan, and Oceania. The one fault committed by the all-powerful company was the concentrating in its own hands a monopoly of the trade in spices. It drove away the foreigners who had settled in the Moluccas or in the islands of Sunda, or who came thither to obtain a cargo of spices. It even went the length, in order to raise the price of this valuable commodity, of prescribing the cultivation of certain species in a large number of islands, and of forbidding, under pain of death, the exportation and sale of seeds and cuttings of the spice-producing trees. In a few years the Dutch were established in Java, Sumatra, Borneo, the Moluccas, and at the Cape of Good Hope, harbours the best placed for ships returning to Europe. It was at this time that a rich merchant of Amsterdam, Jacob Le Maire, in concert with a skilful mariner named Wilhelm Cornelis Schouten, conceived a project for reaching the Indies by a new route. The Dutch States General had in fact forbidden any subject of the United Provinces, not in the pay of the Company of the Indies, from going to the Spice Islands by way of the Cape of Good Hope or of the Strait of Magellan. Schouten, according to some, Le Maire, according to others, had formed the idea of eluding this interdict by seeking a passage to the south of Magellan's Strait. This much is certain, that Le Maire bore one half of the expense of the expedition, while Schouten, by the aid of several merchants whose names have been handed down to us, and who filled the chief offices in the town of Hoorn, provided the other half. They fitted out the Concorde, a vessel of 360 tons, and a yacht, carrying together a crew of sixty-five men and twenty-nine cannon. This was certainly an equipment but little in accordance with the magnitude of the enterprise. But Schouten was a skilful mariner, the crew had been carefully chosen, and the vessels were abundantly furnished with provisions and spare rigging. Le Maire was commissioner, and Schouten the captain of the ship. The destination was kept secret, and officers and crew entered into an unlimited engagement to go wherever they might be led. On the 25th June, 1615, eleven days after quitting the Tessel, and when there was no longer anything to be feared from indiscretion, the crews were assembled to listen to the reading of an order which ran as follows, quote, The two vessels would seek another passage than that of Magellan, by which to enter the South Sea, and to discover there certain southern countries, in the hope of obtaining enormous profits from them, and if heaven should not favour this design, they would repair by means of the same sea to the East Indies. End quote. This declaration was received with enthusiasm by the whole crew, who were animated, like all Dutchmen of that period, with a love for great discoveries. 
the route then usually pursued for reaching south america as may perhaps have been already observed followed the african coasts as far as below the equator the concord did not try to deviate from it she reached the shores of brazil patagonia and port desire at three hundred miles to the north of the strait of magellan but was for several days hindered by storms from entering the harbour the yacht even remained for the space of one whole tide aground and lying on her side but high water set her afloat again only for a short time however for whilst some repairs were being done to her keel her rigging took fire and she was consumed in spite of the energetic efforts of the two crews on the thirteenth january sixteen sixteen le maire and schouten arrived at the sebaldine islands discovered by sebald de weert and followed the coast of tierra del fuego at a short distance from land the coast ran east quarter southeast and was skirted by high mountains covered with snow on the twenty fourth of january at midday they sighted its extreme point but eastward stretched some more land which also appeared to be of great elevation the distance between these two islands according to the general opinion appeared to be about twenty-four miles and schouten entered the strait which divided them it was so encumbered with whales that the ship was obliged to tack more than once to avoid them the island to the east received the name of staten island and that to the west the name of maurice of nassau twenty-four hours after entering this strait which received the name of le maire the ship emerged from it and to an archipelago of small islands situated to starboard was given the name of barneveld in honour of the grand pensionary of holland in fifty eight degrees le maire doubled cape horn so named in remembrance of the town where the expedition had been fitted out and entered the south sea le maire afterwards went northwards as far as the parallel of the juan fernandez islands where he judged it wise to stop in order to recruit his men who were suffering from scurvy as magellan had done le maire and schouten passed without perceiving them amongst the principal polynesian archipelagos and cast anchor on the tenth april at the island of dogs where it was only possible to procure a little fresh water and some herbs they hoped to reach the solomon islands but in the north the dangerous archipelago was entered in which were discovered waterland island so named on account of its containing a great lake and fly island because a cloud of these insects settled upon the vessel and it was impossible to get rid of them until at the end of four days there was a change of wind afterwards le maire crossed the friendly archipelago and entered that of the navigators or of samoa of which four small islands still retain the names which were then given to them Hoop, cocoa horn and traitors islands the inhabitants of these parts showed themselves extremely addicted to stealing they tried to draw out the bolts from the ship and to break the chains scurvy continued to prevail among the crew and it was therefore a great boon to receive from the king a present of a black boar and some fruits the sovereign who was named la tau speedily arrived in a large canoe with sails in shape like the dutch sledges Trinot, escorted by a flotilla of five-and-twenty boats the king did not venture himself to go on board the concord but his son was of a bolder spirit and inquired the reason of everything he saw with the most lively curiosity the next day the number of canoes was greatly augmented and the dutch perceived by certain indications that an attack was impending accordingly a shower of stones falls on a sudden upon the ship the canoes approach nearer become annoying and the dutch to free themselves from them are forced to resort to a discharge of musketry this island was rightly named traitor's island it was now the eighteenth of may and le maire ordered the course to be changed that the moluccas might be reached by the north of new guinea he probably passed within sight of the solomon archipelago the admiralty islands and the thousand islands mille Isles, coasting afterwards along new guinea from hundred and forty three degrees to Geoing bay he frequently landed and gave names to a number of points the twenty-five islands which form a part of the admiralty archipelago the high corner the high mountain hoogberg which seems to correspond to a portion of the neighbouring coast of cornelis kinert bay moa and arimoa two islands again seen later on by tasman the island to which was given the name of schouten but which is now called misore 
and which must not be confounded with some other Schouten Islands situated upon the coast of Guinea, but much farther to the west. And finally, the Cape Goede Hoop, which appears to be Cape Saavedra, at the western extremity of Misore. After sighting the country of Papua, Schouten and Le Maire reached Kilolo, one of the Moluccas, where they received an eager welcome from their compatriots. When they were thoroughly rested from their fatigues and cured of scurvy, the Dutch went to Batavia, arriving there on the 23rd October, 1616, only thirteen months after quitting the Tessel, and having lost only thirteen men during the long voyage. But the Company of the Indies did not at all understand their privileges being infringed upon, and a possibility discovered of reaching the colonies by a way not foreseen in the letters patent which had been granted to the Company at the time of its establishment. The governor caused the Concorde to be seized, and arrested her officers and sailors, whom he sent off to Holland, there to be tried. Poor Le Maire, who had expected a totally different recompense for his toils and fatigues, and for the discoveries which he had made, could not bear up under the blow which had fallen so unexpectedly upon him. He fell ill of grief, and died in the latitude of the island of Mauritius. As for Schouten, he appears not to have been molested upon his return to his own country, and to have made several voyages to the Indies, which were not distinguished by any fresh discovery. He was returning to Europe in 1625, when he was forced by bad weather to enter Antongil Bay, upon the east coast of Madagascar, where he died. Such was the history of this important expedition, which by means of Strait Le Maire opened up a shorter and less dangerous route than that by Magellan Strait, an expedition signalized by several discoveries in Oceania, and by a more attentive exploration of points already seen by Spanish or Portuguese navigators. But it is often a matter of difficulty to settle with accuracy to which of these nations the discovery of certain islands, countries, or archipelagos in the neighborhood of Australia may be due. Since we are speaking of the Dutch, we shall put the chronological order of discoveries a little on one side, that we may relate as well as those of Mendana and Queros, the expeditions of Jan Abel Tasman. What was the early history of Tasman? By what concurrence of circumstances did he embrace the profession of a sailor? By what means did he acquire the nautical skill and science of which he gave so many proofs, and which conducted him to his important discoveries? From ignorance we cannot answer these questions. All we know of his biography commences with his departure from Batavia on 2nd June, 1639. After passing the Philippines, he would seem during this first voyage to have visited in company with Matthew Quast the Bonin Islands, then known by the fantastic title of the Gold and Silver Islands. In his second expedition, composed of two vessels of which he had the chief command, and which sailed from Batavia on the 14th of August, 1642, he reached the Mauritius on the 5th of September, and afterwards sailed to the southeast, seeking for the Australian continent. On the 24th of November, in latitude 42 degrees 25 seconds south, he discovered land, to which he gave the name of Van Diemen, after the governor of the Sunda Islands, but which is now with much greater justice called Tasmania. He anchored there in Frederick Hendrik Bay, and ascertained that the country was inhabited, although he could not see a single native. After following this coast for a certain time, he sailed eastwards, with the intention of afterwards making once more for the north, to reach the Solomon Archipelago. On the 13th December, in latitude 42 degrees 10 seconds, he came in sight of a mountainous country, which he followed towards the north, until the 18th December, when he cast anchor in a bay. But even the boldest of the savages whom he met with there did not approach the ship within a stone's throw. Their voices were rough, their statue tall, their colour brown inclining to yellow, and their black hair, which was nearly as long as that of the Japanese, was worn drawn up to the crown of the head. On the morrow they summoned courage to go on board one of the vessels, and carry on traffic by means of barter. Tasman, upon seeing these pacific dispositions, dispatched a boat for the purpose of obtaining a more accurate knowledge of the shore. Of the sailors who manned it, three were killed without provocation by the natives while the others escaped by swimming, and were picked up by the ship's boats. But by the time they were in readiness to fire upon the assailants, these had disappeared. The spot where this sad event happened received the name of Assassins, Mordenaars Bay. 
Tasman, who felt convinced that he could not carry on any intercourse with such fierce people, weighed anchor and sailed up the coast as far as its extreme point, which he named Cape Maria van Diemen, in honour of his lady, for a legend states that having had the audacity to pretend to the hand of the daughter of the governor of the East Indies, the latter had sent him to sea with two dilapidated ships, the Heemskerke and the Zegen. The land thus discovered received the name of Statenland, soon changed into that of New Zealand. On the 21st January 1643, Tasman discovered the islands of Amsterdam and Rotterdam, upon which he found a great quantity of pigs, fowls, and fruit. On the 6th February, the ships entered an archipelago consisting of a score of islands, which were called Prince William Islands, and after sighting Antong Java, Tasman followed the coast of New Guinea from Cape Santa Maria, passed by the various points previously discovered by Lemaire and Schouten, and anchored off Batavia on the 15th June following, after a ten months' voyage. In a second expedition, Tasman, in obedience to his orders dated 1664, was to visit Van Diemen's Land and to make a careful examination of the western coast of New Guinea, as far as 17 degrees south latitude in order to ascertain whether that island belonged to the Australian continent. It does not appear that Tasman carried out this programme, but the loss of his journals causes complete uncertainty as to the route which he followed, and the discoveries which he may have made. From this time there is no record of the events which marked the close of his career, nor of the place and date of his death. From the period of the taking of Malacca by Albuquerque, the Portuguese conceived that a new world extended to the south of Asia. Their ideas were soon shared by the Spaniards, and henceforward a series of voyages were made on the Pacific Ocean to search for a southern continent, of which the existence appeared geographically necessary to counterbalance the immense extent of the lands already known. Java the Great, designated later by the names of New Holland and Australia, had been seen by the French, perhaps, or as is more probable, by Saavedra, from 1530 to 1540, and it was sought for by a crowd of navigators, amongst whom we may mention the Portuguese, Serrao and Meneses, and the Spaniards, Saavedra, Hernando de Grijalva, Alvarado, and Inigo Ortiz de Rites, who explored the greater part of the islands to the north of New Guinea, as well as that great island itself. Afterwards come Mendana, Torres, and Quiros, upon whose deeds we shall pause a little, on account of the importance and authenticity of the discoveries which we owe to them. Alvaro Mendana de Nera was nephew to the governor of Lima, Don Pedro de Castro, who warmly advocated with the home government his nephew's project of searching for new countries in the Pacific Ocean. Mendana was one and twenty when he took the command of two ships and one hundred and twenty-five soldiers and sailors. He sailed from Calao, the port of Lima, on the 19th November, 1567, after sighting the small island of Jesus, he discovered on the 7th February, between 7 degrees and 8 degrees south latitudes, the island of Santa Isabella, where the Spaniards built a brigantine, with which they explored the archipelago of which this island was a part. The inhabitants, says the narrative of a companion of Mandana, quote, are anthropophagi, they devour those whom they can make their prisoners in war, and even without being in open hostility, those whom they can succeed in taking by treachery. End quote. One of the chiefs in the islands sent to Mandana as a delicacy a quarter of a child, but the Spanish commander caused it to be buried in the presence of the natives, who appeared much hurt by an act which they could not understand. The Spaniards explored the island Las Palmas, Palm Island, Los Ramos, so named because it was discovered on Palm Sunday, Galley Island, and Buena Vista of which the inhabitants, under the appearance of friendship, concealed hostile intentions which were not long in displaying themselves. The same reception awaited the Spaniards at the island San Dimas, at Cesarga, and at Quadalcanar, upon which ginger was found for the first time. In the return voyage to Santa Isabella, the Spaniards pursued a course which enabled them to discover St. George Island, where they found bats as large as kites. Scarcely had the crew of the brigantine cast anchor in the harbour of Santa Isabella than they were obliged again to weigh it, for the place was so unhealthy that five soldiers died and a great number of others were taken ill. 
Mendana stopped at the island of Guadalcanar, where out of ten men who had landed to fetch water, one negro alone escaped from the attacks of the natives, who were extremely angry at one of their fellows having been carried off by the Spaniards. The punishment was terrible. Twenty men were killed, and a number of houses burned. Mendana afterwards visited several islands of the Solomon Archipelago, amongst others the Three Marys and San Juan. Upon the latter island, whilst the ships were being repaired and caulked, several affrays with the natives occurred, in which some prisoners were made. After this checkered rest, Mandana again put to sea, and visited the islands of San Cristoval, Santa Catalina, and Santa Anna. But as by this time the number of invalids was considerable, the provisions and ammunition nearly exhausted, and the rigging become rotten, the flotilla now set out to return to Peru. The separation of the flagship, the discovery of certain islands which it is difficult to identify, and probably of the Sandwich Islands, violent storms during which the sails were carried away, the sickness caused by the insufficiency and putrefaction of the water and biscuit on board, were all incidents signalizing this long and trying return voyage, which was ended by the arrival of the ships at the port of Colima in California after five months of navigation. The narrative of Mandana excited no enthusiasm, in spite of the name of Solomon, which he gave to the archipelago discovered by him, to make it believed that from thence came the treasures of the Jewish king. Marvellous recitals had no longer any fascination for men glutted with the riches of Peru. Proofs were what they demanded. The smallest nugget of gold or the least grain of silver would have been more satisfactory to them. Mandana had twenty-seven years to wait before he was able to organize another expedition, but then his fleet was a large one, it being proposed to found a colony in the island of San Cristoval, which Alvaro de Mendana had seen during his first voyage. Thus four ships carrying nearly four hundred people sailed from the port of Lima on the 11th April, 1595. Among those on board may be named Doña Isabella, wife of Mendana, the three brothers-in-law of the general, and the pilot Pedro Fernandez Quiroz, who later on distinguished himself as commander-in-chief of another expedition. The fleet did not finally leave the Peruvian coast, where its equipment had been completed, until the 16th April. At the end of a month's navigation, not distinguished by any remarkable incident, an island was discovered, which according to custom received the name of the saint whose day it was, and was called Magdalena. Immediately the fleet was surrounded by a crowd of canoes bearing more than four hundred Indians, of fine stature and nearly white, and who, while presenting coconuts and other fruits to the sailors, appeared to entreat them to disembark. The natives no sooner came on board than they began to pilfer, and it was necessary to fire a cannon to get rid of them. A wound which one of the natives received in the fray soon changed their disposition, and a discharge of musketry was the reply to the shower of arrows which they let fly from their boats. Not far from this island three others were discovered, San Pedro, Dominica, and Santa Cristina and the name of Las Marquesas de Mendoza was given to the group, in honour of the governor of Peru. So friendly had been the intercourse at the beginning that an Indian woman, upon seeing the beautiful fair hair of Doña Isabella de Mendana, had begged her by signs to give her a curl of it. But, by the fault of the Spaniards, the mutual relations speedily became hostile, and so continued until the day when the natives, becoming conscious of the great inferiority of their arms, begged for peace. End of second part, chapter 5, part 2a. Section 42 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World, by Jules Verne. Second part, chapter 5, part 2b. On the 5th August, the Spanish flotilla again put to sea and made 1,200 miles west-northwest. On the 20th August were discovered the St. Bernard, since called Dangerous Islands, and afterwards Queen Charlotte's Islands, upon which, notwithstanding the scarcity of provisions, no landing was made. After Solitary Island, a name which explains its situation, the Santa Cruz archipelago was reached. But at this time, during a storm, the flagship became separated from the fleet, 
and although search was made several times, no tidings of her were obtained. Fifty canoes, carrying a crowd of natives of a tawny complexion or of a lustrous black, immediately approached the ships. Quote, all had frizzled hair, black, red, or some other colour, for it was dyed. Their teeth also were dyed red. The head was half-shaven, the body was naked, except a small veil of fine linen. The face and the arms painted black, glittering and striped with various colours. The neck and limbs loaded with several strings of small beads, of gold, or of black wood, of fish's teeth, or of a species of medals made of mother-of-pearl, or of pearls. End quote. For arms they carried bows, poisoned arrows with sharp points hardened in the fire, or tipped with bone and steeped in the juice of a herb, great stones, heavy wooden swords made of stiff wood, with three harpoon points, each more than a handbreadth long. Slung over their shoulders they had haversacks, exceedingly well made out of palm leaves, and filled with biscuits made from certain roots which served them for food. At first Mandana thought he recognized in these natives the inhabitants of the islands he was seeking, but he was quickly undeceived. The vessels were received with a shower of arrows, which was the more vexatious because Mandana, seeing that he could not find the Solomon Islands, had determined to establish his colony in this archipelago. At this juncture discord reigned among the Spaniards. A revolt fomented against the general was almost immediately suppressed, and the guilty were executed. But these sorrowful events and the fatigues of the voyage had so completely undermined the health of the head of the expedition that he died on the 17th October, after having had time to indicate his wife as his successor in the conduct of the enterprise. After the death of Mandana, the hostilities with the natives redoubled, and many of the Spaniards were so exhausted by sickness and hardships that a score of thoroughly determined natives might easily have gained the mastery over them. To persist in the intention of founding a settlement under such conditions would have been folly. All agreed in this, and the anchor was raised on the 18th November. Doña Isabella de Mandana's project was to go to Manila, and there to obtain recruits from amongst the colonists, with whom she would return to found a settlement. She consulted the officers, who all gave their approval in writing, and she found in Quiros a devotion and skill which were speedily to be put to a severe proof. They at once steered away from New Guinea, in order to avoid being entangled amongst the numerous archipelagos surrounding it, and also to enable them sooner to reach the Philippines, which the dilapidated state of the ships rendered necessary. After passing within sight of several islands surrounded by reefs of Madripoor, upon which the crews wished to land, a permission which Quiros, with great prudence, always refused, after having been separated from one of the ships of the squadron, which could not or would not follow, the flotilla arrived at the Ladrone, soon to be called the Mariana Islands. The Spaniards went on shore several times to buy some provisions. The natives did not desire either their silver or gold, but set the highest value upon iron and all tools made of that metal. The narrative contains here some details upon the veneration shown by the natives towards their ancestors, which are curious enough to warrant our reproducing them verbatim. Quote, they take out the bones from the bodies of their relations, burn the flesh, and mixing the ashes with tuba, a wine made from the cocoa palm, swallow them. They weep for the dead every year for a whole week. There are a great number of female mourners who are to be hired for the purpose. Besides that, all the neighbors come to weep in the house of the deceased, the compliment being returned to them when the turn comes for the feast to take place at their house. These anniversaries are much frequented, all those assisting at them being liberally regaled. They weep all day and drink to intoxication all night. They recite in the midst of tears the life and deeds of the dead, beginning with the moment of his birth and dealing with the whole course of his life, recounting his strength, his height, his beauty, in a word, all that can in any way do him honour. If some amusing action occur in the recital, the company begin to laugh as if they would split their sides. Then, on a sudden, they drink and are again drowned in tears. There are sometimes two hundred persons present at these absurd anniversaries. End quote. When the Spanish crew arrived at the Philippines, it was scarcely more than a company of skeletons, emaciated and half dead with hunger. Doña Isabella landed at Manila on the 11th February, 1596, under a salute from the guns, and was solemnly received in the midst of the troops drawn up under arms. 
The rest of the crew, fifty having died since the departure from Santa Cruz, were housed and fed at the public expense, and the women all found husbands in Manila, except four or five who embraced the religious life. As for Doña Isabella, she was escorted back to Peru some time afterwards by Quiros, who lost no time in submitting to the Viceroy a project for a fresh voyage. But Luis de Velasco, who had succeeded Mendoza, referred the navigator to the King of Spain and the Council of the Indies, under the pretext that such a decision would overstep the limits of his authority. Quiros therefore went to Spain, and thence to Rome, where he received a kindly welcome from the Pope, who recommended him warmly to Philip III. At length, in 1605, after numberless applications and solicitations, he was empowered to fit out at Lima the two vessels which he should judge the most suitable for the investigation of the Australian continent and for continuing the discoveries of Mandana. With two ships and one light vessel, Quiros set out from Calao on the 21st December, 1605. At 3,000 miles from Peru, he had as yet discovered no land, in latitude twenty-five degrees south, he observed a group of small islands belonging to the dangerous archipelago. These were the Conversion de San Pablo, the Osnabrück of Wallace, and de Sena, so named because it was the tenth island seen. Although this island was defended by rocks, intercourse was carried on with the natives, whose dwellings were scattered about amongst palm trees on the seashore. The natives were strong and well proportioned, and their chief wore on his head a kind of crown made of small black feathers so fine and supple that they might have been taken for silk. His fair hair, which descended to the waist, excited the wonder of the Spaniards, who, not being able to understand how a man with so tawny coloured a face could have such light yellow hair, chose to think that he was married and that he wore his wife's hair. This singular colour was only due to the habitual use of powdered lime, which burns the hair and causes it to turn yellow. This island to which Quiros gave the name of Sagittaria is, according to Fleurieu, Tahiti, one of the principal of the group of society islands. On the succeeding days Quiros sighted several other islands, upon which he did not land, and to which he gave names taken from the calendar, according to a practice which has changed all the native nomenclature of Oceania into a veritable litany. One island visited may be especially noticed. It was named the island of La Gente Hermosa, on account of the beauty of its inhabitants, and of the fair colour and coquetry of its women, who, as the Spaniards declared, even bore away the palm for grace and attractiveness from their own fellow-countrywomen of Lima, whose beauty is proverbial. This island, according to Quiros, was situated upon the same parallel as Santa Cruz, to which he intended to go. He therefore sailed westward and reached an island called by the natives Taumaco, in ten degrees south latitude and 240 miles east of Santa Cruz. This must have been one of the Duff Islands, and here Quiros was told that if he directed his course southward, he would discover a great land of which the inhabitants were whiter than those whom he had hitherto seen. This information determined him to abandon his scheme of going to Santa Cruz. He steered in a southwesterly direction, and after having sighted several small islands, he arrived on the 1st May 1606 in a bay more than twenty-four miles broad. He gave to this island the name which it still bears, of Espiritu Santo. It was one of the New Hebrides group. What events happened during the stay of the ships here? The narrative is silent upon this subject but we know from other sources that the crew mutinied, made Quiros prisoner, and abandoning the second ship and the brigantine, set out on the 11th June to return to America, where they arrived on the 3rd October 1606, after a nine months voyage. M. Ed Charton throws no light upon this incident. He is silent upon the mutiny of the crew, and even throws all the blame of the separation upon the commander of the second vessel, Louis Vaz de Torres, who abandoned his chief in quitting Espiritu Santo. Now it is known by a letter from Torres himself to the King of Spain, published by Lord Stanley at the end of his English edition of Antoine de Morga's History of the Philippines, that he remained fifteen days waiting for Quiros in the Bay of St. Philip and St. James. The officers met in council, resolved to weigh anchor on the 26th June, and to continue the search for the Australian continent. Hindered by bad weather, which prevents him from sailing round Espiritu Santo Island, assailed by the demands of a crew over whom prevails a slight breath of mutiny, 
Torres decides to steer to the northeast to reach the Spanish islands. In eleven degrees thirty seconds he discovers land which he imagines must be the commencement of New Guinea. All this land is part of New Guinea, says Torres. Quote, it is peopled by Indians who are not very white, and who go naked, although their middles are covered with the bark of trees. They fight with javelins, bucklers, and certain clubs of stone, the whole adorned with beautiful feathers. All along this land there are other inhabited islands. Upon the whole of this coast there are numerous and vast harbours, with very broad rivers and great plains. Outside these islands stretch reefs and shallows. The islands are between these dangers and the mainland, and a channel runs between. We took possession of these harbours in your majesty's name. Having pursued this coast for nine hundred miles, and seen our latitude decrease from two and a half degrees until we found ourselves in nine degrees, at this point commenced a shoal of from three to five fathoms deep, which stretched along the coast to seven and a half degrees. Not being able to proceed farther on account of the numerous shallows and powerful currents, which we encountered, we decided to alter our course to the southwest by the deep channel which has been mentioned, as far as about eleven degrees. There is there, from one end to the other, an archipelago of innumerable islands by which I passed. At the end of the eleventh degree the bottom became deeper. There were some very large islands there, and there appeared to be more of them towards the south. They were inhabited by a black population, very robust and quite naked bearing for arms strong and long spears, arrows, and stone clubs roughly fashioned. End quote. Modern geographers are agreed in recognizing in the localities thus described that portion of the Australian coast which ends in York Peninsula and the extremity of New Guinea recently visited by Captain Moresby. It was known that Torres had entered the strait which has been named after him and which divides New Guinea from Cape York but the very recent exploration of the southeastern portion of New Guinea, of which the population has been discovered to be of a comparatively light colour and differing much from the Papus, has just furnished an unexpected confirmation of the discoveries of Curios. It is for this reason that we have dwelt at some length upon them, referring for the purpose to a very learned work of M. E. T. Hamy, which appeared in the Bulletin de la Société de Géographie. It behoves us now to say a few words about some travellers who explored some unfrequented countries and furnished their contemporaries with more exact knowledge of a world until then almost unknown. The first of these travellers is François Pirard of Laval. Having embarked in 1601 on board a St. Malo ship to go to the Indies to trade, he was wrecked in the Maldive archipelago. These islets or atolls, detached coral reefs, to the number of at least twelve thousand, descend into the Indian Ocean from Cape Comorin as far as the equator. The worthy Pirard relates his shipwreck, the flight of a portion of his companions in captivity in the archipelago, and his long sojourn of seven years upon the Maldive Islands, a stay rendered almost agreeable by the pains which he took to acquire the native language. He had plenty of time to learn the manners, customs, religion, and industries of the inhabitants, as well as to study the productions and climate of the country. Thus his narrative is filled with details of all kinds, and it retained its attractions until recent years, because travellers do not voluntarily frequent this unhealthy archipelago, the isolated situation of which had kept away foreigners and conquerors. Pirard's narrative, therefore, is still instructive and agreeable reading. In 1607, a fleet was sent to the Maldives by the King of Bengal, in order to carry off the 100 or 120 cannon which the Maldive sovereign owed to the wreck of numerous Portuguese vessels. Pirard, notwithstanding all the liberty allowed him, and that he had become a landholder, was desirous to behold his beloved Brittany once more. He therefore eagerly embraced this opportunity of quitting the archipelago with the three companions who out of the whole crew alone remained with him but the eventful travels of Pirard were not yet concluded. Taken first to Ceylon, he was carried afterwards to Bengal, and endeavoured to reach Cochin. Before reaching this town, he was captured by the Portuguese, and carried prisoner to Cochin. He afterwards fell ill and was nursed in the hospital of Goa, which he only quitted to serve for two years as a soldier, at the end of which time he was again thrown into prison, and it was not until 1611 that he was able to revisit the good town of Laval. 
after so many trials pirard must doubtless have felt the need of repose and we are justified in imagining from the silence of history as to the close of his life that he was privileged at length to find happiness while the honest burgess francois pirard was so to speak in spite of himself and from having indulged the desire of making a fortune too rapidly launched into adventures in which he had to pass much of his life circumstances of a different and romantic kind caused pietro de la valle to determine upon travelling descendant of an ancient and noble family he is by turns a soldier of the pope and a sailor chasing barbary corsairs upon his return to rome he finds that a rival profiting by his absence has taken his place with a young girl whom he was to have married so great a misfortune demands an heroic remedy and della valle makes a vow of pilgrimage to the holy sepulchre but if as said the proverb there is no road which does not lead to rome so there is no circuit so long as not to lead to jerusalem and of this della valle was to make proof he embarks at venice in 1614 passes thirteen months at constantinople reaches alexandria by sea afterwards cairo and joins a caravan which at length brings him to jerusalem but while en route de la valle had no doubt imbibed a taste for a traveller's life for he visits in succession baghdad damascus aleppo and even pushes on as far as the ruins of babylon we must believe that de la valle was marked out as an easy prey to love for upon his return he becomes enamoured of a young christian woman of mardin of wondrous beauty whom he marries one would imagine that here at length is fixed the destiny of this indefatigable traveller nothing of the kind de la valle contrives to accompany the shah in his war against the turks and to traverse during four consecutive years the provinces of iran he quits ispahan in 1621 loses his wife in the month of december of the same year causes her to be embalmed and has her coffin carried about in his train for four years longer which he devotes to exploring Ormuz, the western coasts of India, the Persian Gulf, Aleppo, and Syria, landing at length at Naples in 1626. The countries which this singular character visited, urged on as he was by an extraordinary enthusiasm, are described by him in a shrewd, gay, and natural style, and even with some degree of fidelity. But he inaugurates the pleiad of amateur, curious, and commercial travellers, he is the first of that prolific race of tourists who each year encumber geographical literature with numerous volumes from which the savant finds nothing to glean beyond meagre details tavernier is a specimen of insatiable curiosity at two-and-twenty he has traversed france england the low countries germany switzerland poland hungary and italy then when Europe no longer offers any food for his curiosity, he starts from Constantinople, where he remains for a year, and then arrives in Persia, where the opportunity and quelque diable aussi le poussant, he sets to work to purchase carpets, stuffs, precious stones, and those thousand trifles of which lovers of curiosities soon became passionately fond, and for which they were ready to pay fabulous sums. The profit which Tavernier realized from his cargo induced him to resume his travels, but like a wise and prudent man, before starting, he learned from a jeweller the art of knowing precious stones. During four successive journeys from 1638 to 1663, he travelled over Persia, the Mughal Empire, the Indies as far as the frontier of China, and the islands of Sunda. Dazzled by the immense fortune which his traffic had obtained for him, Tavernier would play the lord, and soon saw himself on the verge of ruin, which he hoped to avert by sending one of his nephews to the east with a considerable venture but instead his ruin was consummated by this young man who judging it best to appropriate the goods which had been confided to him settled down at ispahan tavernier who was a well-educated man made a number of interesting observations upon the history manners and customs of the countries which he visited his narrative certainly contributed to give his contemporaries a much more correct idea of the countries of the east than they previously possessed all travellers during the reign of Louis XIV take the route to the East Indies, whatever may be the end they have in view. Africa is entirely deserted, and if America be the theatre of any real exploration, it is carried out without aid from government. While Stavernier was accomplishing his last and distant excursions, a distinguished archaeologist, Jean de Thévenot, nephew of Melchisedec Thévenot, a learned man to whom we owe an interesting series of travels, 
journeyed through Europe and visited Malta, Constantinople, Egypt, Tunis, and Italy. He brought back in 1661 an important collection of medals and monumental inscriptions recognized nowadays as so important a help to the historian and the philologist. In 1664 he set out anew for the Levant and visited Persia, Bassora, Surat, and India, where he saw Masulipatam, Burhampur, Arungabad, and Golconda. But the fatigues which he had experienced prevented his return to Europe, and he died in Armenia in 1667. The success of his narratives was considerable, and was well deserved by the care and exactitude of a traveller whose scientific attainments in history, geography, and mathematics far surpassed the average level of his contemporaries. We must now speak of the amiable Bernier, the pretty philosopher, as he was entitled in his polite circle, in which were found Ninon and La Fontaine, Madame de la Sablière, Saint-Evremont, and Chapelle, without reckoning many other good and gay spirits, refractories from the stiff solemnity which then weighed upon the entourage of Louis XIV. Bernier could not escape from the fashion of travelling. After having taken a rapid survey of Syria and Egypt, he resided for twelve years in India, where his good knowledge of medicine conciliated the favour of Aurungzebe, and gave him the opportunity of beholding in detail and with profit an empire then in the full bloom of its prosperity. To the south of Hindustan, Ceylon had more than one surprise in reserve for its explorers. Robert Knox, taken prisoner by the natives, owed to this sad circumstance his long residence in the country and the collection of the first authentic documents relating to the forests and the savage natives of Ceylon. The Dutch, with a commercial jealousy which they were not singular in evincing, having until now kept secret all the information which had come to light concerning an island of which they were endeavouring to make a colony. Another merchant, Jean Chardin, the son of a rich Parisian jeweller, jealous of the successes of Tavernier, desired, like him, to make his fortune by trading in diamonds. The countries which attract these merchants are those of which the fame for wealth and prosperity has become proverbial. These are Persia and India, where rich costumes sparkle with jewels and gold, and where there are mines of diamonds of a fabulous size. The moment is well chosen for visiting these countries. Thanks to the Mughal emperors, civilization and art have been developed. Mosques, palaces, temples have been built, and towns have risen suddenly. Their taste, that curious taste so distinctly characterized, so different from our own, is displayed in the construction of gigantic edifices, quite as much as in jewellery and goldsmith's work, and in the manufacture of those costly trifles of which the East was beginning to be passionately fond. Like a wise man, Chardin takes a partner, as good a connoisseur as himself. At first, Chardin only traversed Persia in order to reach Ormuz and to embark for the Indies. The following year he returns to Ispahan and applies himself to learn the language of the country in order to be able to transact business directly and without any intermediary agent. He has the good fortune to please the Shah, Abbas the Second. From that time his fortune is made, for it is at once genteel and also the part of a prudent courtier to employ the same purveyor as his sovereign. But Chardin had another merit besides that of making a fortune. He was able to collect so considerable a mass of information concerning the government, manners, creeds, customs, towns, and populations of Persia, that his narrative has remained to our own days the vademecum of the traveller. This guide is so much the more precious because Chardin took care to engage at Constantinople a clever draughtsman named Grelon, by whom were reproduced the monuments, cities, scenes, costumes, and ceremonies which so well portray what Chardin called the everyday of a people. When Chardin returned to France in 1670, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, with the barbarous persecutions which resulted from it, had chased from their country great numbers of artisans, who, taking refuge in foreign countries, enriched them with our arts and manufactures. Chardin, being a Protestant, clearly perceived that his religion would hinder him from attaining to what are termed honours and advancement. As, to use his own words, quote, one is not free to believe what one will, end quote, he resolved to return to the Indies, quote, where, without being urged to a change of religion, end quote, he could not fail of attaining an honourable position. Thus, liberty of conscience was at that period greater in Persia than in France. 
such an assertion on the part of a man who had made the comparison is but little flattering to the grandson of henry the fourth this time however chardin did not follow the same route as before he passed by smyrna and constantinople and from thence crossing the black sea he landed in the crimea in the garb of a religious whilst passing through the region of the caucasus he had the opportunity of studying the abkhazians and Circassians. he afterwards penetrated into mingrelia where he was robbed of his goods and papers and of a portion of the jewels which he was taking back to europe he could not have escaped himself had it not been for the devotion to him of the theatines from whom he had received hospitality but he escaped only to fall into the hands of the turks who in their turn accepted a ransom for him after further misadventures he arrived at tiflis on the seventeenth of december sixteen seventy two and as georgia was then governed by a prince who was a tributary of the shah of persia it was easy for chardin to reach erivan tauris and finally ispahan after a stay of four years in persia and a concluding journey to india during which he realized a considerable fortune chardin returned to europe and settled in england his own country on account of his religion being forbidden ground to him the journal of his travels forms a large work in which everything that concerns persia is especially developed the long stay he made in the country and his intimate acquaintance with the highest personage of the state enabled him to collect numerous and authentic documents it may fairly be said that in this way persia was better known in the seventeenth century than it was a hundred years later the countries which chardin had just explored were visited again some years later by a dutch painter cornelius de bruin or le brun the great value of his work consists in the beauty and accuracy of the drawings which illustrate it for as far as the text is concerned it contains nothing which was not known before except in what relates to the samoyedes whom he was the first to visit we must now speak of the westphalian kampfer almost a naturalized swede in consequence of his long sojourn in scandinavian countries he refused the brilliant position which was there offered him in order to accompany as secretary an ambassador who was going to moscow he was thus enabled to see the principal cities of russia a country which at that period had scarcely entered upon the path of western civilization afterwards he went to persia where he quitted the ambassador fabricius in order to enter the service of the dutch company of the indies and to continue his travels he thus visited in the first place persepolis shiraz ormus upon the persian gulf where he was extremely ill and whence he embarked in sixteen eighty eight for the east indies arabia felix india the malabar coast ceylon java sumatra and japan were afterwards all visited by him the object of these journeys was exclusively scientific comfer was a physician but was more especially devoted to the various branches of natural history and collected described drew or dried a considerable number of plants then unknown in europe gave new information upon their use in medicine or manufactures and collected an immense herbarium which is now preserved with the greater part of his manuscripts in the british museum in london but the most interesting portion of his narrative nowadays indeed quite obsolete and very incomplete since the country has been opened up to our scientific men was for a long time that relating to japan he had contrived to procure books treating of the history literature and learning of the country when he had failed in obtaining from certain personages to whom he had rendered himself very acceptable information which was not usually imparted to foreigners to conclude if all the travellers of whom we have just spoken are not strictly speaking discoverers if they do not explore countries unknown before they all have in various degrees and according to their ability or their studies the merit of having rendered the countries which they visited better known besides they were able to banish to the domain of fable many of the tales which others less learned had naively accepted and which had for long become so completely public property that nobody dreamt of disputing them thanks to these travellers something is known of the history of the east the migrations of nations began to be dimly suspected and accounts to be given of the changes in those great empires of which the very existence had been long problematical end of second part chapter five part two b Section 43 
of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 6, Part 1 the great corsair william dampier was born in 1612 at east coker and by the death of his parents was from his childhood left to his own control not possessing any great taste for study he preferred running wild in the woods and fighting with his companions to remaining in his place on the school benches while still young he was sent to sea as cabin boy on board merchant ships after a voyage to new newfoundland and a campaign in the east indies he took service in the naval marine and being wounded in a battle returned to greenwich to be nursed free from any prejudices dampier forgot his engagement when he left the military hospital and started for jamaica in the position of manager of a plantation it did not require a long trial to discover that this occupation was not to his taste. So he abandoned his negroes at the end of six months, and went on board a ship bound for the Bay of Campeche, where he worked for three years at gathering in woods for dyeing. At the end of that period he is again found in London, but the laws and the officers charged with compelling their observance are too strict for his comfort. He goes back to Jamaica, where he speedily puts himself into communication with those famous buccaneers and corsairs, who at that time did so much harm to the Spaniards. These English or French adventurers, established in the island of Tortuga, off the coast of San Domingo, had sworn implacable hatred to Spain. Their ravages were not confined to the Gulf of Mexico. They crossed the Isthmus of Panama, and devastated the coast of the Pacific Ocean, from the Strait of Magellan to California. Terror exaggerated the exploits of these pirates, which, however, presented something of the marvelous. It was amongst these adventurers, then commanded by Harris, Sofkins, and Shays, that Dampier enrolled himself. In 1680 we find him in Darien, where he pillages Santa Maria, endeavors in vain to surprise Panama, and with his companions, on board of some wretched canoes stolen from the Indians, captures eight vessels, well armed, which were at anchor not far from the town. In this affair the losses of the corsairs are so great in the fight, and the spoil is so poor that they separate from each other. Some go back to the Gulf of Mexico, while others establish themselves upon the island of Juan Fernandez, whence shortly after they attack Arica. But here again they were so roughly handled that a new succession takes place, and Dampier is sent to Virginia, where his captain hoped to make some recruits. There Captain Cook was fitting out a vessel with the intention of reaching the Pacific by the Strait of Magellan, and Dampier joins the expedition. It begins by privateering upon the African coast, in the Cape de Verde Islands, at Sierra Leone, and in the river Sherboro, for this is the route habitually taken by the ships going to South America. In 36 degrees south latitude, Dampier who notes in his journal every interesting fact, remarks that the sea is become white or rather pale, but of this he cannot explain the reason, which he might easily have done had he made use of the microscope. The Sebaldine Islands are passed without incident, the Strait of Le Maire is traversed, Cape Horn is doubled on the 6th of February, 1684, and as soon as he can escape from the storms, which usually assail ships entering the Pacific, Captain Cook arrives at the island of Juan Fernandez, 
where he hopes to revictual. Dampier wondered if he would find a Nicaraguan Indian there, who had been left behind in 1680 by Captain Sharp. This Indian had remained alone upon the island for more than three years. He had been in the woods hunting goats when the English captain had ordered his men to re-embark, and they had set sail without perceiving his absence. He had only his gun and his knife, with a small horn of powder and a little lead. When his powder and lead were exhausted, he had contrived to saw the barrel of his gun into small pieces with his knife, and out of them to make harpoons, spears, fish-hooks, and a long knife. With these instruments he obtained all the supplies which the island afforded, goats and fish. At the distance of half a mile from the sea, he had a small hut covered with goatskins. He had no clothes left, but an animal's skin covered his loins. We have dwelt at some length upon this involuntary hermit, because he served Daniel Defoe as the original for his Robinson Crusoe, a romance which has formed the delight of every child. We shall not relate minutely all the expeditions in which Dampier participated. Suffice it to mention that in this campaign he visited the Galapagos Islands. In 1686, Dampier was serving on board of Captain Swan's ship, who, seeing that the greater part of his enterprises failed, went to the East Indies, where the Spaniards were less upon their guard, and where the corsairs reckoned upon seizing the Manila galleon. But when our adventurers arrived at Guaham, they had only three days' provisions, and the sailors had plotted, if the voyage should be prolonged, to eat in turn all those who had declared themselves in favour of the voyage, and to begin with the captain who had proposed it. Dampier's turn would have come next. Thus it came to pass, says he very humorously, that after having cast anchor at Guaham, Swan embraced him and said, Ah, Dampier, you would have made them but a sorry meal. He was right, he adds, for I was as thin and lean as he was fat and plump. Mindanao, Manila, certain parts of the Chinese coasts, the Moluccas, New Holland, and the Nicobar Islands, were the places visited and plundered by Dampier in his campaign. In the last-named archipelago he became separated from his companions, and was discovered half dead upon the coast of Sumatra. During this voyage Dampier had discovered several hitherto unknown islands, and especially the Bashi group. Like the thorough adventurer he was, immediately he recovered his health, he travelled over the south of Asia, Malacca, Tonkin, Madras, and Benkulan, where he enrolled himself as an artillery man in the English service. Five months afterwards he deserted and returned to London. The narrative of his adventures and his privateering obtained, for him a certain amount of sympathy amongst the higher classes, and he was presented to the Earl of Oxford, Lord High Admiral. He speedily received the command of the ship Roebuck, to attempt a voyage of discovery in the seas which he had already explored. He left England on the 14th January, 1699, with the intention of passing through the Strait of Magellan, or of making the tour of Tierra del Fuego, so as to commence his discoveries on the coasts of the Pacific, which had hitherto received the visits of a comparatively small number of travellers. After crossing the line on the 10th of March, he sailed for Brazil, where the ship was revictualled. Far from being able again to descend the coast of Patagonia, he beheld himself, driven by the wind, to forty-eight miles south of the Cape of Good Hope, whence he steered east-south-east, towards New Holland, a long passage which was not signalized by any adventure. On the 1st of August, Dampier saw land, and at once sought for a harbour in which to land. Five days later he entered the Bay of Sea Dogs, 
upon the western coast of Australia. But he only found there a sterile soil, and met with neither water nor vegetation. Until the 31st of August he sailed along this coast, without discovering what he sought. Once, when he landed, he had a slight skirmish with some of the inhabitants, who seemed to be very thinly scattered over the country. Their chief was a young man of middle height, but quick and vigilant. His eyes were surrounded by a single ring of white paint, while a stripe of the same color descended from the top of his forehead to the end of his nose. His chest and arms were likewise striped with white. His companions were black, fierce in aspect, their hair woolly, and in shape they were tall and slender. For five weeks Dampier hovered near land, and found neither water nor provisions. However, he would not give in, and intended to continue to ascend the coast northwards. But the shallows, which he incessantly encountered, and the monsoon from the northwest, which was soon due, obliged him to give up the enterprise, after having discovered more than nine hundred miles of the Australian continent. He afterwards steered towards Timor, where he intended to repose and recruit his crew, exhausted by the long voyage. But he knew very little of these parts, and his charts were quite insufficient. He was therefore obliged to make a reconnaissance of it, as if the Dutch had not already been long settled there. Thus he discovered a passage between Timor and Anamabao, in a locality in which his map only indicated a bay. The arrival of Dampier in a port, known only to themselves, astonished and greatly displeased the Dutch. They imagined that the English could only have reached it by means of charts taken on board a ship of their own. However, in the end they recovered from their fright, and received the strangers with kindness. Although the precursors of the monsoon were making themselves felt, Dampier again put to the sea, and steered towards the western coast of New Guinea, where he arrived on the 4th of February, 1700, near to Cape Maho of the Dutch. Amongst the things which struck him, Dampier notices the prodigious quantities of a species of pigeon, bats of extraordinary size, and scallops, a kind of shellfish, of which the empty shell weighed as much as 258 pounds. On the 7th of February he approaches King William's Island, and runs to the east, where he soon sights the Cape of Good Hope of Scotland and the island named after that navigator. On the 24th the crew witnessed a curious spectacle. Two fish, which had accompanied the vessel for five or six days, perceived a great sea serpent, and began to pursue it. They were about the shape and size of mackerel, but yellow and green in color. The serpent, who fled from them with great swiftness, carried his head out of the water, and one of them attempted to seize his tail. As soon as he turned round, the first fish remained in the rear, and the other took its place. They retained the wind for a long time, always heedful to defend themselves by flight, until they were lost to view. On the 25th, Dampier gave the name of St. Matthias to a mountainous island, thirty miles long, situated above and to the east of the Admiralty Islands. Further on, at the distance of twenty-one or twenty-four miles, he discovered another island, which received the name of Squally Island, an account of violent whirlwinds which prevented him from landing upon it. Dampier believed himself to be on the coast of New Guinea, while he was in reality sailing along that of New Ireland. He endeavoured to land there, but he was surrounded by canoes, carrying more than two hundred natives, and the shore was covered by a large crowd. Seeing that it would be imprudent to send a boat on shore, Dampier ordered the ship to be put about. Scarcely was the order given, 
when the ship was assailed by showers of stones, which the natives hurled from a machine, of which Dampier could not discover the shape, but which caused the name of Slinger's Bay to be given to this locality. A single discharge of cannon stupefied the natives, and put an end to hostilities. A little further on, at some distance from the coast of New Ireland, the English discoverer, the islands of Denise and St. John. Dampier is the first to pass through the strait which separates New Ireland from New Britain, and discovers Vulcan, Crown, Girook, Longreach, and Burning Islands. After this long cruise, distinguished by important discoveries, Dampier again steered towards the west, reached Missouri Island, and at length arrived at the island of Tseram, one of the Maluccas, where he made a somewhat long stay. He went afterwards to Borneo, passed through the Strait of Makassar, and on the 23rd of June anchored at Batavia, in the island of Java. He remained there until the 17th of October, when he set out for Europe. On arriving at the island of Ascension, on the 23rd of February, 1701, his vessel had so considerable a leak that it was impossible to stop it. It was necessary to run the ship aground and to put the crew and cargo on shore. Happily, there was no want of water, turtles, goats, and land crabs, which prevented any fear of dying of hunger before some ship should call at the island and transport the shipwrecked sailors to their country. For this they had not long to wait, for on the 2nd of April an English vessel took them on board, and carried them to England. We shall have occasion again to speak of Dampier, with a relation to the voyages of Wood Rogers. End of Second Part Chapter 6 Part 1「Section 44 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 6, Part 2a. Although the attempts to find a passage by the north-west had been abandoned by the English for twenty years, they had not, however, given up the idea of seeking by that way for a passage which was only to be discovered in our own days, and of which the absolute impracticability was then to be ascertained. A clever sailor, Henry Hudson, of whom Ellis says, that never did any one better understand the seafaring profession, that his courage was equal to any emergency, and that his application was indefatigable, concluded an argument with a company of merchants to search for the passage by the north-west. On the 1st of May, 1607, he sailed from Gravesend in the Hopewell, a craft about the size of one of the smallest of modern collier brigs, and having on board a crew of twelve men, and on the 13th of June reached the eastern coast of Greenland at 73 degrees, and gave it a name answering to the hopes he entertained, in calling it Cape Hold with Hope. The weather here was finer and less cold than it had been, ten degrees southwards. By the 27th of June, Hudson had advanced five degrees more to the north, but on the 2nd of July, by one of the sudden changes which so frequently occur in these countries, the cold became severe. The sea, however, remained free. The air was still, and driftwood floated about in large quantity. On the 14th of the same month, in 33 degrees 23 minutes, the master's mate and the boatswain of the vessel landed upon a shore which formed the northern part of Spitsbergen. Traces of musk oxen and foxes, great abundance of aquatic birds, two streams of fresh water, one of them being warm, proved to our navigators that it was possible to live in these extreme latitudes at this period of the year. Hudson, who had re-embarked without delay, found himself arrested at the height of 82 degrees by thick pack ice, 
which he endeavoured in vain to penetrate or sail around he was compelled to return to england where he arrived on september the fifteenth after having discovered an island which is probably that of jan mayen the route followed in this first voyage having had no result towards the north hudson would try another and accordingly set sail on april twenty first in the following year and advanced between spitzbergen and nova zembla but he could only follow for a certain distance the coast of that vast land without being able to attain as high an elevation as he had wished for the failure of this second attempt was more complete than that of the voyage of sixteen o seven in consequence the english company which had defrayed the expenses of both attempts declined to proceed further this was doubtless the reason which decided hudson to take service in holland the company of amsterdam gave him in sixteen o nine the command of a vessel with which he set sail from the texel at the beginning of the year having doubled the north cape he advanced along the coasts of nova zembla but his crew composed of english and dutch who had made voyages to the east indies were soon disheartened by the cold and ice hudson found himself forced to change his route and to propose to his sailors who were in open mutiny to seek for a passage either by davis strait or the coast of virginia where according to the information of captain smith who had frequently visited them an outlet must surely be found the choice of his crew little accustomed to discipline could not be doubtful in order not to render the outlay of the company completely abortive hudson was obliged to make for the faroe islands to descend southward as low as forty four degrees and to search on the coast of america for the strait the existence of which he had been assured on july eighteenth he disembarks on the continent in order to replace his foremast which had been broken in a storm and he took the opportunity of bartering furs with the natives but his undisciplined sailors having by their exactions roused the indignation of the poor and peaceable natives compelled him again to set sail he continued to follow the coast until august the third and then landed a second time at forty degrees thirty minutes he discovered a great bay which he explored in a canoe for more than a hundred and fifty miles in the meantime his provisions began to run short and it was impossible to procure supplies on land the crew which appears to have imposed its wishes on its captain during this whole voyage assembled some proposed to winter in newfoundland in order to resume the search for the passage in the following year others wished to make for ireland this latter proposition was adopted but when they approached the shores of great britain the land proved so attractive to his men that hudson was obliged on november the seventh to cast anchor at dartmouth the following year sixteen ten notwithstanding all the mortifications which he had experienced hudson tried to renew his engagement with the dutch company but the terms which they named as the price of their concurrence compelled him to renounce the project and induced him to submit to the requirements of the english company this company imposed on hudson as a condition that he should carry on board rather as an assistant than a subordinate a clever seaman named colburn in whom they had full confidence it is easy to understand how mortifying this condition was to hudson accordingly he took the earliest opportunity of ridding himself of the superintendent who had been imposed upon him he had not yet left the thames when he sent colburn back to shore with a letter for the company in which he endeavoured to palliate and justify this certainly very strange proceeding towards the end of may when the ship had cast anchor in one of the ports of the island the crew formed on the subject of colburn its first conspiracy which was repressed without difficulty and when hudson quitted the island on june the first he had re-established his authority after having passed frobisher's strait he sighted the land of desolation of davis entered the strait which has received his name and speedily penetrated into a wide bay the entire western coast of which he examined until the beginning of september at this epoch one of the inferior officers continuing to excite revolts against his chief was superseded but this act of justice only exasperated the sailors in the early part of november hudson having arrived at the extremity of the bay sought for an appropriate spot to winter in and having soon found one drew up the ship on dry land it is difficult to understand such a resolution on the one hand hudson had left england with provisions for six months only which had already been largely reduced and he could scarcely reckon 
considering the barrenness of the country, upon procuring a further supply of nourishment. On the other, the crew had exhibited such numerous signs of mutiny that he could hardly rely upon its discipline and good will. Nevertheless, although the English were often obliged to content themselves with scanty rations, they did not, owing to the arrival of great numbers of birds, pass a very distressing winter. But on the return of spring, as soon as the ship was prepared to resume her route to England, Hudson found that his fate was decided. He made his arrangements accordingly, distributed to each his share of biscuit, paid the wages due, and awaited the course of events. He had not long to wait. The conspirators seized their captain, his son, a volunteer, the carpenter, and five sailors, put them on board a boat without arms, provisions, or instruments, and abandoned them to the mercy of the ocean. The culprits reached England again, but not all. Two were killed in an encounter with the Indians, another died of sickness, while the others were sorely tried by famine. Eventually, no prosecution was commenced against them. Only the company in 1674 procured employment on board a vessel for the son of Henry Hudson, lost in the discovery of the North West, the son being entirely destitute of resources. The expeditions of Hudson were followed by those of Button and of Gibbons, to whom we owe, if not new discoveries, important observations on the tides, the variation of the weather and the temperature, and on a number of natural phenomena. In 1615, the English company entrusted to Bailey, who had taken part in the last voyages, the command of a vessel of fifty tons. Her name, the Discovery, was of good augury. She carried as pilot the famous William Baffin, whose renown has eclipsed that of his captain, setting sail from England on April 13th. The English explorers sighted Cape Farewell by the 6th of May, passed from the islands of desolation to the Savage Islands, where they met with a great number of natives, and ascended northwestward as high as 64 degrees. On July the 10th land appeared on the starboard, and the tide flowed from the north, from which they conceived so much hope of the passage sought for, that they gave to the Cape, discovered on this spot, the name of comfort. It was probably Cape Walsingham, for they ascertained, after doubling it, that the land inclined towards the northeast and the east. It was at the entry of Davis Strait that their discoveries came to an end for this year. They returned to Plymouth on September the 9th without having lost a single man. So strong were the hopes entertained by Byleth and Baffin that they obtained permission to put to sea again in the same vessel the following year. On May the 14th, 1616, after a voyage in which nothing worthy of remark occurred, the two captains penetrated into Davis Strait, sighted Cape Henderson's Hope, the extreme point formerly reached by Davis, and ascended as high as 72 degrees 40 minutes to the Women's Island, thus named after some Esquimaux females whom they met with. On June the 12th, Byleth and Baffin were forced by the ice to enter a bay on the coast. Some Esquimaux bought them a great quantity of horns, without doubt tusks of walruses or horns of musk oxen, from which they named the bay Horn Sound. After remaining some days in this place, they were able to put to sea again. On setting out from 75 degrees 40 minutes, they encountered a vast expanse of water free from ice and penetrated without much danger beyond the 78 degree of latitude to the entrance of the strait, which prolonged northwards the immense bay which they had just traversed and which received the name of Baffin. Then turning to the west and afterwards to the southwest, Byleth and Baffin discovered the Carey Islands, Jones Strait, Coburg Island and Lancaster Strait, and afterwards they descended along the entire western shore of Baffin's Bay as far as Cumberland Land. Despairing then of being able to carry his discoveries further, Byleth, who had several men amongst his crew afflicted with scurvy, found himself obliged to return to the shores of England, where he disembarked at Dover on August 30th. If this expedition terminated again in failure, in the sense that the Northwest Passage was not discovered, the results obtained were nevertheless considerable. Byleth and Baffin had prodigiously increased the knowledge of the seas and coasts in the quarters of Greenland. The captain and the pilot, in writing to the director of the company, assured him that the bay which they had visited was an excellent spot for fishing, in which thousands of whales, seals and walruses 
disported themselves. The event could not be long in amply proving the correctness of this information. Let us now descend again upon the coast of America, as far as Canada, and see what had happened since the time of Jacques Cartier. This latter, we may remember, had made an attempt at colonisation, which had not produced any important results. Nevertheless, some Frenchmen had remained in the country, had married there, and founded families of colonists. From time to time, they received reinforcements brought by fishing vessels from Dieppe or St. Malo, but it was difficult to establish a current of emigration. It was under these circumstances that a gentleman named Samuel de Champlain, a veteran of the wars of Henry the Fourth, and who for two years and a half had frequented the East Indies, was engaged by the commander of Chasse with the Sieur de Pongrave to continue the discoveries of Jacques Cartier and to choose the situations most favourable for the establishment of towns and centres of population. This is not the place for us to consider the manner in which Champlain understood the business of a coloniser, nor his great services, which might well entitle him to be called the father of Canada. We will therefore advisedly leave this aspect of his undertaking, not the least brilliant in order simply to occupy ourselves with the discoveries which he effected in the interior of the continent. Setting sail from Honfleur on March the 15th, 1603, the two chiefs of the enterprise first ascended the St. Lawrence as far as the harbour of Tadoussac, 240 miles from its mouth. They were welcomed by the populations, which had, however, neither faith nor law and lived without God and without religion, like brute beasts. At this place they quitted their ships, which could not have advanced further without danger, and reached in a boat the fall of St. Louis, where Jacques Cartier had been stopped. They even penetrated a little into the interior, and then returned to France, where Champlain printed a narrative of the voyage for the king. Henry the Fourth resolved to continue the enterprise. In the meantime, M. de Chasse having died, his privilege was transferred to M. de Mont, with the title of Vice-Admiral and Governor of Acadia. Champlain accompanied M. de Mont to Canada and passed three whole years, whether in aiding by his counsels and his exertions the efforts of colonisation or in exploring the coasts of Acadia, the bearings of which he took beyond Cape Cod, or in making excursions into the interior and visiting the savage tribes which it was important to conciliate. In 1607, after a new voyage to France to recruit colonists, Champlain returned again to New France and founded, in 1608, a town which was to become Quebec. The following year was devoted to again ascending the St. Lawrence, and ascertaining its course. On board of a pirogue, with two companions only, Champlain penetrated, with some Algonquins, to the Iroquois, and remained conqueror in a great battle fought on the borders of a lake, which has received his name. He then descended the river Richelieu, as far as the St. Lawrence. In 1610 he made a fresh incursion into the territory of the Iroquois at the head of his allies, the Algonquins, whom he had the greatest possible difficulty in making observe the European discipline. In this campaign he employed instruments of warfare which greatly astonished the savages and easily secured him the victory. For the attack of a village he constructed a cavalier of wood, which two hundred of the most powerful men carried before this village to within a pike's length, and displayed three arquebusiers, well protected from the arrows and stones which might be shot or launched at them. A little later we see him exploring the river Ottawa, and advancing in the north of the continent to within 225 miles of Hudson's Bay. After having fortified Montreal in 1615, he twice ascended the Ottawa, explored Lake Huron, and arrived by land at Lake Ontario, which he crossed. It is very difficult to divide into two parts a life so occupied as Champlain's. All his excursions, all his reconnaissances, had but one object, the development of the work to which he had consecrated his existence. Thus detached from what gives them their interest, they appear to us unimportant, and yet if the colonial policy of Louis the Fourteenth and his successor had been different, we would possess in America a colony which assuredly would not yield in prosperity to the United States. Notwithstanding our abandonment, Canada has preserved a fervent love for the mother country. 
End of Second Part, Chapter 6, Part 2A Section 45 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1 Exploration of the World by Jules Verne Second Part, Chapter 6, Part 2b We must now leap over a period of forty years to arrive at Robert Cavelier de la Salle. During this time the French establishments have acquired some importance in Canada, and having extended themselves over a great part of North America. Our hunters and trappers scour the woods, and bring every year with their load of furs new information respecting the interior of the continent. In this latter task they are powerfully seconded by the missionaries, in the first rank of whom we must place Father Marquette, whom the extent of his voyages on the Great Lakes and as far as the Mississippi marks out for special acknowledgment. Two men, besides, deserve to be mentioned for the encouragements and facilities which they afforded to the explorers, viz. M. de Frontenac, Governor of New France, and Talon, Intendant of Justice and Police. In 1678 there arrived in Canada, without any settled purpose, a young man named Cavelier de la Salle. He was born at Rouen, says Father Chalvois, of a family in easy circumstances, but having passed some years with the Jesuits, he had had no share in the inheritance of his parents. He had a cultivated mind, he wished to distinguish himself, and he felt within himself sufficient genius and courage to ensure success. In reality, he was not deficient in resolution to enter upon, nor in perseverance to follow up an undertaking, nor in firmness in contending against obstacles, nor in resource to repair his losses, but he knew not how to make himself loved, nor how to manage those of whom he stood in need, and when he had attained authority, he exercised it with harshness and arrogance. With such defects he could not be happy, and in fact he was not. Father Chalvois's portrait appears to us somewhat too black, and he does not seem to estimate at its true value the great discovery which we owe to Cavelier de la Salle, a discovery which has nothing like it. We do not say equal to it, except that of the River Amazon, by Orellana in the 16th century, and that of the Congo by Stanley in the 19th. However this may be, no sooner had he arrived in the country than he set himself with extraordinary application to study the native idioms and to associate with the savages in order to render himself familiar with their manners and habits. At the same time he gathered from the trappers a mass of information on the situation of the rivers and lakes. He communicated his projects of exploration to M. de Frontenac, who encouraged him and gave him the command of a fort constructed at the outlet of the lake into the St. Lawrence. In the meantime, one Jolier arrived at Quebec. He brought the news that in company with Father Marquette and four other persons, he had reached a great river called the Mississippi, flowing towards the south. Cavelier de la Salle very soon understood what advantage might be derived from an artery of this importance, especially if the Mississippi had, as he believed, its mouth in the Gulf of Mexico. By the lakes and the Illinois, an affluent of the Mississippi, it was easy to effect communication between the St. Lawrence and the Sea of the Antilles. What marvellous profit would France derive from this discovery? La Salle explained the project which he had conceived to the Count of Frontenac, and obtained from him very pressing letters of recommendation to the Minister of Marine. On arriving in France, La Salle learned the death of Colbert, but he remitted to his son, the Marquis of Seignelay, who had succeeded him, the dispatches of which he was the bearer. This project, which appeared to rest upon solid foundations, could not fail to please a young minister. Accordingly, Seignelay presented La Salle to the King, who caused letters of nobility to be prepared for him, granted him the seigneury of Cataraquai, and the government of the fort which he had built, with the monopoly of commerce in the countries which he might discover. 
la salle had also found means to procure the patronage of the prince de conti who asked him to take with him the chevalier tonti son of the inventor of the tontine in whom he felt an interest he was for la salle a precious acquisition tonti who had made a campaign in sicily where his hand had been carried off by the explosion of a grenade was a brave and skilful officer who always showed himself extremely devoted la salle and tonti embarked at rochelle on july the fourteenth sixteen seventy eight carrying with them about thirty men workmen and soldiers and a recollet monk father hennepin who accompanied them in all their voyages then la salle being conscious that the execution of his project required more considerable resources than those which were at his disposal constructed a boat upon the lake erie and devoted a whole year to scouring the country visiting the indians and carrying on an active trade in furs which he stored in his fort of niagara while tonti pursued the same course in other directions at length towards the middle of august of the year sixteen seventy nine his boat the griffin being prepared for sailing he embarked on the lake erie with thirty men and three fathers recollets former killimackinac in crossing the lakes st clair and huron he experienced a violent storm which caused the desertion of some of his people whom however tonti brought back to him la salle arrived at Mackinac and very soon entered the green bay but during this time his creditors at quebec had sold all that he possessed and the griffin which he had dispatched laden with furs to the fort of niagara was either lost or pillaged by the indians which of these took place has never been precisely ascertained for himself although the departure of the griffin had displeased his companions he continued his route and reached the river st joseph where he found an encampment of miamis and where tonti speedily rejoined him their first care was to construct a fort on this spot then they crossed the dividing line of the water between the basin of the great lakes and that of the mississippi they subsequently reached the river of the illinois an affluent on the left of that great river with his small band of followers upon whose fidelity he could not entirely depend the situation of la salle was critical in the midst of an unknown country and among a powerful nation the illinois who at first allies of france had been prejudiced and excited against us by the iroquois and the english jealous of the progress of the canadian colony nevertheless it was necessary at all cost to attach to himself these indians who from their situation were able to hinder all communication between la salle and canada in order to strike their imagination cavelier de la salle proceeds to their encampment where more than three thousand men are assembled he has but twenty men but he traverses their village haughtily and stops at some distance the illinois who have not yet declared war are surprised they advance towards him and overwhelm him with pacific demonstrations so versatile is the spirit of the savages such an impression does every mark of courage make upon them without delay la salle takes advantage of their friendly dispositions and erects upon the very site of their camp a small fort which he calls Crevecoeur in allusion to the troubles which he has already experienced there he leaves tonti with all his people and he himself anxious about the fate of the griffin returns with three frenchmen and one indian to the fort of cataraquai separated by five hundred leagues from crevecoeur before setting out he had detached with father hennepin one of his companions named Acan, on a mission to reascend the mississippi beyond the river of the illinois and if possible to its source these two travellers says father chalvois set out from the fort of crevecoeur on february the twenty eighth and having entered the mississippi ascended it as far as forty six degrees of north latitude there they were stopped by a considerable waterfall extending quite across the river to which father hennepin gave the name of st anthony of padua then they fell i know not by what mischance into the hands of the sioux who kept them for a long time prisoners on his journey back to Cataracoy, la salle having discovered a new site appropriate to the construction of a fort summoned tonti thither who immediately set to work while la salle continued his route this is fort st louis on his arrival at Cataracoy, la salle learned news which would have broken down a man of less hardy temperament not only had the griffin on board of which he had furs of the value of ten thousand crowns been lost 
but a vessel which was bringing him from france a cargo worth eight hundred and eighty l had been shipwrecked and his enemies had spread a report of his death having no further business at cataraquai and having proved by his presence that the reports of his disappearance were all false he arrived again at the fort of crevacroix where he was much astonished to find no one this is what had happened while the chevalier tonti was employed in the construction of fort st louis the garrison of fort crevacroix had mutinied had pillaged the magazines had done the same at fort miami and then fled to mackillimackinac tonti almost alone in the face of the illinois who were roused against him by the depredations of his men and judging that he could not resist in his fort of crevacroix had left it on september the eleventh sixteen eighty with the five frenchmen who composed his garrison and had retired as far as the bay of the lake michigan after having placed a garrison at crevacroix and at fort st louis la salle came to mackillimackinac where he rejoined tonti and together they set out again from thence towards the end of august for cataraquai whence they embarked on the lake erie with fifty-five persons on august twenty eighth sixteen eighty one after a journey of two hundred and forty miles along the frozen river of the illinois they reached fort crevacroix where the water free from ice permitted the use of their canoes on february the sixth sixteen eighty two la salle arrived at the confluence of the illinois and the mississippi he descended the river sighted the mouth of the missouri and that of the ohio where he raised a fort penetrated into the country of the arkansas of which he took possession in the name of france crossed the country of the natchez with whom he made a treaty of friendship and finally passed out into the gulf of mexico on april the ninth after a navigation of one thousand and fifty miles in a mere bark the anticipations so skilfully conceived by cavelier de salle were realized he immediately took formal possession of the country to which he gave the name of louisiana and called the immense river which he had just discovered the st louis la salle's return to canada occupied not less than one year and a half there is no ground for astonishment when all the obstacles scattered in his path are considered what energy what strength of mind were requisite in one of the greatest travellers of whom france has reason to be proud to succeed in such an enterprise unhappily a man otherwise well-intentioned but who allowed himself to be prejudiced against la salle by his numerous enemies m lefevre de la barre who had succeeded m de frontenac as governor of canada wrote to the minister of marine that the discoveries of la salle were not to be regarded as of much importance this traveller he said was actually with about twenty french vagabonds and savages at the extremity of the bay where he played the part of sovereign plundered and ransomed those of his own nation exposed the people to the incursions of the iroquois and covered all these acts of violence with the pretext of the permission which he had from his majesty to carry on commerce alone in the countries which he might be able to discover cavelier de la salle could not allow himself to remain exposed to these calumnious imputations on the one side honour prompted him to return to france to exculpate himself on the other he would not leave others to reap the profit of his discoveries he set out therefore and received from senlay a kindly welcome the minister had not been much influenced by the letters of m de la barre he was aware that men could not accomplish great achievements without wounding much self-love nor without making numerous enemies la salle took the opportunity to explain to him his project of discovering the mouth of the mississippi by sea in order to open a way for french vessels and to found an establishment there the minister entered into these views and gave him a commission which placed Frenchmen and savages under his orders, from Fort St. Louis to the sea. At the same time, the commandment of the squadron, which was to transport him to America, was to be under his authority, and to furnish him, on his disembarkation, with all the succours which he might require, provided that nothing was done to the prejudice of the king. Four vessels, one of them a frigate of forty guns, commanded by M. de Beaujau, were to carry two hundred and eighty persons including the crews to the mouth of the mississippi to form the nucleus of the new colony 
Soldiers and artisans had been very badly chosen, as was perceived when too late, and no one knew his business. Setting sail from La Rochelle on July the 24th, 1684, the little squadron was almost immediately obliged to return to port, the bowsprit of the frigate having broke suddenly in the very finest weather. The inexplicable accident was the commencement of misunderstanding between Monsieur de Beaujeu and Monsieur de La Salle. The former could scarcely be pleased to see himself subordinated to a private individual, and did not forgive Cavelier this. Nothing, however, would have been more easy than to decline the command. La Salle had not the gentleness of manner and the politeness necessary to conciliate his companions. The disagreement did but gather force during the voyage by reason of the obstacles raised by Monsieur de Beaujeu to the rapidity and secrecy of the expedition. The annoyances of La Salle had indeed become so great when he arrived at St. Domingo that he fell seriously ill. He recovered, however, and the expedition set sail again on November 25th. A month later it was off Florida, but, as La Salle had been assured, that in the Gulf of Mexico all the currents bore eastwards, he did not doubt that the mouth of the Mississippi must be far to the west, an error which was the source of all his misfortunes. La Salle then steered to the west and passed by without perceiving it, without deigning even to attend to certain signs which he was asked to observe, the mouth of the Mississippi. When he perceived his mistake and entreated Monsieur de Beaujeu to turn back, the latter would no longer consent. La Salle, seeing that he could make no impression upon the contradictory mind of his companion, decided to disembark his men and his provisions in the Bay of St. Bernard. Yet, in this very last act, Beaujeu manifested an amount of culpable ill-will, which did as little honour to his judgment as to his patriotism. Not only was he unwilling to land all the provisions, under the pretext that certain of them being at the bottom of the hold, he had no time to change his stowage, but further he gave shelter on board his own ship to the master and crew of the transport, laden with the stores, utensils and implements necessary for a new establishment, people whom everything seems to convict of having purposely cast their vessel upon shore. At the same time a number of savages took advantage of the disorder caused by the shipwreck of the transport to plunder everything on which they could lay their hands. Nevertheless, La Salle, who had the talent of never appearing depressed by misfortune, and who found in his own genius resources adapted to the circumstances of the case, ordered the works of the establishment to be begun. In order to give courage to his companions, he more than once took part with his own hands in the work, but very slow progress was made, in consequence of the ignorance of the workmen. Struck with the resemblance of the language and habits of the Indians of these parts to those of the Mississippi, La Salle was very soon persuaded that he was not far distant from that river, and made several excursions in order to approach it. But if he found a country beautiful and fertile, he did not make progress towards what he was in search of. He returned each time to the fort more gloomy and more harsh, and this was not the way to restore calm to spirits, embittered by sufferings and the inutility of their efforts. Grain had been sown, but scarcely any came up for want of rain and what had sprung up was soon laid waste by the savages and the deer. The hunters who wandered far from the camp were massacred by the Indians, and sickness found an easy prey in men overwhelmed with ennui, disappointment and misery. In a short time the number of the colonists fell to thirty-seven. At length La Salle resolved to try a last effort to reach the Mississippi, and in descending the river to seek help from the nations with which he had made alliance. He set out on January the 12th, 1687, with his brother, his two nephews, two missionaries, and twelve colonists. He was approaching the country of the Shawnees, when, in consequence of an altercation between one of his nephews and three of his companions, these latter assassinated the young man and his servant during their sleep, and resolved immediately to do the same with the chief of the enterprise. De La Salle, uneasy at not seeing his nephew return, set out to seek him on the morning of the 19th with Father Anastase. The assassins, seeing him approach, lay in ambush in a thicket, and one of them shot him in the head and stretched him on the ground stark dead. Thus perished Cavelier de la Salle, a man of capacity, says Father Chalvois, 
of a largeness of mind, of a courage and firmness of soul, which might have led him to the achievement of something great. If, with so many great qualities, he had known how to master his gloomy and atrabilious disposition, and to soften the severity, or rather the harshness, of his nature, many calumnies had been spread abroad against him, but it is necessary so much the more to be on our guard against all these malevolent reports, as it is only too common to exaggerate the defects of the unfortunate, to impute to them even some which they had not, especially when they had given occasion for their misfortune, and have not known how to make themselves beloved. What is sadder for the memory of this celebrated man, is that he has been regretted by few persons, and that the ill success of his undertakings, only of his last, has given him the air of an adventurer, among those who judge only by appearances. Unhappily, these are usually the most numerous, and in some degree, the voice of the public. We have but little to add to these last wise words. La Salle knew not how to obtain pardon for his first success. We have related subsequently by what concurrence of circumstances his second enterprise miscarried. He died the victim, it may be said, of the jealousy and malevolence of the Chevalier de Beaujau. It is to this slight cause that we owe the failure to found in America a powerful colony, which would very soon have been found in a condition to compete with the English establishments. We have narrated the beginning of the English colonies. The events which took place in England were highly favourable to them. The religious persecutions, the revolutions of 1648 and 1688, furnished numerous recruits, who, animated by an excellent spirit, set themselves to work, and transported to the other side of the Atlantic the arts, the industry, and in a short time the prosperity of the mother country. Very soon the immense forests which covered Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Carolina fell beneath the hatchet of the squatter, and the soil became cleared, while the hunters of the woods, driving back the Indians, made the interior of the country better known, and prepared the work of civilization. In Mexico, in the whole of Central America, in Peru, in Chile, and on the shores of the Atlantic, a different state of things prevailed. The Spaniards had extended their conquests, but far from acting like the English, they had reduced the Indians to slavery. Instead of applying themselves to the cultivation appropriate to the variety of the climates and of the countries of which they had made themselves masters, they sought only in the produce of the mines the resources and prosperity which they should have endeavoured to obtain from the land. If a country can thus rapidly attain prodigious wealth, yet this factitious system cannot last long. With the mines a prosperity which does not renew itself must ere long become exhausted. The Spaniards could not fail to experience the sad result. Thus then, at the end of the 17th century, a great part of the New World was known. In North America, Canada, the shores of the Atlantic and of the Gulf of Mexico, the valley of Mississippi, the coast of California and of New Mexico, were discovered or colonised. All the central part of the continent from Rio del Norte as far as terra firma was subject, at least nominally, to the Spaniards. In the south, the savannas and the forests of Brazil, the pampas of Argentine and the interior of Patagonia escaped the observation of the explorers, as they were destined to do for a long time yet. In Africa, the long line of coasts, which are washed by the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, had been patiently followed and observed by navigators. At some points only, colonists and missionaries had tried to penetrate the mystery of this vast continent. Senegal, Congo, the Valley of the Nile, the Abyssinia, were all that were known with some degree of detail and of certainty. In many of the countries of Asia, surveyed by the travellers of the Middle Ages, had not been revisited since that epoch. We had carefully explored the whole anterior part of that continent. India had been revealed to us. We had even founded some establishments there. China had been touched by our missionaries, and Japan, that famous Sipango which had exercised so great an attraction for our travellers of the preceding age, was at length known to us. Only Siberia and the whole northeast angle of Asia had escaped our investigations, and it was not yet known whether America was not connected with Asia, a mystery which was before long to be cleared up. In Oceania, a number of archipelagos 
of islands and separate islets remained still to be discovered but the islands of sunda were colonized the coasts of australia and of new zealand had been partially revealed and the existence of that great continent which according to tasman extended from tierra del fuego to new zealand began to be doubted but it still required the long and careful researches of cook to banish definitely into the domain of fable a chimera so long cherished geography was on the point of transforming itself the great discoveries made in astronomy were about to be applied to geography the labours of fennel and above all of picard upon the measure of a terrestrial degree between paris and amiens had made it clear that the globe is not a sphere but a spheroid that is to say a ball flattened at the poles and swollen at the equator and thus were found at one stroke the form and the dimensions of the world which we inhabit at length the labours of picard continued by la Haye and cassini were completed at the commencement of the following century the astronomical observations rendered possible by the calculation of the satellites of jupiter enabled us to rectify our maps if this rectification had been already effected with regard to certain places it became indispensable when the number of points of which the astronomical position had been observed had been considerably increased and this was to be the work of the next century at the same time historical geography was more studied it began to take for its foundation the study of inscriptions and archaeology was about to become one of the most useful instruments of comparative geography in a word the seventeenth century is an epoch of transition and of progress it seeks and it finds the powerful means which its successor the eighteenth century was destined to put into operation the era of the sciences has already opened and with it the modern world commences end of the second part chapter six part two b end of celebrated travels and travellers volume one exploration of the world by jules verne